What's happening guys? My name's Nicholas Renat and welcome to the course. In this course, we're gonna go from a state-of-the-art research paper and go all the way to the end and build a deep learning integrated app, which allows you to perform facial recognition using a model that's pretty similar to what you might encounter using Face ID on your iPhone. This is gonna be broken up into eight different parts where we start off all the way at the start with installing our dependencies completely from scratch to investigating the paper that we're gonna be building, taking a look at our data, building up our deep neural network, and then finally taking that deep neural network and integrating it into a Kivi app so that you can use it in a practical manner. Ready to do it? Let's get to it. What's happening guys? My name is Nicholas Renat and welcome to the very first episode of Papers to Code. In this series, what we're going to be doing is building our very own facial recognition app using deep learning from scratch. So this series is all going to be to do with grabbing the data, building up the model, and implementing it inside of an application. Ready to do it? Let's take a deeper look as to what we'll be going through. So in the very first episode of this bigger series, what we're going to be going through is just our general setup. So what we'll do is we'll install our dependencies. We're going to import all the different TensorFlow, specifically deep learning components that we're going to need. This includes our layers, our models, and our inputs. We're going to also configure our GPU. So if you're using Colab or if you're using your local machine, this is going to ensure that you don't blow out your GPU completely. And then what we're going to do is we're going to set up our data folder. So there's going to be a bunch of episodes following this, but this is really just a setup. Ready to do it? Let's get to it. Alrighty, guys. So we're going to keep this pretty simple and easy, at least for the first episode in the facial recognition or face ID type series. So what we're going to be doing in this episode is we are going to be installing our dependencies, importing our dependencies, setting our GPU growth, and then creating our folder structures. Now, what I'm hoping is that this sort of episode or this style of video is going to become a little bit more common on the channel. So we'll be able to take papers and convert them to code and actually implement them with practical examples. So if you like this style of series, do let me know in the comments below. I'd love to hear your feedback. So what we are going to do in this particular case is first up, we're going to install our dependencies. Now, the first part of this series is going to be all inside of Jupyter. So this is all going to be the data science and deep learning side of things where we actually create our facial verification model. And we'll talk a little bit more about the paper that we're actually going to be interacting with a little bit later, but we'll see that. And then once we've gone and done that, we'll actually transition and start coding up in VS Code when we go and build our facial verification app. So first things first, let's go on ahead and install our dependencies. Alrighty, so those are our dependencies now installed. Now let's actually take a look at the line of code that we wrote. So first up, we wrote exclamation mark pip install. So this is your standard Python install. And as per usual, we're going to be taking this entire tutorial step by step. So again, we're going to write the code and explain it. So exclamation mark pip install TensorFlow equals equals 2.4.1. So this is going to install the TensorFlow 2.4.1 version into our environment. Then we're using, or we've imported or installed TensorFlow-GPU equals equals 2.4.1. And if you don't have a GPU on the machine that you're running on, there's a few things that you can do about it. You can try running this tutorial again without a GPU, but it's going to be a little bit slower to train. So, which is perfectly fine. It'll still work. If you want to use a GPU, there are a whole bunch of cloud platforms out there that leverage Jupyter Notebook. So Colab is a free one that you might take a look at. But in this case, if you don't have a GPU, it's perfectly fine. Then we've installed OpenCV. And so in order to do that, I've written OpenCV-Python. And this is going to give us some of our image processing capabilities. And we're really going to be using this when we actually go to do real-time testing right at the bottom of this tutorial. And then we've gone and installed matplotlib as well. Cool. So all up, we've installed four different dependencies. So exclamation mark pip install TensorFlow 2.4.1, TensorFlow-GPU 2.4.1, OpenCV-Python and Matplotlib. So those are our four dependencies now installed. Cool, so that is part 1.1 now done. Now the next thing that we need to do is import our dependencies. So we've sort of got two different classes of dependencies that we wanna import here. So we've got our deep learning stuff, so all of our TensorFlow components, and then we've got some sort of standard dependencies that are more gonna help us actually work with our data. 
So let's go on ahead and import our standard dependencies first. And then what we'll do is we'll import our TensorFlow dependencies after that. Okay, those are our standard dependencies now imported. So I've written one, two, three, four, five lines of code there and one comment. So the comment just says we're importing our standard dependencies. Again, it's good practice to comment your code. So what I've written is import CV2. So this is going to import OpenCV into our notebook. Then we've imported OS. So this is just an operating system library. And we are going to use this when we actually go and create our folder structures. So this just abstracts the operating system from our Python code. So it just makes it a whole heap easier to work with different directories, different file paths. Then we've imported random. This one is a little bit optional, but I've brought it in just in case. So if we are testing, uh, generating new data, this comes in handy. Then I've imported NumPy. So import NumPy as NP. And NumPy is a great library when it comes to working with different types of arrays. So TensorFlow, which is the deep learning library we're going to be working with, is all to do with different tensors or working with different tensors. NumPy helps us work with those. So what we're then going to do is import matplotlib. And NumPy is really just a really great array transformation library. So again, if you need to resize or reshape arrays, comes in super handy there. So we'll probably use it later on. Then we've imported matplotlib. So from matplotlib, import pyplot as plt. The main reason that I've brought in matplotlib is because there is a method called plot.imshow. So if I type in plot.imshow, this effectively allows us, and question mark, question mark, this effectively allows us to visualize an image. So you can see there it says display data as an image. So it just makes it super easy to visualize it when we're working with our different data components, which we're going to need when it comes to facial verification. Cool. So that's done. The All right. So we've gone and written those five lines of code. So import CV2, import OS, import random, import NumPy as MP, and then from matplotlib, import pyplot as PLT. Cool. So those are our standard dependencies and our imported. Now, the next thing that we're going to go on ahead and do is import our TensorFlow dependencies. So I'm just going to change this. So we're going to import TensorFlow dependencies. And Really, we're going to be using, uh, well, not really. We're going to be using two key, or we need to import two key things here. We need to import our model components and the different deep learning layers that we're going to need. Now, what we're actually going to be doing is we're actually going to be using the TensorFlow functional API. So a lot of tutorials tend to use the sequential API, but what I've actually found is the functional API is a lot more flexible when it comes to building really hardcore deep learning models, which in this case, this one actually is. Now, the model that we're going to be building is called a Siamese neural network. So this actually allows us to do something called one shot classification. We can actually pass through two images and determine whether or not that image is the same. So if I actually bring up that paper, um, let's see if I can bring it up and I'll link to this in the description below as well. So basically what we're actually going to be doing is we're actually going to be building up this network described in this paper. So Siamese neural networks for one shot image recognition. And if you actually take a look at the architecture here, so this is really important. So we are going to have two inputs. So you can see that there is a break between these hidden layers here. So we've got this input and we've got this input. What we're effectively doing is we are passing through two images at the, at the same time. And then we're going to have this distance layer. So this actually measures the similarity between the two images. And we're going to train our neural network to determine what that similarity is like. So if it is very similar, then we're going to output a one, which basically means it is verified. If they are completely different, then we're going to output a zero, which means we are unverified. Now, in terms of the neural network that we're going to be building, we're effectively going to be implementing this or something very, very similar to this. I think the input shape that we're going to be passing through is a little bit different. We'll have 100 by 100, but you will see that towards the end of this series. So we're actually going to take this model and actually implement it in real time, which is super cool. All right, we've digressed. So this is the model that we're going to be building. We're going to be using the TensorFlow functional API, and I will link to this in the description below. But for what we need to do now is we we actually need to import those functional API components, so functional API. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay, those are our functional API components now imported, and we've also imported TensorFlow as well. So let's take a look 
take a step back as to what we've got actually got and imported. So what I've written is from tensorflow.keras.models import model. This is probably one of the most important layers that you're going to need. So when you're actually defining your model using the functional API, what you effectively do is you type in model and you pass through two things. So you pass through inputs and then you set that and then you also pass through outputs and you set that. So what we're effectively going to be doing is we're going to be building up our neural network and then passing through what we want our inputs to be and our outputs to be. So this is a slightly different to the sequential API, but it allows you to define a significantly more sophisticated neural network. So ideally what we'll actually have is we'll have our input image, let's put this in brackets, our input image, and then our uh, verification image. And what we're effectively going to get out is a layer which effectively outputs one or zero. So that is effectively what our model is going to look like by the time we actually get to it. So that is what the model class is used for. So in order to do that, I've written from tensorflow.keras.models import model. And this is effectively giving us this. And then a big part of our deep learning models are a whole bunch of different layers. So in order to do that, we've imported a bunch of different layer types. So we've imported or we've written from tensorflow.keras.layers import layer. So this layer class is a high level class. So this actually allows us to define a custom layer. Now, when it actually comes to doing that, we can effectively create a whole new class to actually go and generate that layer. So it's effectively class um, L1 or the class that we're actually going to be implementing is going to be called L1 distance. And we can actually pass that layer through so we can perform inheritance for that layer. So this effectively allows us to create a custom neural network layer. So we'll actually be going through some really cool concepts as part of this bigger series. Okay, so we've imported from tensorflow.keras.layers import layer. And then we've actually gone and imported some standard layers. So conv2d, this allows us to perform convolutions. So if you've heard of convolutional neural networks, that is exactly what that allows us to do. We've imported dense, so this gives us a fully connected layer, which is effectively what you typically see in most neural networks. So it sort of looks um, like these layers that you're seeing here. We've then imported max pooling, so this allows us to pool our layers together and effectively shrinks the information that we've actually got. So this is almost like averaging, or uh, in this case, it's not averaging. It's actually taking the max values over a certain region to effectively reduce how much data we're actually passing through to the next layer. And then we've got our input. So this is again, another base class. So if you think about the three most important classes we've got here, it's model, layer, and input. So our input allows us to define what we're passing through to our model and our layer effectively, or our model actually allows us to compile it all together. And our layer gives us our base class. And when we're defining our input, we're effectively typing input and then shape and you're specifying the shape there. And then the last layer that we've imported is flattened. So this effectively takes all the information that you've got from a previous layer and flattens it down into a single dimension. So that allows us to pass convolutional neural network data to a dense layer. So that's what we're going to be using that for. And then we've imported TensorFlow as TF. So import TensorFlow as TF. So let's quickly recap on what we've imported. So from tensorflow.keras.models, import model from tensorflow.keras.layers import layer comma conf 2d comma dense comma max pooling 2d comma input comma and then flatten and then we've imported the tensorflow base or the tensorflow class overall or tensorflow overall so import tensorflow as tf so we're going to use this for our image processing and a whole bunch of other helpers but that is section 1.2 now done so what we can actually do is uh, delete this because we don't need that and we can delete that. So that is section 1.2 now done. So what we can now do is go on ahead and set our GPU growth. So this you only need to do if you're doing it on a GPU based machine. So if you're not doing this on a GPU on a machine that has a GPU, you can skip this step. What we're effectively doing here is we're limiting how much VRAM TensorFlow can use on the GPU because by default TensorFlow is going to expand to take it all over. And if you don't go and set this, then you're effectively going to run into out of memory errors. So this helps avoid this. So let's write a comment. So avoid out of memory errors by setting GPU memory consumption growth, right? So think of this about like, or think of this as like putting some chains around your GPU to let it go, to stop TensorFlow from, from going crazy. Or well, it's more chains around TensorFlow 
than the GPU. But effectively, we're going to be locking TensorFlow down so it doesn't go crazy, right? So let's go ahead and do this. Uh, okay, hold on with uh, list fizz. Okay, so that is our memory consumption growth now set. So we've gone and written three different lines of code there. So first up, what we're doing is we're actually accessing all of the different GPUs on the actual machine. So if I actually type out GPUs, you can see that we've actually only got one there. So if I take a look at the length of that, so you can see we've got one GPU. So in order to get that, we've written GPUs equals tf.config.experimental dot list underscore physical underscore devices and then we've passed through a string which says gpu so what this line is doing is it's actually getting all of the different gpus that are available on our machine then we're actually storing that inside of a variable called gpus which is effectively what i'm showing here all right so you can see it says physical device name equals forward slash physical underscore device gpu zero so this basically means that we have a gpu here now in this case, the GPU that I'm using is a RTX 2070 Super. So I think it's got around about 8 gigs of VRAM. So just something to keep in mind, sharing some information, you know. All right, then what we're doing is we're actually going through and we're setting our memory growth. So we are looping through all of the GPUs. So again, if you had multiple GPUs, this is going to work as well, which is why we do the loop. So for GPU in GPUs, that's so effectively just looping through this. So for GPU in GPUs. We could effectively print GPU, right? So we're effectively looping through them. But then what we're doing is we're actually setting our memory growth, which is this function, which you can see right there. So I've written tf.config.experimental.set underscore memory underscore growth. And then we're passing through the GPU that we're processing at that time. So if you remember, we're looping through each one of them up here. This is actually going to go and set that GPU and set memory growth equal to true got a bit tongue-tied there all right cool so you can see that that is now done so we're grabbing all of our gpus we're looping through each one of them if we've got multiple this works and then we're using the set underscore memory underscore growth method to set our gpu growth equal to true and remember we're passing through that gpu and passing through true to actually set that cool so uh, we can delete this cell down here so let's delete that and that is section 1.3 now done. Now, the next thing that we need to do is a little bit of setup. So we actually want to set up our folder structure so that we are in a good place when it actually comes to getting our data. So if we actually do, do, do let me actually show you where I'm working, what I'm working with. So the folder that we're current, I'm currently working in is looks a little bit like this. So right now I've just got a virtual environment. I've got some Jupyter Notebook checkpoints and I've got the actual notebook that we're working in at the moment. What we need to do is create a couple of folders. So we are going to create three specific folders for our data. We're going to create one called anchor, one called positive and one called negative. Now let me explain what each one of these is going to do. So if we actually take a look at our neural network, let's see if there's an example of it. Uh... Okay, this is a good example. So when we actually go to perform our facial verification, we're actually going to pass through two images. We're going to pass through an image called an anchor, which is, think of this as your input image, right? So this is, if we are going and doing it in real time, it would be the image that's captured from your iPhone or the image that's captured from your webcam or whatever image that is verifying you in real time. So think of this as your anchor. We then pass through a verification image or a um, positive or negative image. So what we're effectively going to be doing is saying, hey, does our anchor match the positive image? So in this particular case, you can see the soccer ball matches the soccer ball. So it outputs same. When our neural network does it, it will output one. We then also pass through a, our input image again or our anchor image. And then we verify it against a negative, And we want to make sure that that is different because we effectively want our neural network to be able to distinguish between ourselves and another person. So we're going to call the input image an anchor image. We are going to call the verification image, which is positive, the positive image. And we're going to call the verification image, which is a negative example, the negative image. Now, all the negative data we're actually going to get from a repository called labeled faces in the wild, which is a sort of like a standard repository, but we're going to be doing that 
in another tutorial. I'll show you all in another episode of this series, but I'm going to show you how to set all that up. So when we actually go to collect our positive and our anchor data, we're going to be using our webcam for that. So again, we're going to be going through that, I believe, in episode two of this. Cool. That is that uh, explained. So what we now need to do is actually create some folder structures. So what we'll first up do is we're going to set our paths and then we'll actually use the OS library to actually go and create those directories. So let's set up our paths first up. Okay, so those are our paths set up and we haven't actually created the folders there. We're just defining what our paths are going to look like. So this is effectively what our directories are going to look like. I'm calling them paths, but it's just our directories, right? So I've written POS underscore path and I've just defined all of our paths in negatives because it just makes it a little bit easier to understand what they are. So POS underscore path equals OS dot path dot join. So what os.path.join does is it effectively joins different directories together to be able to form a full file path. So what you'll get out of this is data, and then it's either going to be a forward slash or a double backslash, depending on what type of OS you're using. So the file path is going to be data and then forward slash or backward slash positive. So if I actually take a look at that and type out positive path, you can see this is just returning the file path that we're about to create. And then we've gone and done it for our negative images and our anchor images. So remember our positive images are going to be our positive verification images and negative images are going to be our negative verification images and our anchor images are going to do the same. Now, when it actually comes to implementing this on a, or on a real life implementation, I've got a slightly novel or special implementation that we're actually going to use. But again, we're going to do that more later on in this series, but um, we've got spe something special to make this actually work really, really well. All right, so we've got positive path, negative path, and anchor path. And then what we are going to do now is create those directories. So let's go on ahead and do that. And let's actually just take a look at the folder. So we're going to basically create one big folder called data. And then inside of there, we're going to have three different folders. So one called positive, one called negative, and one called anchor. Now, what we need to do is actually go on ahead and create those. So let's go on ahead and do that. So I'm just going to delete this cell here and then create a new one. Let's do it. Okay, so those are our directories now made. So let's add a comment there, make the directories. So in order to do that, I've written os.makedears. Now keep in mind, it is M-A-K-E-D-I-R-S, not M-K-Dears. Uh, make dears actually goes and creates all the subsequent folders. So if you don't have a top level directory created, it's actually going to create the full file path. So I've written os.makedears and then I've passed through our positive path os.makedears and then pass through our negative path and then os.makedears and pass through our anchor path. So we're effectively doing this path, this path, and then this path. Now, if you wanted to, you could put this inside of a list and then loop through them. I figured it's just as easy to do this. But basically, we're going to be creating all of our different directories. So if we now go into our folder and mine is inside of YouTube and uh, Face ID, you can see, let me zoom in on that so you can see it a bit better. So you can see I've now got this folder called data. And inside of that, I've got three folders. So one called anchor, one called negative, and one called positive. There's nothing in there at the moment, but our three folders are created. And you can see that we've also gone and created this top level data folder. So everything that we're going to use when it comes to getting our data is going to be in here and then in one of these three repositories. Cool. All righty. And I think on that note, that is us done. So we've gone and now created our folder structures. So we defined our parts and we went and set up our directory. So we've gone and done a whole bunch of stuff in this tutorial. So we went and installed our dependencies. We went and imported them. We then went and set our GPU growth. And we also went and created our folder structures to get ready to actually start collecting our images and building our face ID or facial verification model. So on that note, that is this tutorial now done. See you in the next one. Thanks so much for tuning in guys. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, be sure to give it a thumbs up, hit subscribe and tick that bell and let me know if you've got any questions or comments in the comments below. Thanks again for tuning in, peace. What's happening guys, welcome to part two in the series on facial recognition using a Siamese neural network where we try to implement the code from an existing deep learning research paper. And in this particular case, we're going to be doing 
facial recognition or facial verification. So ideally we'll be able to use a webcam or a camera to be able to verify ourselves inside of an application. Let's take a deeper look as to what we'll be going through in this tutorial. Alrighty, so in part two, what we're going to be doing is we're going to focus on getting our data. Now, remember from part one, what we needed was three different types of data. So we needed our negative images, we needed our anchor images, and we needed our positive images. So in order to collect our negative images, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be leveraging a standard image repository or facial image repository called labeled faces in the wild. So we'll be able to download that and unpack it and get it into the structure that we need for our model. We're also going to collect our anchor images and our positive images. Now, in this particular case, we're going to be using OpenCV to do that using a webcam. But if you've already got some images of yourself, say, for example, you've collected them using your phone, you can definitely use those as well. Ready to do it? Let's get to it. Alrighty, guys. So in this tutorial, what we're going to be doing is collecting our data sets from the labeled faces in the wild data set. And then we're also going to be collecting our positive and our anchor classes. So this basically means that we're going to have all the data that we need to at least go on ahead and train our model. Now, before we get into it, I wanted to sort of explain a little bit more as to or, or how we're going to actually be using these data sets. So let's actually take a look at how this is all going to work. Now, as I mentioned before, we're going to have a positive data set and we're also going to have a or we're going to have positive examples, negative examples and anchor examples. So I wanted to sort of visualize how this is actually going to work. So let's take a look at our first positive or our positive examples first. So say, for example, we have an input image. Wow, that's a little bit thin. Let's make that a bit bigger. So we've got an input image. So uh, imagine this is coming from our webcam. Move this out of the way. Webcam. And then what we're going to have is a positive image. So positive. When we actually go and build our model, what we're going to do is we're going to pass this or pass both of these images to an embedding model or an encoding model is probably a better term. And these models that you can see here, so let me change the color so it's a little bit uh, better to see. So this model is effectively going to be our encoding model. So it's going to convert our webcam or our anchor representation. So this webcam data is our anchor. So we're going to convert that model encoding to a data representation. And then when we actually go and build our model, what we're actually going to be doing is trying to determine the difference between our anchor and our positive. So this layer that we're going to implement over here is actually going to be a distance layer. So think of it as going, all right, so we're going and converting our input images to a embedding or an encoding. And then what we're going to do is we're going to try to see how similar they are. And if they are very similar, then what our model is going to do is it's going to output a one to basically say we are verified. Which is effectively saying that the person inside of our positive image is the same person inside of our anchor image, right? So these are all going to be connected. Now, the cool thing about using this particular type of model is that if you wanted to go and implement this on other people, then you definitely could. All you would need to do is pass through a different positive image and pass through the same anchor image or pass through a different anchor image and it will be able to verify against a whole range of people. Now, in our particular case, we're going to be doing it against one person, but that's perfectly fine. Now, let's take a look at a negative class, right? So I'm going to do this one in blue. So again, actually, let's do it in the same color. So we're again going to have our anchor image. Right, and this could be from your webcam. It could be an image from your phone. It's really going to be what we're passing through as our input to effectively perform our verification. Then we're also going to have a negative example. And again, we're going to be using this same embedding layer or the same embedding model or encoding model, whatever you want to call it. And we're going to be passing these images through. So these models that you see here, or this model is the same across the board. I'll actually draw it, uh, make it a nicer orange. 
That's nice. All right, so this, everything that you see here, that is going to be the same model. So effectively, what that model is going to learn how to do is how to best represent the input images to be able to ensure that when we actually go and perform our similarity analysis, that we're actually accurately classifying them as either positive or they match or they don't match as in negative. So when we go and pass through our anchor and our negative, what's actually going to happen is when we pass this through to our distance layer, our distance layer is going to say, hey, not the same, the same. And it's going to output a zero. So which means that we are unverified. So I figured I'd give a little bit of a visual representation of what we're building because sometimes I think it's very easy to get lost as to how these neural network models work. But basically, this is in a nutshell how this neural network is going to be built up. So what we're actually going to be doing in this tutorial is we're going to be focused on collecting our data. So this one's going to be, so we're going to be collecting our anchors, which are there. We're going to be collecting our positives, which are there. And we're also going to be collecting our negatives. Now, in our particular case, our anchors are going to come from our webcam. So we're going to do that using OpenCV. And our positives are going to come from our webcam as well. Web, not wed. Uh, and our negative data is going to come from the labeled faces in the wild data set. So this is an open source data set that actually has a whole bunch of different faces. So that in a nutshell is what we're going to be doing today. We're going to be focused on all of the stuff in, I don't know, what do you call this color? Aqua. We're going to be doing that. So we're going to be collecting that data. Alrighty. So let's actually get back to it and do some coding. So first up, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be collecting our labeled faces in the wild, and then we're going to collect our positive and anchor classes. So let's go on ahead and do this. Now, in order to get our labeled faces in the wild data set, you can actually go to this link here. So let me actually copy this so you can see it. So it is HTTP colon forward slash forward slash viz dash www.cs.umass.edu forward slash LFW forward slash. So this is actually going, I'll actually link to this in the description below so you can pick that up as well. So don't stress if you haven't picked it up. Now, as per usual, all the code that we write inside of this tutorial is going to be available via GitHub. So if you want to pick that up, you definitely can. And I'm actually structuring the code so you can see what we've written after tutorial one or part one of this series, what we've done after part two. So you'll actually be able to see progression. Okay, but for now, what we need to do is get our labeled faces in the wild data set. So if we go to this link, what you'll actually see is that right over here, we've got this link called download. So we're going to hit download and then there's a whole bunch of information here so we've got uh what do we have so we've got all images as gzip tar file all images aligned with deep funneling all images aligned with funneling all images aligned with commercial face alignment software so there's a whole bunch but what we're actually going to be doing is we're going to be using this one here so all images as a gzip tar file so let's hit that and this should start downloading. So it's about 172, 173 megabytes. So once you've got that, we'll be able to untire it and start working with it inside of Python. So let's give that a second to download. Alrighty, so that is our data set now downloaded. So what we're going to do is we're going to open that up inside of its folder. Oh, let's zoom out a little. All right, so you can see that that's downloaded. So I'm just going to cut that and paste it into the same folder that we're currently working in. So I am currently inside of my D drive, inside of YouTube and inside of our face ID folder. So I'm just going to paste that there. So once you've gone and downloaded it, put it or once you've gone and downloaded that data set, grab it and put it inside of the same folder as your Jupyter Notebook is in. So if you're doing this in Colab, just make sure it's in the same folder as your Jupyter Notebook. So you can see that that is our Jupyter Notebook that we're working on at the moment. That is our data set. So lfw.tgz. Cool. Alrighty. So what we now need to do is we now need to uncompress that. So it's a tar gz file. So you can see it's tgz. So we need to uncompress that. 
So we can go on ahead and do that inside of our notebook. So I'm just going to add a comment, uncompress, tar, gz, what is it? Labeled faces in the wild data set. All right, so we're going to, let's do it. Okay, so that is the command to uncompress and extract our data set. So I've written exclamation mark, tar, and then there's a space, dash XF, and then there's a space, and then there's the name of the file. So this command here is what's actually going to allow us to extract our data set and put it inside of the same repository or the same place that it currently is. This is actually just passing through the actual name of the data set. So if, say for example, in the future, the name of the data set from labeled faces in the wild changes, you're going to want to change this component here. So if we run this now, all things holding equal, this should uncompress and we should be able to see our data set. Okay, so that's finished running. So you can see that we no longer have an asterisk over here. So if we actually go and open up our data set again, I don't know why I closed the folder. That's cool. You can see that that's now been uncompressed. So we've got this folder here called LFW and we have a ton of images so you can see that it's actually labeled by person's name now we don't we're not actually really concerned with the person's name in this particular case because we're going to be using all of these for negatives but if you wanted to do um, a different form of facial verification so say for example you wanted to add triplet loss you could definitely do this and add pairs of images for different people in our particular case we're very much focused on the one person that we want to verify so what we need to do is we need to take all of these images. So if you actually open up these folders, there's multiple pictures of people, right? Heaps of people. List keeps going. What we want to do is we want to take these images inside of the labeled faces in the wild folder and inside of these subsequent folders. And we want to put it inside of the folders that we created in part one of this tutorial. So if you go into the data folder that we created earlier, we want to move all of those images from the labeled faces in the wild data set and put it inside of this negative folder. So what we're going to do is we're going to write the Python code to go on ahead and do that. So this is effectively going to put all of our data in the same place and follow the same structure. So let's go on ahead and do it. So we're going to, I'm just going to add a comment. So move LFW images to the following repository. So it's going to be data and then forward slash negative. All right, so let's go on ahead and write that code. Okay, so that is our code to move our data from the LFW folders and the subdirectories into our negative folder. Now, the key thing that I just realized is that I haven't actually gone and run the code that we had in our initial tutorial. So if I go and run this again, so let's actually take a look at what we've written first and then we're going to go and run our imports and stuff. So I haven't actually gone and run the initial steps. My bad, that's fine. Um, so if I actually go and run this now, we're going to get a whole bunch of errors. If I run this, you can see it's saying name OS is not defined. Perfectly fine. We'll solve that in a second. So first up, what we're doing is we're looping through every single directory inside of our labeled folders in the wild repository or directory. Then what we're going to do is we're going to loop through every single file inside of those subdirectories. So we're effectively saying, go into our, do, 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 where are we? So face ID. So go into this folder and then go into this folder and loop through each of these images because in some particular cases, there's multiple images of people. So you can see in that case, we've got multiple images. So we need to move each image into its new folder. So in order to do that, we first up define the existing path. So I've written X underscore path in caps and I've set that equal to os.path.join and then we've passed through LFW, which is the main directory or the root directory pass through the directory that we've extracted from here, because remember we're looping through them and then pass through the file name that we're getting from here. 
then we're specifying the new path name so i've written new underscore path in all caps and i've set that equal to os.path.join and then we're passing through our negative path which is from our previous tutorial which we defined over here and we're passing through our file name so this is going to effectively join our negative path and our file name and then we're going to use os.replace and we're going to pass through our existing path and our new path so this is going to grab it from our existing path and move it to our new path but as of right now this isn't going to run because we haven't run our import so i'm going to go right up to 1.2 run this so that's going to import opencv os random numpy matplotlib then we'll import our tensorflow dependencies not that i think we'll need them now And then we're just going to run uh, the code under 1.3 and we're going to run the code under 1.4. So that's going to define our different paths, so our positive path, our negative path, and our anchor path. Okay, now if we go and run this, all things holding equal, let me actually just show you quickly how this actually works. So if I write os.list here, lfw, so this actually returns all the subsequent folders inside of the lfw directory. Now, if I loop through those, so for directory in os.listia, what's going to happen is I'm going to be able to access each directory. So if I write for file in os.listia, uh, and this should be os.path.join. I've actually written, got an error there. So os. let me actually run it without changing it and we'll see what happens. So if I run lfw and then directory, that's going to throw an error. So this should actually be os.path.join because right now I'm not joining those directories together. So if I change that here as well, os.path.join and then if I print a uh, file, this is going to print out every single image. So now if I actually join these together, so os.path.join and if we pass through lfw, so os.path.join just joins directory names together. So it gives us a full path. So if I pass through lfw and then directory and then file and then close that, this is going to give us the full path to every single image, right? So that is exactly what we're doing to get our existing path. Then what we're doing is we're defining the new path. So we're going to do os.path.join and we are going to be passing through our negative path and our file All right so we're effectively going to be grabbing this image and then moving it into data and then negative and then aaron eckhart and so effectively it's the same name so we're grabbing this and moving it to here we're doing this we're moving it to here so we're just going to loop through and do this for every single image so if i delete that we don't need that anymore and i actually go on ahead and run this this is actually going to move all of our images from those existing stacked directories into our negative path and that is done so it ran reasonably quickly so if we go into that folder now and go into d drive youtube face id and if we go into let me zoom in on this data and then negative you can see we've got all of our negative images there pretty good right now i don't think we're going to use all these images for training but you sort of get the idea we've got plenty to work with if we need to so what's happening now so we can actually close this so what we just went and did there so if we go into our lfw folder and you can see that each one of these are now empty because we've actually gone and moved them into our new folder so what we can actually do is delete this lfw folder there's nothing in it we can get rid of it now so if we delete that we are all good cool so that is step 2.1 now done so we've gone and uncompressed our label faces in the wild data set and we have also gone and moved all of those images from the lfw directories into our negative path which we defined up here from the first episode in this series cool so what's next is that we need to actually go and collect our positive and our anchor classes now for this, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be using OpenCV to access our webcam and we're going to collect those images down and save them down. Now, the size of the images that we're actually going to be collecting are going to be 250 pixels by 250 pixels. So by default, when we use our webcam, your image resolution might be a little bit different. 
So what we actually want to do is we want to ensure that we're collecting images of that size because I believe the sizes from the LFW data set are going to be in that same size as well. So let me just double check that. So if we go into data and then negative, and if I go and open one of these so properties and details, yep. So you can see they're 250 by 250 and I can check another. And again, 250 by 250. So to make our lives a little bit easier, we're just going to ensure that we collect the same or images of the exact same dimensions when we collect our anchor and our positives. This is going to make your data processing a whole bunch easier when it comes to training the model. All right, cool. So that is good. So what we now need to do is do exactly that. So we're going to be using a pretty standard OpenCV loop to be able to go and collect this with a few tweaks to make our lives a little bit easier. But first up, what we need to do is ensure we can access our webcam and do that successfully. So let's go on ahead and do that. Okay, so that is the first part of our video capture code or image capture code now done. So I've gone and written one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different lines of code there. So this is, if you've watched any of my computer vision tutorials, this is going to look super familiar to you. So let's actually comment through this. So first up, what we do is we establish a connection to the webcam. And that is exactly what this line is doing here. So I've written cap equals cv2 dot video capture. And then I've passed through a video capture device. Now, I think it's going to be video capture device three, but it might be a little bit different because I've gone and installed some new stuff on my PC, but we'll see. And then I've written, so I've actually, I think it's actually because I'm actually doing the whiteboarding now, but, and let me know what you guys thought of that. I'm, uh, I'm testing that out. We'll see if it picks up or if you guys enjoy it. If you don't, let me know and I'll stop doing it. So once we've established our connection to the webcam, I've then written while cap is open. So this is going to loop through every single frame in our webcam. And then we're using cap.read to actually read that capture at a point in time. And then what we do is we actually unpack the results that we get from that method there. So we unpack it and get a return value and the actual frame. So this frame is the actual image. Then what we're doing is we're rendering that image back to the screen. So it just makes it a little bit easier to actually see what we're doing. So we've written cv2.imshow. So let me add some comments here. So show image back to screen. So cv2.imshow. And then we're naming what we want our frame to be named. So in this case, I've written image collection. You can name it whatever you want. And then we've gone and passed through our frame, which is what we got from over here. So this is effectively going to be showing the feed from our webcam on our screen inside of Python or inside of a CV2 frame. And then everything from here on out is to do with breaking gracefully. So what we've written is if CV2 dot wait key one. So this is going to wait, I believe it's one millisecond. So CV2 dot wait key. Uh, so it says delay. What is it? Uh, this function. Yeah. So it's in milliseconds. So it's going to wait one millisecond and it's also going to check what key we've actually pressed. So this is actually unpacking what is being pressed from our keyboard. So then we've written end zero XFF equals odd Q or equals equals. So let's check it's doing a comparison check. This is really important because we're going to use this a little bit more in a second. So when we hit Q on our keyboard, this should close down our frame. But what we're also going to do in a second is we're actually going to configure some other ones so that when we hit a, it's going to collect an anchor. And when we hit P, it's going to collect a positive image. And I think we're going to collect roughly, uh, roughly 300 ish images. Doesn't matter. We'll see. I think 300 is probably a good, good starting point. Okay. So that is doing that check. And then if that check is passed, so if it waits a millisecond and we hit Q on our keyboard, then it is going to break out of this loop up here. And then it's actually going to release our webcam. So let's actually comment this for once, uh, release the webcam. And then it's going to destroy 
uh, or close the image show frame. So if ever you are using OpenCV and you're accessing your webcam and stuff is just freezing up, it's not working, what you can actually do is run cap.release to release your webcam and then cv2.destroy all windows to actually close everything down and re-kick things off. So if this number up here is incorrect and it all locks up and freezes up, what we'll do is we'll stop this cell from running and then we'll run these two commands down here to be able to release whatever webcam we're trying to access and then destroy all those windows. So that is our image, oh, well, that is our webcam code now set up. We haven't actually done any image collection yet. So if we go and test this out, let's see if that works. So if that does run successfully, you'll get a little pop-up. All right, so that has not run successfully. So this error is a common error that I always get asked about. So error OpenCV 4.5.3, blah, 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 source.mt in function. So this basically means this here, super important. Let me zoom in on that. That basically means that it's not able to access the webcam. So what, whatever we're getting back from that webcam device or that image device is empty, which means that we don't have the right webcam number up here. So what we want to try to do is try a different uh, webcam number. So let's try four. That might work a little bit better. All right, so that's worked. So you can see that I've got this little pop-up and you can see our feed. All right, so sometimes you're going to have to tweak that, right? So, and this is, it's great that I'm showing you this because it'll actually show you how to resolve that error. So all we did there is we changed our video capture device from three to four. And you can see that I've now got the right video capture device. So I can see myself in the screen and you can see up there that it says image collection. So that image collection label is coming from over here. So if we wanted to change that, you definitely could. Okay, so the key thing now is that this video frame that we're currently looking at is not in the dimensions of 250 by 250 pixels. So if I quit out of this, and remember if we hit Q, so this section of code is going to trigger. So let me actually show you this. So if I hit Q on my keyboard, you can see it shuts it down. What was I going to say now? Next. Okay, so the frame, so the frame dimension. So if we actually take a look at frame, so the nice thing about this loop is that you're going to be able to access the last set of variables that are being captured. So if we actually take a look at frame, this is our image. And if I run, uh, this was the advantage of using matplotlib. So if I type plot.imshow, you can see that that's our image there. Ignore the coloring. That's because OpenCV has a slightly different channel order. Perfectly fine. Key thing we're interested in is that if I type in frame.shape, this is not 250 by 250 pixels. Right now it's 480 by 640 pixels by three channels. So we actually need this to be 250 by 250 by three. So what we can actually do is we can actually do a little bit of indexing or slicing to actually get the right shape. So say for example, I just did indexing. So say uh, I'll grab the first 250 by the first 250 by everything, you can see that we are now getting 250 by 250 by three. And so all I've done there is just some slicing or some array slicing. So if I actually go and plot this now, plot.im show, you can see I'm getting the top, what is that? Top right corner, top left corner. So in this case, I'm getting the top left-hand corner, but you can see that that's not actually accurately capturing my face. So it's a little bit of a pain there because this is going to suck when it comes to performing facial verification. So what we could actually do is we could actually tweak these numbers. So rather than starting from zero, which is effectively what this code is doing, let's say we started uh, a little bit further in. So we started from, what's a good, what did I actually end up using? So 120, and then we did 120 plus 250. And then for our x-axis, we did 200 and then 200 plus 250. So if we go and do that now, that is a little bit better. So we're now at least getting somewhere closer to where our face actually is. Now, when we actually go and collect our images, we can effectively render that to the screen so we can see where we are inside of that position. So that's perfectly fine. So let me actually explain what I've done there. 
So what I've actually gone and done is some indexing or some slicing. So this first value is going to tell us, or it's actually going to determine where our pixels start on the y-axis and where they end. So we're effectively starting at 120 pixels and we're by passing through our colon, we're saying we're going to go from 120 pixels to 120 plus 250 pixels. So this is basically specifying the range of values that we want from our image. And we're doing exactly the same on the x-axis, except here we're starting at 200 pixels and we're going to 200 to 200 plus 250. So it's starting at 200 and going to 450 pixels. For our y-axis, we're starting at 120 and we are going to, what is that, 370 pixels. And then by passing through another comma and a colon, we're effectively saying that we want all three channels. If I pass through just uh, zero, we're only going to get one color channel. If I pass through one, we're going to get a different color channel. And if I pass through two, again, we're going to get a different color channel there. But if I pass through colon, we're going to grab all three. So that means we're going to retain the fact that we have a color image. Okay, so what we now need to do is we now need to implement this logic inside of our image capture loop. So what we had from up here. So let's go on ahead and do this. So we're effectively going to just grab, do effectively this and paste this here. So we're going to be taking that slice of our frame from our webcam and we're going to reset the variable. So we're going to set frame equal to this sliced version. So cut down frame to 250 by 250 pixels. So now if we go and run our image capture loop, we're only going to be grabbing 250 by 250 pixels. So if I go and run that, you can see that that's effectively doing it. So when, when we actually go and collect images, I'll probably bring my seat a little bit further down and ensure my head is actually inside of that frame but you can see that that is going to be replicating what we've got from our labeled faces in the wild data set a little bit more accurately than if we just went and grabbed 640 by what is it 480 by 640 cool all right so that's effectively giving us our 250 by 250 pixels what do we need to do now so we actually now need to write out some images or actually save some images so again i'm going to hit q on my keyboard and close that down Okay, so what do we need to do? So we now need to collect our anchors and positives. So I'm just going to add two additional comments. Collect anchors, collect positives. And so we're going to use this logic that we had down here. So our breaking logic to actually go and collect our anchors and our positives. So I'm actually going to copy this and paste it here and paste it here. And what we want to do is we want to trigger our anchor collection when we hit A on our keyboard. So I'm actually going to change the value inside of our ORD function from Q to A. So this basically means that it's going to wait a millisecond. And if we actually hit A within that millisecond, it's going to collect an anchor image. And we're going to do the same for our positives, but rather than hitting Q, we're going to hit P. So when we hit A on our keyboard, it's going to collect an anchor. And when we hit P on our keyboard, it's going to collect a positive image. Now, by stacking these together, it does mean that there is going to be a little bit of a lag. But instead of implementing a ton of logic, I just figured this should be fine. We can effectively work around this. Okay, so what are we doing now? So we're going to collect our anchors and our positives. So what we now need to do is we now need to implement some logic to actually grab our frame and save it to our positives and anchor folders. Now, before we actually do that, I'm actually going to import a library called UUID. So the UUID library is actually going to make it a little bit easier to actually go on ahead and let's actually ensure that we don't have a screw function. So I'm just going to write pass there and pass there for now until we actually go and implement that logic. So we're going to grab UUID and this is going to ensure that we're able to create unique names for each one of our images. So in order to import UUID, so we're going to import the UUID library to generate unique image names. Uh, and so import UUID. Cool. So that's UUID now imported. So I've written import UUID. And UUID stands for Uniform Unique Identifier or Unique Uniform, something like that. So what is it? 
UID, question mark, question mark. Nope, lowercase. Oh, it's universally unique identifiers. There you go. So it basically gives you a specific pattern to generate a unique identifier. Now, in order to use it, there's a few different methods. So if I type in UUID dot, there are a bunch of different formats that you can have. So it can be UUID 1, UUID 3, UUID 4, or UUID 5. So we're just going to use UUID 1. So if I type in UUID 1, you can see that it is generating this unique identifier there. So we are effectively going to be using that to generate our unique image name. So we're just going to implement that there. So let's go on ahead and do that. And we'll take a step back and take a look at what we wrote. Okay, so that is, oh, we haven't actually finished that. cv 2im right, let's finish that. Okay, that is us done. So what we've effectively gone and done is we've added two additional lines of code there. So I've written, first up, what we're actually doing is we're creating the unique name, create the unique file path. And then we're actually going on ahead and writing out our image, so write out, what is it? Anchor image. Okay, so let's take a look at what we wrote. So first up, I've created a variable called image name, so img name, and I've set that equal to os.path.join. And then we've gone and passed through our anchor path because we're going to store our anchor images inside of our anchor path. And then we're just creating a unique name or a unique name for our file. So if I go and copy that, you can see that we're just appending our unique identifier to .jpg. So this effectively means that when we go and do this multiple times, we're going to be creating unique identifiers each time. Is that actually, yeah, it is changing. So you can see that there. And then by wrapping it in os.path.join, we're effectively going to be creating a full file path. File path. So os.path.join, if I pass through a and c path, comma, and then this unique file name, this is effectively going to be storing our images inside of the data folder, inside of the anchor folder, and then it's going to be naming it that there. And in order to actually go and write out our image, I've written cv2.imwrite, and we're passing through our image name, which is what we just created up here. And we're passing through our cut down 250 by 250 pixel frame. Cool. So that is that now done. Now, what we can also do is just copy this over here and paste it under our positives. And all we need to do is change the anchor path to the positive path because we're going to be storing them inside of different folders. So that is effectively that there now done. Okay, I think we're good. So if we actually go and run this, we should be able to hit A on our keyboard to collect anchor images and P on our keyboard to collect positive images. So if I go and let's actually do this side by side so we can actually see our folders. So if I go into D drive and then YouTube and then face ID, uh, and then data and then anchor. So we're first up going to collect our anchor images. So if I actually go and run this code here now. Yep. Okay. So that's, let's run it. Cool. All right. So we've got our image of ourself and what I'm going to do is I'm going to put down the green screen. And let's actually test this out. So I'm just going to get my head inside the frame, move the mic out. You can still hear me, fingers crossed. All right, and so what we're going to do now is we're going to hit A on our keyboard to collect an anchor. So if I hit A, make sure we're clicked into it. All right, so you can see that that is collecting our images. Pretty cool, right? So if we keep hitting A, we should be able to collect a bunch more. I'm just going to move my head around. I'm just holding down A. All right, so it looks like we've got 400 images there. That should be more than enough. So you can see 414 down there. So we've got plenty. Just take a look at a different view. All right, so we've got a ton of images.
let's get somewhere we're a little closer as well so if i go and a little bit closer cool all right so that's 489 images that we've collected now what i'm going to do is i'm just going to jump into the positive folder and let's collect some positives so again hit p on our keyboard this is going to start collecting positive images i'm just going to move my head around as i'm collecting now it is going to take a little bit longer to collect our positive images because we've got that one millisecond break. Probably speed this up in editing, but that's pretty cool. So you can see that we are effectively collecting images. So we want around about 300 for each. That's what we'll use for training. Alrighty, that should be enough. So we've got, what, 332 positives now collected. Okay, so what we've gone and done there is if we go into our data folder, into our anchor, we've got a bunch of anchor images collected. And remember, we're going to have two streams when it comes to building our model. We're going to have the anchor image that we pass through, and we're also going to have the positive image or the negative image down here. So we're effectively going to be verifying whether or not our anchor images matches the negative or matches the positive. So it should output a one if it is positive. So if it matches the positive and it should output a zero if our anchor is being verified against a negative image. Okay, so we've got our anchor images. We've got our positive images. And again, these have been both collected via our webcam. And if we go, we've got our negative images as well. Pretty cool, right? So, if we go and hit Q now on our keyboard. Should hopefully close. There we go. All right. So, that is our data all collected. So, we've gone and done a bunch of stuff. So, that's effectively this entire tutorial now done. So, or at least part two. So, what we've gone and done is we first up went and collected our images from the labeled faces in the wild data set. And again, I'll link to that in the description below. We moved those into the negative folder. And then we went and collected a bunch of images using our webcam. And we collected both our anchor and our positive. So, this is actually doing our positive. Cool. So that is now done. So again, as per usual, all this code is going to be available inside of the description below via GitHub. But on that note, that about wraps it up. I'll see you in the next one. Thanks so much for tuning in, guys. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, be sure to give it a big thumbs up, hit subscribe, and tick that bell. And if you have any questions, comments, or queries, do let me know in the comments below. Thanks again for tuning in. Peace. What's happening, guys? Welcome to part three in the facial verification or facial recognition series, where we go from a complete research paper all the way through to building a front end implementation. So we're gonna be building up the model and then implementing it inside of an application. Alrighty, let's take a look as to what we'll be going through in this video. So well, let's make sure we go to present mode. So first things first, what we're going to be doing is we are going to be pre-processing our images. So we've got a bunch of images that we collected in the previous tutorial. What we're going to be doing is starting to pre-process those. Then we are going to create our positive and our negative samples. So remember, we took a look at the different architectures. So we're going to be passing through our anchor image plus a positive image. That's going to go through the pipeline. We'll then pass through a anchor image and a negative image. That's going to go through the pipeline when we train as well. We're going to be able to create those samples and actually load them into step three, which is our TensorFlow data loader. So we're going to be able to do all of this. And by the end of this tutorial, we should effectively have our data ready modeling so we'll actually be able to get to the deep learning part of this tutorial right after this okay ready to do it let's get to it okay so let's get out of slides that's plenty so what we're going to do is we are effectively up to step three in this process 
So we're going to get our image or get our image directories. We're going to pre-process them. So scale and resize. And then we're going to create our label data set, which is step 3.3. Let me have some tea guys. And then what we're going to do is we are going to build our train and test partition. Let me make this a little bit bigger. Okay. So first things first, we need to go on ahead and get our image directory. So remember we went and created our image directories right up here. So we created a folder called data. And then inside of that, there was a positive image. And then we created another one called negative and another one called anchor. So if we actually go and take a look at our data, so if we go into YouTube and then face ID, we've got this folder called data. If I zoom in on that, so you can see it. So we've got a folder called anchor, which you can see a whole bunch of mug shots of me there and then if we go into our negative folder got a bunch of images from the labeled faces in the wild directory and then if we go into positive we've got a bunch of additional mug shots of myself that's priceless oh god so there's some uh, some great photos of me in here but anyway we've got our data right now what we need to do is we're going to use the tensorflow data loader so if i bring this tensorflow data loader so this TF data pipeline allows you to build these data pipelines. And I've found that this makes building deep learning models a whole heap easier. So what we're actually going to do is we're actually going to first up load all the folders from their respective directories. We're going to create a pre-processing pipeline, which is going to be around about here. So we're going to create that pre-processing pipeline and then we're going to associate our positive and our negative classes. So we'll actually build up all of this. Okay. So first things first, let's go on ahead and get our image directories. Okay, so those are our image directories now obtained or specifically the files within our image directories now obtained. So what I've actually written there is three different lines of code. And again, I'm going to explain this in great detail. So we've gone and created three new variables. So anchor, positive and negative. And then what we've actually done is we've used the tf.data.dataset.listfiles method to actually go and grab all of the different images within a specific directory. So what this is actually doing is creating a data gen or creating a generator or using a generator to be able to loop through and grab all of the files within that specific dictionary or specific directory, not dictionary. So if we went and grabbed anchor now, and I'll explain that in a sec in a little bit more detail. So if I said um, anchor.asnumpy iterator, so I'm just going to show you something briefly. So dear test. And if I type in dear test.next. So what you can actually see there is we've actually got the full path to a specific image within our directory. So this tf.data.dataset.listfiles actually creates a set or a pipeline for all of the different files within a specific directory. Okay, so what we're effectively doing is we're going to a spe or we're passing through a specific path, so our anchor path. And then we're doing a wildcard search. So we're adding backward slash and then star.jpg. So this is effectively going, all right, grab everything inside of our anchor path, which has a .jpg extension. So the full line is anchor equals tf.data.dataset and dataset is in caps, .list underscore files. And then we're passing through the anchor path and then plus, oh, plus backward slash star.jpg. So if I grab this little bit here, you can see that it's effectively doing a wildcard search inside of that directory. So it's grabbing a data backward slash, backward slash, anchor backward slash, backward slash, star.jpg. And if you take a look inside of our data folder, so YouTube face ID data and then anchor, they should all be .jpg files. So you can see that. So say, for example, you were working with .png files, you could uh, change the .jpg or .png, for example. And then what we're doing is we're specifying that we only want to take 300 images because remember when we collected our data in the previous tutorial, we went and grabbed, I think it was roughly 300 anchor images, roughly 300 positive images, and then negative, we've got plenty from the labeled faces in the wild 
data set but we ideally want to make sure that we've got a matching number of samples for each of these different classes so anchor positive and negative so we're going to take 300 so in order to do that we're just appending dot take and then passing through the number 300 if you wanted to take more images you definitely could if you wanted to take less images you could do that as well um, but try it out so see what your performance looks like in the end which we'll obviously get to but in this particular case we're going to work with 300 images okay so that's our anchor line done so what we've gone and done is we've gone and done a similar thing for our positive and our negative line so positive equals tf dot data dot data set dot list underscore files and then we're passing through the positive path plus and then backward slash dot jpg so exactly the same as what we had in our anchor line but this time we're using a positive or passing through our positive path which was defined right up here. So remember, positive, negative, anchor path. These are our different paths. And we've gone and done the exact same there. So we've also gone and appended .take300 to grab 300 images. We'll grab 300 image paths, right? Because remember, this has only got the paths. It hasn't actually loaded our images into a data pipeline yet. Perfectly fine. We're going to handle that in a second. And then we've gone and written negative equals tf.data.dataset.listfiles. And then this time, rather than passing through the anchor or the positive path, we're passing through our negative path. And again, we're taking 300 images. And what else? So down here, I was basically showing you how to actually access this iterator. So you can actually type in the name of the data set or the data pipeline and type in dot as numpy iterator. And then by using the dot next method, you can continuously grab the next component inside of that pipeline. So if I run dot next again, you can see like watch here. So you can see that number is changing. So right now it's 8294 because that's the image ID changed. Grab the next one, grab the next one, grab the next one, grab the next one, grab the next one. And the nice thing about this is that when we actually go and batch our data together, the way that our model is going to train is we're going to train batch at a time. So we will grab one batch out of this data set, which we'll eventually create. We'll then go through, train it. So we'll do a forward pass. We will calculate the loss. We'll then go and what do we typically do then? Uh, we then go and calculate the gradients. So we actually go and, yeah, go and calculate the updated gradients and go and apply them to all of the different weights in our neural network. So basically this iterator, this data pipeline allows you to do that with a little bit more flexibility. Okay, that is step 3.1 now done. So we've gone and grabbed our anchor, our positive and our negative data sets or specifically our image files. And you can see that's an example of what we're actually getting out of here. So this particular case, we've got, we can print it out to make it look a little bit nicer. So we've got, oh, that didn't actually do anything. So, uh, so in this particular case, I've got data, backward slash, backward slash, anchor, backward slash, backward slash, and then the image within that directory. Cool. Alrighty. So the next thing that we need to do is go on to step 3.2 and start doing our pre-processing. So what we're actually going to do is we're going to write a pre-processing function that loads our image uh, from our directory. We're actually going to resize it and we're also going to uh, perform some scaling. So we're going to convert all of our image values from 0 to 255 to 0 to 1. So this helps our neural network optimize a lot easier. So rather than having a huge range of numbers, having it from zero to one effectively makes the uh, gradient descent a little bit easier um, and helps us achieve a better performing model a whole heap faster. So what we're going to do is we are going to write that function now. So let's do it. Okay, so the function that we are going to create is going to be called preprocess. I know super unique and creative. And then to that, what we're going to do is we're going to be passing through this specific file path. So we'll actually be passing through one of these file paths to this function. So we'll be able to use the map method. And again, don't freak out if I haven't explained this yet. We're going to go into it in more detail. But what we'll effectively do is once we've got our data set, so let me explain it in a little bit more detail. So we'll have a object, which is a tensorflow.dataset iterator or generator. And we'll be able to run dot map and to that, we can use the preprocess function. And this is effectively going to allow us to apply the preprocess method, which we're defining over here, over every single example that we've got within our anchor positive and negative classes. But again, we're going to go into that in more detail. I just wanted to explain why the hell we're writing this in the first place. Okay, so what are we doing? So we're going to finish this off. So let's do it.
Okay, that is our pre-processing function now done. So we've gone and written an additional one, two, three, four, five different lines of code. And these effectively load up our image from a file path. They also decode the JPEG. They then it then it resizes the image. It divides it by 255. So it performs its scaling and it returns the image. I'm going to explain this in more detail. So uh, let's actually see how it works. So if I go and run pre-process, and if I take this file path here, you can see what it's doing is it's returning a NumPy equivalent of our image. So if we wanted to, we could, um, so let's call it image. If I run plot, but I am show. So you can see it is effectively loaded up our image from this file path. It's gone and done a bunch of other stuff. So it's actually gone and resized it and it's gone and divided it by 255. So it's effectively scaled our image to be between one and zero. So if we run, um, what is this? So dot numpy, is that going to work? Yep. So dot min. So you can see our minimum value is not less. Well, it shouldn't be less than zero anyway, either way. But it is the 0 0.1 or 0 0.1. And then if we take a look at our max, so this is the most important thing you can see the maximum value that we've got is one. So it's not going past 255. So we're good there. Okay, let's take a look at each of the lines of code that we just wrote. So under our pre-process function, so in order to define our pre-process function, we've written def, key break, pre-process, and then we've passed through our file path and then colon. Then we've gone and written one, two, three, four, five different lines of code. So. First up, what we are doing is we're reading in our image. So read in image from file path. And in order to do that, we've written byte underscore image. So we've created a new variable and we've set it equal to tf.io.read underscore file. And then we're actually passing through the file path that we originally passed through to our function. So think of this like just passing through this path that we've got over here to our function. Pretty straightforward. So that is then going to read our file as a bytes like object. And then what we're doing is we're using the TensorFlow decode JPEG image to actually load in the image. So load in the image. And so the line there is image equals tf.io.decode underscore JPEG. And then to that, we're going to be passing through this byte image that we've got here. So you can see we're passing that there. So the full line is image equals tf.io.decode underscore JPEG. And then we're passing through byte image. Then the next line is actually doing a little bit of pre-processing. So think of this as our pre-processing steps. And the first one is we're actually resizing the image to be 100 pixels by 100 pixels by three channels. So in order to do that, we've written image equals tf.image.resize. And then we're passing through our image, which we've originally loaded from up here. And then we're specifying the dimension. So we want it to be 100 pixels by 100 pixels. The reason that we're doing this is if you actually take a look at the original paper, I wish I saw uh, why didn't I have it up? Let me open it up now so I can show you. Uh, do, do, do. It's in here. All right, so if we take a look at the neural network, network, um, so the input image that we actually have in the paper is uh, one image by 105 by 105. We're going to do it 100 by 100 just to keep things a little bit tweaked. But if we wanted to, we could actually make this 105 pixels by 105 pixels. Wouldn't cause an issue. Perfectly fine. We're going to make it 100 by 100. Uh, this isn't going to implicitly impact our neural network in any negative way, at least from what I've seen. But if you wanted to make it 105 by 105, perfectly okay. Alrighty. Then what we're doing is we are scaling our image. So scale image to be between zero and uh. So I've written image equals image divided by 255.0. So this effectively takes every single value or pixel value, which is traditionally from zero to 255 and divides it from, or divides it to be between zero and one now. So this effectively scales our image. And then last but not least, we're returning our image. So that we're able to do something like this. So this is an example of actually going on ahead and running it. And you can see it's actually loaded up our image so we can begin to work with it if we need to. All right. 
So the next thing that we need to do, well, we've actually already gone and shown it. So what we can then do is actually begin creating our label data set. So what we actually need to do here is we are going to create our positive and our negative examples. So remember when we actually go and validate, we are going to pass through an anchor image and a positive image. And this ideally should output one, so ideally verified. And we can also pass through an anchor image and a negative image, and that should ideally output zero. So what we can actually do is we can actually use a function called tf. Um, what is it? Ones like, yeah. So we can actually output tf. Ones like, and say, for example, I pass through one, this is effectively going to output an array, which represents the number or has the value one. But if I change it to be um, one, so a whole bunch of numbers, oh God, that's not a great example. What is that? So what we're actually going to get as the output of that is an array which has the same dimensions as whatever I've passed through the tf.ones like function. And ex rather than having a whole bunch of different values, we're actually going to have a number, a set of ones. So what we're going to do here is we're actually going to pass through our anchor images, our positive images, and we are going to specify. So that's going to be our, think of this as our input. And the output that we're going to have as a result of this is going to be a array, which is made up of ones. So think of this as representing our positive class. So we're going to create an example like this, which effectively represents our positive examples. And we're also going to create a similar version, which is going to be anchor and negative images, except here, rather than having ones, we're going to pass through zeros because these are unverified. Right, so this is effectively creating our labeled data set. So let me just comment that because we don't actually need it. So let's go on ahead and do this. So we're actually going to create our labeled data set now. Okay, it looks like we've got a bit of an error there. Uh, what have I done? Okay, this should be ones. Hold on. Zeros and we've also forgotten dot zip here. Okay, cool. Alrighty, so that is our directories now concatenated together. So what we've actually got is we've actually got uh, one big data set, which it has the shape of, uh, so it'll be our anchor images and then either our positive or negative file paths and then our either it's going to be ones or zeros. So let me explain what I've gone and written there because it is quite a fair bit. So I've written positives equals tf.data.dataset.zip. So this zip stuff together and allows us to iterate through all three at the same time. And then I've got inside of here, I've got a set of brackets, which effectively creates a tuple. And then we've passed through our anchor and our positive. So this is effectively going to be our different directories from what we had up here, or specifically our file paths. And then I've passed through tf.data.dataset.from tensor slices. And then to that, we've gone and passed through tf.ones for our positive. So this is effectively doing this. So if I show you that, so tf tf.ones and then len anchor so uh should be one s so that is creating a big set of array which represents ones so this is effectively creating our labeled positives right because we're effectively saying our anchors plus our positives or if we pass through our anchor and our positive at the same time it should effectively represent a one, which is a positive verification or a positive recognition. So say, for example, you also wanted to do this on pictures of other people. You would also pass through them as anchors and positive examples of them as positives. And you'd be passing through the ones as well. We're obviously doing it on one person, but you could definitely extend this out. Okay, so that is our positive data set or beginnings of our data set now sort of staged. So you can also see the shape here, right? So you can see that it's tf.string, tf.string, and then tf.float32. So the string is going to be the file path to our specific image. The second string is going to be the file path to either a positive or a negative image. 
and the last value is going to represent uh, whether or not it's a positive or a negative verification or recognition. Which in this particular case, our positives are going to have ones and our negatives are going to have zeros. So the second line that we wrote is negatives equals tf.data.dataset.zip. So again, it's zipping all of these together so we can iterate at the same time. And then we've gone and passed through our anchor and our negative, right? And so when we have an anchor plus a negative, we want to be, or we want our model to be outputting zero because it's a negative recognition or verification. And so what we've gone and done is we've gone and created a separate data set for our zeros. So tf.data.dataset.from underscore tensor underscore slices. And then to that, we've passed through tf.zeros, which have the shape of our anchor. So if I go and type in tf.zeros and then len anchor, that is effectively representing or creating an array of zeros, which match the exact shape of our negative classes or our negative samples. So you can see that it has its shape 300 and we're effectively wrapping this inside of this uh, tensorflow.dataset class. So if I go and do that. So again, this is just creating a, or putting that data inside of a data loader. So tf.data.dataset.from underscore tensor underscore slices. So we can begin to treat it exactly as what we did for our directories up here. Uh, so let's create an example. So this is, let's say, uh, this is a class reps or class labels. So then what we can do is convert it into an iterator. Class labels. So this is purely, for example, you don't need to write this. Um, and then what we can do is go iterator labels dot next. And this is going to get the next value, right? So we're effectively looping through each one of the labels in our class. So this converts it into the same format that our anchor and our negatives are in, effectively a tf.data.data class. Okay, we can delete that. So we don't need that. And then the last line that we wrote is data equals positives dot concatenate negative. So this is just joining our positive and our negative samples together. So we've effectively got it in one big data set, which you can see there. So we could do uh, convert this to a NumPy iterator. Uh, let's uh, call it samples and then samples dot next. So you can see that this is one representation of our data or one sample, right? So in this particular case, we have a, so remember that label is going to represent whether or not it's a positive or a negative class. So in this particular case, uh, we've got a one, which means it is a positive example. So this is a, the far path to our anchor. This is a file path to our positive image. And then we've got a one, which represents the label. So again, we could keep iterating through this. And right now it's not shuffled. So we're going to have to go through all of the positives before we get to the negatives. But once we shuffle it up, or once we do a couple of next pre-processing steps, you'll actually be able to see them in a better state. Okay, so that is that now done. Now what we can effectively do is go on to our last step which is pre-processing these images. So right now we haven't actually, or oh, what did I write there? So build, train, and test partition. So what we're actually gonna do is we're now going to use our pre-process function to pre-process these directories so that rather than just having the directory, we've actually got the anchor image, we've actually got the positive image, and then we've got our label. So either one or zero. So what we need to do is we need to write a second function which actually processes a twin. So right now, if you think of our negative or our anchor and our positive as a twin, we need to pre-process these. So load in both of the images and then concatenate it back into or return it back to this data set. So let's go on ahead and do this. Okay, that is our twin pre-processing function now done. So again, this one's a little bit more straightforward. So what we're effectively doing here is we've written df preprocess underscore twin. We've then passed through our input image or we're going to pass through our input image, our validation image and our label, which is effectively what we've got over here. And out of that, what we're going to do is we're going to return the loaded and pre-processed image. So remember, we're going to use this pre-process function, which we defined over here. So we're going to run pre-process on the input image, 
pre-process on the validation image. So this is effectively our anchor and this is could be either a positive or a negative. And we're also going to return our label. So let's actually test that out. So if I run pre-process, not caps, pre-process. See break. All right, so pre-process twin. And then if we, uh, this is, could be an example. All right, so let's take a look at example. Uh, so what we could do is we could pass this to our pre-process twin function and that effectively is what we're getting back. So what I've just gone and done there is I went and spelt the example wrong, but we did more than that. So we're grabbing the one example out of our data iterator, which we had from up here, and we're passing this through to our pre-process twin function down here. And this star is effectively unpacking the values that we've got inside of this tuple. So rather than writing out or extracting each one of these or unpacking each one of these, it effectively unpacks them and passes it through to our function. So could we do it like this? No, it's going to throw errors. We pass through a star that effectively unpacks it. Now you can see that the result out of here, so if I type in res equals, what I'm actually getting is three things. So uh, if I grab the first thing, so this is our, well, let's actually take a look at the length so you can see it. Right, so we've got three different values or objects inside of this result. The first thing is going to be our pre-processed image. So you can see that this is actually running our pre-processing function and loading our image as 100 pixels by 100 pixels by three channels. So if I went and plotted that, plot.imshow, you can see that's an image of yours truly. And if we take a look at our second value inside of that results variable, you can see that that is a positive sample. So this should effectively have a label of one. So if I go and type, uh, what is it? Res two, you can see we've got a label of one there. So all we've done up until here is we've effectively, this is the state that we want to get to, but now we need to do it on every single one of our examples inside of this data variable here. So let's quickly do a recap because we've done quite a fair bit. So first up, what we did is we used the tf.data.dataset.listFiles method to load up every single file inside of our anchor, our positive and our negative directory. Then we went, oh God, my voice just broke there. Then we went and wrote this pre-process function to be able to load our image from that directory, resize it to be 100 pixels by 100 pixels. And we also scaled it to be a value between zero and one because that is going to help our gradient descent and effectively help us to optimize our model. So we haven't used that yet effectively. I've demonstrated how to use it. Then what we went and did is we went and created our labeled data set. So we're effectively creating sets of twins, not triplets. So where you might've seen this done in Siamese neural networks before, you'd typically create a triplet. We're creating a twin or a tuple rather than a triplet because we're going to be passing through two values at the same time. And so we've created our positive samples and our negative samples. So really our positives are just going to be our anchor image plus our positive image. And the label that we're gonna get out of this is a one. We then created our negative samples and our negative sample is going to be our anchor image plus our negative image with a label of zero. And we went and concatenated those together so we can begin to work with them. Then we went and wrote our pre-process twin function. And the last thing that we actually need to do is actually go and apply this to this data object over here. So we're actually going to use the data.map method to be able to go and apply our pre-process twin function. So we've gone and done a lot of hard work already. All we now need to do is go and build up our data pipeline. So I'm going to do this and then I'm going to show you the results. Okay, that is the beginnings of our data loader pipeline now done. So what I've gone and written is data equals data dot map. And this is effectively doing app or running a pre-process twin function from over here. So it's going to take our input image path, our validation image path and our label. And it's going to return the actual image loaded and pre-processed for our anchor, the image loaded and pre-processed for our, either our positive or our negative image. And it's gonna return our label. 
So now when we go and take a look at this data set or this data object, we should effectively have our images. I'll, cut, I'll show you that in a second. The next two steps that we applied to our data loader pipeline is we wrote data equals data.cache. So we're caching our images. And then probably one of the most important pieces is we've gone and shuffled it up. So this is effectively uh, muddles up all of our images so that we're not just getting positive images and then negative images, they're all mixed up. So when we go and split our data into a training and testing partition, we're going to have, uh, ideally we should have a mixed set of samples. So in order to do that, I've written data equals data dot shuffle. And then we've specified a buffer, uh, and then we've specified a buffer size of 1024. So now if we go and take a look at our data object, you can see that we've got a shuffle data set, which has the shape of hundred pixels by hundred pixels by none, hundred pixels, hundred pixels by none. So this is our anchor image. This is going to be either our negative or our positive image. And then this will be our label. So if we go and create a NumPy iterator again, samples, and then if I grab samples dot next, you can see that we've got our data all ready for us and ready for training. So we've got, let's take a look at our length. Again, we've got three values and remember these are going to be either our anchor image or it will be our anchor image as our first value it'll be either our positive or our negative image for our second value and it's going to be our label so if i run uh, samples.next and then grab the first value that is going to be our anchor image so we can go and plot that out using plot.imshow cool and then if we go and grab our we should actually save this in a variable. Otherwise it's going to keep changing. Um, so let's go samp samples.next. And if I pass through samp zero, that's going to be our anchor image, pass through value one or index one. That's going to be, so this really, this is really, really good. So this should ideally mean that this is a negative class. So what does that, what label should we be expecting here? I'll give you some thinking music. All right, that's enough thinking music. That was terrible. Okay, so ideally our label should be label zero. If it's not label zero, it's going to be. Okay, cool. Phew. All right, so we've got our, we had our, what was it? Our anchor image. We've got a negative image and we've got our label, which is 0.0. .0. So that effectively means that we have the correct label in this particular case. Okay, we could do this again. So if we go and run our samples.next and if I type in plot.imshow samp zero. So that is an anchor image of me. We take a look at our sample again. So that looks like it's a negative sample. And again, we've got class zero. So if we go do it again, let's see if we can get a positive one. So myself, oh, we need to run this again. Another image of me. That looks like it's another negative sample. Let's wait for a positive one. Nope. Come on. Okay, this should be a positive sample. So you can see we've got an image of me. We've got another image of me as our positive. And if we go and take a look at our label, you can see it's one. So this is effectively how our neural network is going to work. We're going to pass through, and this is effectively one shot classification. So we can pass through a anchor image or an input image, and then you can pass through a separate image, which you want to validate against. And it's going to tell you whether or not that's the same person. So say, for example, you wanted to do verification on multiple images or recognition on multiple people, you would effectively just include more positive examples, right? So you'd include, say, for example, uh, you wanted to do it on your best friend. You'd include images of yourself as a positive example. So you'd have images of yourself as an anchor, yourself as a positive, and the label for that would be one. You then include also images of your best friend as an anchor and your best friend as a positive, and that label would be one. When it comes to actually verifying, what you would be doing is you'd be passing through your anchor. And if you want to verify against yourself, you'd pass through an image as yourself as the second input to your Siamese neural network. If you wanted to do it on your best friend, it would be an anchor image and then a verification image of your friend to determine whether or not that's the same person. Okay, but enough on that. We've actually gone and created our data set now. So the last thing that I want to do is just create a tr training and testing partition. So I'm just going to delete all of this. So let's create our training partition first. Oh, 
Okay, that is our training partition now done. So I went and wrote three additional lines of code there. So train underscore data equals data dot take. And this effectively is grabbing a certain percentage of our data set. So I've written data dot take, and then I've passed through uh, round and then specifically. So this is effectively just coming up with how many images, right? So I want to effectively take 70% as my training partition. So this does that calc. So we're grabbing the length of all of our data multiplying that by 0.7 and then we're rounding the image which just so happens to be 420 and then what we're doing is we're using the data.take method with that value to take the first 420 images so i could just as easily replace this with 420 here yep. and then we've gone and batched our data so we're now going to be passing through our data as batches of 16 images so i've written train underscore data equals train underscore data dot batch and then to that, we'll pass through the value 16. And then we're using the prefetch method. And this effectively um, starts pre-processing the next set of images so that we don't bottleneck our neural network when we go and train. So I've written train underscore data equals train underscore data dot prefetch and then eight. So that is our training partition now done. So we went and wrote, went and wrote three additional lines of code there. So data dot take data or train data dot batch train data dot prefetch. Cool, so that is now all ready. Uh, and again, if we go and take a look at our data set, we should, if I type in train data, we will now, so the shape is slightly different now. So we've now got a, so if we took a look at our data, values of data, that was what our data value looked like, or our data objects, so we had 100. So you've got, this is the shape here, this is the important bit. So we would have had 100 by 100 by none, 100 by 100 by none. And this is 100 pixels by 100 pixels by the number of channels in our image or our anchor. Same thing for our positive. And then we had this value here, which represents a single unique value. In our train data, we've got a slightly different shape. And this is because we're now batching it. So you can see that this none value is actually representing the number of batch or number of images that we've got in our batch. So it should effectively be 16, right? because we have gone and created batches of 16. So if I go and grab, let's do the iterator thing again, to so train data dot as NumPy iterator. We're gonna call this train samples. And then I can type in train dot sample or sample uh, equals train samples dot next. If we take a look at one sample and take a look at the length, it's three. Uh, and if we go and grab the first value, this should effectively be 16. Cool. So we've now actually got 16 images inside of each sample that we actually have. So rather than having just one image per value that we get back from our generator, we've actually got 16 images now. Cool, so that is our training partition now done. Let's just create a validation partition. I don't know if we're actually gonna use this, but we'll do it anyway. So uh, testing partition, sorry. Okay, so let's go on ahead and create our testing data. Okay, that is our testing partition now done. So what we went and did there is we skipped the first 420 observations so that we don't pick up our train sample. And then we went and took the last 30%. So again, I just wrote two lines of code there. So test underscore data, and I haven't batched this. We might batch it later if we need to. Perfectly fine for now. So test underscore data equals data dot skip. And then we've passed through again. So the exact same value that we had up here. So this should effectively be 420. 420 and then we've gone and written test data equals test data dot take and then we're passing through the last 30 percent so if i grab that that is going to grab the last 180 images cool all right so that is pretty much our data now ready so we've gone and created our training partition and our testing partition we should probably batch this as well let's do it while we're here test data dot batch and I don't know, we'll do batches of 16. And prefetch eight. 
Cool. All right. That is our, that should be everything now done. Okay. So we went and did a ton of stuff there. So we went and grabbed all of our image directories. So in, in this video, we went and did effectively four different parts. So we went and grabbed all of our image directories using TF data dot data set dot list files so remember we went and grabbed all of the specific strings for the images we then went and pre-processed them so we went and loaded them up we then went and resized them to be 100 pixels by 100 pixels and we scaled them as well we then went and created our label data sets we created our positive samples and our negative samples and i sort of explained how you might go about doing this if you wanted to verify multiple people and we concatenated those together we then went and pre-processed our twins. So rather than just working with the strings, we actually loaded up our images into our data set or set up our data pipeline to do that. And then we went and created our data pipeline. So we went and fleshed those out. So let me just clean this up so you can see it a little bit better. So we built up our data pipeline. So we mapped using the pre-processed twin function, which effectively leverages our pre-process method from up here. We then went and cached our images, shuffled them up. We then created a training partition and a testing partition. So this puts us in good stead to actually get to some deep learning in the next part of this tutorial. But on that note, that about does wrap this up. So thanks again for tuning in, guys. Hopefully you enjoyed this tutorial. If you did, be sure to give it a big thumbs up, hit subscribe and tick that bell. And I will see you in the next one. What's happening guys? Welcome to part four in this Siamese neural network series where we try to implement a Siamese neural network model from a paper all the way through to a final end application that we're eventually going to be building with Kivi. Now this tutorial is the one that I've been waiting for because we're starting to get into the deep learning component of this series. So let's go on ahead and take a look as to what we're going to be going through in this video. So we are going to be doing three key things here. So we're going to first up build an embedding layer, and this is effectively going to form almost like a feature mapping pipeline for our specific model. So we'll pass through an image. This is going to go through our embedding layer and effectively convert our raw image to a data representation that's going to represent what we're going to pass through to our Siamese neural network. So think about it as though we're effectively translating it to something that's going to allow a neural network to determine whether or not the person is verified or not. So it's almost like a data translator to a certain extent. Then what we're going to do is we're going to create an L1 distance layer. So I'll show this a little bit more once we actually take a look at the paper, but the way it's sort of going to work is we're going to have two streams of images. We'll have our anchor and either our positive or our negative. And these are streams are sort of going to be like rivers. And the way that we compare them is using this L1 distance layer. So we actually bring the rivers together and we use our L1 distance layer to compare whether or not the images or the embeddings are similar enough to be verified or not. So that's what we're going to do in step two. And then last but not least, we're going to compile them together to be able to build our Siamese neural network. And then in the next video in this series, what we're actually going to do is start training our Siamese neural network model. Okay, but without further ado, let's actually get to the tutorial and let's do it. So ready to do it? Let's get to it. Alrighty, so what we're gonna do in this tutorial is three key things. Let me bring the mic a little bit closer. So first up, what we're gonna do is we are going to be building our embedding layer. Then we are going to build our distance layer. So this is gonna be our L1 distance layer. And then last but not least, we're going to make our Siamese neural network model. Now, specifically what we're going to be doing. So remember, we are replicating this paper here. So Siamese neural networks, one shot image recognition. Now we are specifically, we've made a few tweaks and the numbers are going to be a little bit off, but that's fine. We're going to be building this neural network here. Now I said right at the start, think of this as having two streams of information. So we are going to be passing through two input images, and we are effectively going to be combining them down over here where it says L1 Siamese distance. So you're going to have two streams, so an anchor and a positive or a negative. These are going to be passed through to our embedding layer, and then they're effectively going to be compared once you get down to here. So we're going to compare them using our L1 Siamese distance layer. Okay, let's kick this off. So rather than talking anymore, let's actually start building it. So we are first up going to create a function that takes our input image. Now, 
the paper uses an image which has the shape 105 by 105 but we've gone and oh, why is that weird we've gone and converted it to be 100 pixels by 100 pixels so these numbers at the top here represent what our output shapes are going to be these values down the bottom specify what are the different layers within our neural network now because we've gone and converted our images to be 100 pixels by 100 pixels they're going to be a little bit off but that's perfectly fine it's still going to work so first up what we now need to do is create a function which builds our embedding layer so we're going to create a function and we're effectively going to be passing through all of our different layers so let's start setting up our function and then we're going to add to it incrementally. Okay, so that is the beginnings of our model. So I've gone and written two lines of code there. And again, we're going to build this incrementally. So I've written def make underscore embedding. So this is defining a new function called make embedding. And I've closed it off with a colon. And then what we're going to be doing is we're going to be returning our final embedding model. Now, you're probably thinking, Nick, where is this model value coming from or model class? Remember, right at the start in one of our earlier tutorials, we went and imported a number of different TensorFlow dependencies. So namely, we imported our model class and we also imported a bunch of different layer type components. So we imported the base layer class. We also imported conf2d, which is going to be used here. We imported dense, which is going to be used over here. We import, and I'm going to explain this in more detail, don't stress. We import a max pooling 2D, which is used over here. So we perform a convolution and add a ReLU activation over here. And then we go and perform a max pooling. So it's going to be convolution, max pooling, well, convolution, ReLU, max pooling, convolution, ReLU, max pooling, convolution, ReLU, max pooling, convolution, ReLU, fully connected. So this is where we go and perform our Siamese distance layer. And then we go and perform another fully connected with the sigmoid, then produce an output. Lots of fancy words, but really we're just passing it through a data pipeline. Okay, so what we are, neural network pipeline really. So what we're going to do is we're going to build this up step by step. So first up, what we want to do is we want to deal with our input. So let's go on ahead and create our input. And ours is going to be 100 by 100 pixels. So these numbers are going to be a couple of pixels off, but it should be pretty much the same. So to define our input, we can use our input layer. So right up here. So let's go on ahead and create our input layer. Cool. So that is our input layer now created. So I've gone and written INP equals input. And then I've specified the shape that we want our input to be. So in this particular case, it's going to be shape equals 100 pixels by 100 pixels by three channels. So if I copy this out of here. So that is our input now defined. So if I write out input. You can see that what we've got is we've got a Keras tensor with the shape of none because this represents the batch size. And then we've got 100 pixels by 100 pixels by three. We can actually pass through the name here as well. Um, name was input image. Copy that. Rather than having this weird name over here. So you can see that our input layer is going to be called input image. Cool. So that is the first part of our neural network done. Now, if you wanted to stick with the exact same shapes as the paper, all you need to do is change the input shape to be 105 by 105. So if I wanted to do that, type 105 by 105, and you can see that our input tensor is now going to be 105 pixels by 105 pixels. Cool. All right, what's next? So the next layer that we want to build in is our convolution plus a ReLU activation. And in this case, so remember our convolution is composed of two key things. Well, really three key things, but we're going to ignore the last. So our convolution takes the number of filters that we want to pass through. So in this case, it's going to be 64 filters. And our filter shape is going to be 10 pixels by 10 pixels. Now, normally you'll take a look at a parameter called stride. And this is how far our pixels or our filters actually move across the image. But in this case, we know stride is going to be one. So you don't, you can sort of ignore that. And we know that there is an activation that we need to apply here as well, which is ReLU. So let's go on ahead and implement our convolutional layer. And this is going to be using the conv2d layer. So let's go on ahead and do it. I'm going to call this layer C1, or we're going to name it, create it as a variable called C1. So uh, you'll see that in a sec. 
Okay, that is, uh, this should be capital D. That is our conv to the D layer now created. So I've gone and written C1 equals conv to D. And then we've gone and passed through that we want 64 filters, as our paper says. We've gone and specified that we want the shape to be 10 pixels by 10 pixels, 10 by 10. And we've gone and applied an activation, which is a ReLU, which again, in the paper says it's got a ReLU activation there. And then in order to pass through or start connecting our neural network together, we're grabbing our input and we're passing it through to our convolutional layer. So this is how the Keras functional API wants its input. So let's actually take a look at this. So if I grab this layer over here and we're going to paste it up there. So we've got our input that we defined already. We've got our convolutional layer now. So if we take a look at C1, you can see the shape is 96 pixels by 96 pixels by 64 channels, which is pretty close to this, right? But it's not perfect. So remember, this, is, this represents our input shape. These are the actual layers. So here we've got 64 channels and we've got 96 pixels by 96 pixels. We've actually got 96 by 96 by 6. Wait, that one's perfect. So that's perfectly fine. Okay, so we're going to ignore that. That's oh, wait, it's because we had 105, 105 up here. I thought there was something weird there. So if we change this to 100 by 100, there you go. So you can see it's going to be a little bit different. So rather than having the exact same shape, which is 96 by 96 by 64, we've got 91 by 91 by 64. If we wanted to have the exact same shape, we could change this to be 105 by 105. And you can see we're getting the exact same shape now that's fine we are going to stick with our 100 by 100 and then we are going to keep going so we if i change this back to 100 and 100 that is effectively what we've got here now now we've got one more layer that we need to implement which is our max pooling layer and then really everything from here on out is pretty much repeating itself at least for our embedding layer so let's go on ahead and implement our max pooling layer and then we should have our building blocks sort of ready so let's do it Okay, that is our max pooling layer implemented. So I've gone and written there. So I've created a new variable called M1 to represent our max pooling layer or max pooling layer one, because we're going to do it multiple times. And then I've set that equal to max pooling 2D. Pass through that we want 64 units of that. So you can see that it's 64 units. And then it, we want it to have a shape of two by two. So it's effectively going to take the max value out of a two by two area and return the max value. So it's effectively condensing down the amount of data that we've got. And we're specifying padding as being the same here. So this is something that I noted when I was building this up originally, you wanna have the padding as being the same in order to replicate a similar output shape. And then to that, we are going to be passing through our convolutional layer. So if again, we copy this out, And if we take a look at layer M1, you can see it has the shape 46 by 46 by 64. Here it's expecting 48 by 48 by 64. But if we go and change our input layer back to 105, you'll see that it mimics that exactly. So if I go and do that, you can see we have in fact 48 by 48 by 64, 48 by 48 by 64. Cool. So this means that we effectively have our core building blocks ready for this neural network, right? So we've gone and implemented our convolution plus ReLU plus our max pooling layer. So these two layers sort of form a core block. So you'll often refer to a specific neural network block referred to really frequently whenever you're building neural networks. So these two are a block which gets replicated a few different times. Now, obviously, they've got different shapes. So in this case, you can see, for or at least for our first block, we've got a convolution with 64 units or 64 filters, which has a shape of 10 by 10, and then a max pooling layer with 64 uh, units, which has a shape of 2 by 2. But if we scroll on, you can see the convolution shape changes a little bit, the max pooling shape changes a little bit, so on and so forth. So let's go on ahead and implement our next block, which is this two or these two over here. So we can do that reasonably easily. All we need to do is copy these. Should we copy them or write them from scratch? Let's write them from scratch. Okay, so this is our first block. So I'm just going to comment this up. So first block. And then second block. Let's do it.
Okay, that is our second block now implemented. So I've gone and written two lines of code there. So I've written C2 equals conv2d. And this one, we're going to pass 128 filters with a shape of seven by seven. So again, our second block is going to have a convolution, which is 128 filters with a seven by seven shape with a max pooling. Oh, we'll come back to our max pooling layer. All right, so convolution with 128 units with a seven by seven shape, which haven't, has a ReLU activation, ReLU activation. And then we're passing through our M, uh, the results of our max pooling layer. So remember our max pooling layer is called M1. So inside of parentheses, we are appending to the end of it and we're passing through our max pool or the output of our max pooling layer or output from our graph, which is going to be M1. We're storing that inside a variable called C2. So this layer over here is implementing this layer over here. So if I zoom out a little, it's implementing this over here. Coolio. Then we've gone and done our next layer as well, which is our max pooling layer. So you can see max pooling over here. And we've gone and written M2 equals max pooling 2D. And then I've gone and specified that we're going to have 64 units with a shape of two by two, which has a same padding. And then to that, we're going to be passing through our C2 convolution or the output from our C2 convolution, which you can see there. Now, if we go and copy this and as per usual, paste it up over here. So if we take a look at the output from our C2 block, we're going to get a shape of 42 by 42 by 128, which is pretty much mimicking this. Are we on 105? Yeah, so we're on 105 right now, which is why we're getting exactly the same shape. So 42 by 42 by 128. And then if we take a look at our max pooling layer, we're getting 21 by 21 by 128, which is 21, 21 by 128. So all is looking good at the moment. So remember, this is going to have exactly the same shapes because outside of here, we've got the shape 105 by 105. In our actual model, we're going to be using 100 pixels by 100 pixels. But this is sort of like a good sense check, really. Okay, so what's next? So we have... Oh, what have I done there? Oh, wrong. So we've gone and done these two layers. We've gone and done these two layers. We've got to do this layer, and then we've got to do that over there, I think. Yes, and a flatten. All right, let's go on ahead and build our third block. Okay, that is our third block now done. So we've gone and written two lines again, and again, pretty much exactly the same as what we've written up here. But now we're passing through our Mac, the results from our max pooling two layer, so this one over here, to our next convolution layer. And again, we've gone and written the exact same thing, or pretty much the exact same thing. So C3 equals conv 2D, specifying that we want 128 filters with a shape of four by four. 128 filters with a shape of four by four. So that over there, you can see that there. And we're specifying that we want an activation of ReLU, activation of ReLU. And we are passing through the output of our max pooling, the second max pooling layer, or the max pooling layer from our second block as the value that's going to be accepted into that convolutional layer. So M2 over here. Then we've gone and specified another max pooling layer, which is pretty much identical to what we wrote over here and what we wrote over here. Again, same exact number of units and a same exact shape. So M3 equals max pooling 2D, 64 comma, and then inside of parentheses, our shape, which is 2 comma 2. And then we've gone and specified our padding as equaling same and passing through the results of our convolution from over here as the value at the end. Cool. All right, so what's left? So we've really, we don't have too much left now. So we've gone and done, let's take a look now where we're up to. So we've gone and done our input, we've handled this, we've handled that. 
And with that, so this is our first block, this is our second block, this is our third block. So our next two lines are going to be a convolution plus a fully connected layer. So this is effectively going to be a convolution and we'll probably need a flatten plus a dense layer over here. So let's go on ahead and implement that. Okay, I think that is our embedding layer now done. So I went and wrote an additional three lines of code there. So we've gone and created a final convolutional layer, which is specified as C4 equals conv2d. And this has got units of 256 filters, which is over here, so 256. 256 with a shape of 4x4. Four four. So 256 with a shape of 4x4 four four with an activation of ReLU activation of ReLU. Cool. And then to that, we are passing through uh, the results of our third max pooling layer. So we're passing through M3. And then we are flattening our convolution. So you'll see this in a second, but effectively we're taking all of the outputs of our convolution layer, which has three dimensions and we're flattening it, flattening it into a single dimension. So let's actually take a look at this. So I'm going to copy this over here, paste it up. Uh, this should, oh, we didn't actually paste our M3 layer up there. So let's copy this. Cool. All right. So if we take a look at the output of M3, which was our max pooling layer from our third block, we didn't actually take a look at those shapes. Uh, let's actually do this properly. So C3 has the shape of 18 by 18 by 128, which is going to be over here. So 18 by 18 by 128. Output from our M3 layer is going to be 9 by 9 by 128. 9 by 9 by 128. And then we are taking this M3 output and we're passing it through to our convolution. So if I take C4, you can see it's 6 by 6 by 256. And again, keep in mind, this is based on the input shape of 105 by 105. So if we change this to 100 by 100, the output shape is going to be a little bit different. Perfectly fine. So uh, what were we doing? So C4 has shape 6 by 6 by 256, 6 by 6 by 256. Now, just so happens, if we multiply 6 by 6 by 256, we get uh, 9,216. So those units are going to be flattened in our feature vector. So if we take a look at the shape of our F1 shape, we have 9,216 units, which is the output, which is effectively this multiplied by this multiplied by this which you could see over there. Then what we're doing, and remember F1 is just flattening all of these elements together. So rather than having it in the shape of six by six by 256, you're just gonna have a single dimension. So then, and that is the output of the flatten layer. And then if we take a look, what we've gone and done is we've passed our flatten layer to our dense layer, which should give us 4,096 units back. So if I type in D1, you can see that we've got 4096, which is our 4096 feature vector, which eventually then gets passed to our Siamese distance layer. But we're going to come back to that in a second. And keep in mind, the last activation that we had was a sigmoid as specified over here. So fully connected plus sigmoid. And again, this is a little bit uh, densely written up, but you can sort of see how these all fit together. Okay. I think that's it. Now, what we need to do is we need to pass this through to our model class in order to sort of compile it. 
because at the moment we haven't actually gone and brought this all together as a model. So let's go on ahead and do that. So when I first wrote the function up here, so def make underscore embedding, then I also specified this last layer. So return and then model inputs equals outputs equals and then names equals. So now what we need to do is specify these. So let's do it. Okay, and that is the final component done. So I've gone and written, so I've basically just gone and filled this out. So I've written model equals inputs, and then inside of that, I've passed through a set of square brackets and passed through our input, which is right up here. And then I've gone and specified outputs. And again, what I've gone and passed through is our final layer, which is this dense layer over here. So what we're going to be outputting is this big feature vector with 4,096 outputs. So this is what I meant by the two streams or the two rivers. So we're effectively going to have two rivers of data flowing through or two rivers for our neural networks. And each of those rivers is going to be outputting a feature vector of 4,096 units. So this is almost like translating our input images of our faces into a embedding or a feature vector. So yeah, what have we gone and done there? So I've written model equals inputs equals uh, model. And then inside of parentheses, I've specified inputs equals, and then in square brackets, pass through input, comma, outputs equals D1, which is this. And then I've specified name equals embedding. So if I copy this, bring it over here, that is effectively compiling our model. So if I write uh, mod equals model, that's our final model. So if we, uh, can we type in summary? That gives us a final model. So this is the model based on 105 by 105, but that effectively gives you an idea of what our model is actually, or actually looks like. Now, the cool thing about this is that if I bring this shape over to this side, this is effectively one final model, which mimics what we had in our paper. So this paper is obviously a little bit small, but um, if we take a look, so our input image over here, so 105 and 105 uh, by one. So that's our input image. So this looks like it might be a single channel. We're going to be doing ours on color. Hence why it's going to be a three. But 105, 105 by three, that's our first layer. If we take a look at our next layer, 96 by 96 by 64, 96 by 96 by 64. Take a look at our next layer, 48 by 48 by 64, 48 by 48 by 64. And then if you go all the way to the end, I'm not going to do every single layer. We've got a dense layer, which has... 4096 we're in business guys so that is our embedding layer now done now what was i going to do so because our input shape is going to be slightly different if we type in what we're actually going to have is 100 by 100 up here so if i go and run all of these layers again you can see that our input changes the output shape a little bit but eventually we're going to get a 4096 output layer because that's how many units our dense layer has anyway so we're good to go there so that is our make embedding function now done so if we go and run this we're in business so if we wanted to go and create this model so let's go on ahead and do it so if i type out model equals make embedding that is our model now generated and if i type in model.summary that is our model. So we've got all of our different input layers. And again, you could name these and make it a little bit cleaner, but I haven't done that. I've sort of skipped it, but this effectively forms our embedding. So, which is, I'm going to bring this back over here, which is pretty much from here all the way through to here done apart from this L1 Siamese distance lab. We're going to do that now, but that's that done pretty cool, right? So that is, let me uh, zoom out or not zoom out. So that is step 4.1 now done. So we've gone and built our embedding layer. Now what we need to do is we need to bring them together. So remember I was talking about the two rivers, right? So the two rivers as part of our neural network graph, we're going to have our anchor and we are going to have either our negative or our positive image, which forms the basis of our one shot classification. So if we want to join these rivers together, we need some way to compare them, right? So what we're actually going to do is we're not going to be adding them together. So effectively our rivers combining, we're actually going to be subtracting them. So this is our L1 Siamese distance layer, and it's going to tell us how similar our images actually are. 
which is effectively what allows us to perform our facial recognition or facial verification. So let's go on ahead and define this distance layer. So it's going to take the embedding or the output of these embeddings, so our 4096 feature vectors, it's going to take the output or the those as the input and it should effectively output a value out of this. We're then going to pass that to a fully connected layer and then output a final result. So let's go on ahead and do this. Okay, so the first part of that, uh, that's our distance layer done. No, so that the first part of this is defining a new class. So we're going to be creating a new class for our custom layer. Now, this is actually really, really cool. So as part of producing this tutorial, I actually did a ton of learning. But this actually shows you how to create a custom neural network layer. So if ever you need to go and do some other custom stuff, this gives you a good sort of template as to how to go about doing it. And I've also defined this so that when we actually go and export our model, we'll be able to bring this layer as part of it as well. So let's go and finish this out. Okay, that is our L1 distance layer now produced. So I went and wrote four additional lines after I showed you the class layer. And these are the init section is pretty sort of self forward. The call section is a little bit more important. But let's actually take a look at it in its entirety. So I've written class L1 dist, and I've written this in caps. You don't need to, but it's good practice or sort of common practice with Python. So L1 dist, so these are all in caps. And then to that, we're passing through our layer class. Now this comes from all the way up here. It is the abstracted class or the base class for our Keras layers. And then what we're doing is we're performing a little bit of inheritance inside of our init function. So I've written DEF and then underscore, underscore, init, underscore, underscore. So it's the base init method inside of a Python class. And then I've gone and passed through self so we can operate on ourselves. And then I've gone and passed through asterisk, asterisk, KW args. So this allows you to work with the this specific layer as part of a bigger model. So when it comes to actually exporting and importing this, having this actually defined makes your life a lot easier. So when we actually go and export it, we're actually going to use the abstracted versions. So passing this through means that if we wanted to go and pass through specific keyword arguments, it's going to handle them innately. Cool. So def underscore underscore init underscore underscore and then inside a parentheses self comma asterisk asterisk kw args and then close parentheses and then colon and then we're just going and performing inheritance. So super and then parentheses dot underscore underscore. This should actually be underscore underscore init afterwards and then close parentheses. Cool. So that is that now covered. Now this is where the magic happens. So let me write a comment. Magic happens. Yeah. So the core function is actually or actually tells this layer what to do when some data is passed to it. So I've written DEF call pass through self and then remember our two rivers are going to combine so our anchor image and either our positive or our negative is going to be brought together and we're going to compare their similarity so i've written input underscore embedding so this is going to be the first river and then validation underscore embedding output of our second river so this is effectively going to be our anchor embedding this is going to be either our positive or our negative embedding and then we are returning tf.math.abs. So this is going to return an absolute value. And we are subtracting the validation embedding from our input embedding. So I've written input underscore embedding minus validation underscore embedding. So that is our L1 distance layout now done. So when we actually go and call this, it's effectively pretty much the same as how we might call another layer. So we can write L1 equals L1 dist. And uh, has no attribute L1 dist in it. Have we gone and written something wrong there? Let's check. Okay, that is not working. And the super object has no attribute underscore L1 dist underscore underscore in it. Oh, I don't know. Maybe I typed something wrong there. Oh, actually, I didn't. Uh, I didn't go and rerun that cell again. 
my bad all right so that's worked out so remember we had it like that so if i go and run that there you go that's the error that we we're getting there so if i just go and pass through those underscores again we're good so that is our l1 distance layout now produced so if we go and take a look at it there's not going to be nothing inside of it because we're not passing anything through yet but what we're effectively going to do is we're going to pass through effectively our anchor embedding and our validation embedding and we are then going to combine this into a dense layer which is over here so our fully connected layer and then to produce our final output so that's the last bit which we are going to do over here so that is our custom l1 distance layer and this is a defining characteristic in a siamese neural network sometimes what you will see is that they implement a slightly different function here so they'll actually have three rivers or three streams so that you'll have an anchor and a negative and an anchor plus a positive at the same time and you'll actually compare all three of those at the same run or is part of the same run in this case we're just doing it with two streams or two images as part of our graph so that is perfectly fine so let's take a look at what we did there so we first up so we're creating our siamese distance class uh, l1 distance class and we've gone and defined our init method, which is pretty self-standard. Uh, so this performs inheritance. And then we're doing our actual magic. So this is actually performing our similarity calculation, which is effectively just this. Really, we're just grabbing one stream, we're subtracting it from the other, and we're performing an absolute function over the top of it. Nothing crazy there. Cool. All right. That is our L1 distance layout now defined. So that's 4.2 done. The last thing that we need to do is combine all of this together. So right now we've got sort of like abstract uh, components. So we've got our embedding layer or our embedding model. We've got our L1 distance layer, but right now that our streams aren't sort of all running simultaneously. So we actually need to bring all of this together to produce our Siamese neural network. So that's what we need to do in step.4.3. So what we're going to do is we're going to create another function. So def make Siamese model. And we're going to bring it all together. So let's actually do our first bit and then we'll take a step back and take a look at what we've gone and done. Okay, so we are going to be defining another similar model to what we did up here but we're going to bring it all together now. So what I've gone and defined is first up, I've written DEF make underscore Siamese underscore model, open parentheses, close parentheses, and then colon. <clears throat> and then I've gone and written a comment to so handle our inputs. So first up, what we're doing is we're defining our two inputs because we're going to have two streams. We need two images that are coming through. So we're going to pass through our input image, which is going to be specified as input underscore image. And then I've set that equal to input name equals input underscore image so this is effectively creating one input here this is creating a secondary input so let me actually separate this so this is our going to be our anchor image input in our network this is going to be the validation image in the network right so input image equals input and then i've gone and passed through two keyword arguments of specified name equals input image and shape equals 100 by 100 by 3 because that's going to be the shape of our input images and then we've gone pa and passed through our validation image so i've written validation underscore image so that's our variable name and i've set that equal to input and then again two keyword arguments this time the name of our input layer is going to be called validation underscore image and i've set that equal to shape 100 by 100 by 3 cool what we now need to do is we need to take these inputs and actually pass them through to our embedding model because we're right now our raw inputs are just going to be we're at this stage we need to take these raw input images and pass them through to our embeddings and then what we're going to do is combine them with our siamese distance layer so let's go on ahead and do that Okay, let's pause there. I realized that what we should have done 
is rather than calling our embedding model just model, let's actually call this embedding because otherwise it's going to be a bit weird and it's going to get kind of confusing. So I'm going to run this again, run this, and then convert this to embedding. Cool. So our embedding layer or our embedding model is actually going to be called embedding now rather than it just being called model. Kind of dumb doing that. So we are then going to wrap this up. Let me actually go and finalize it and then I'll explain it. Okay, so that is our Siamese distance layer done and our, we are actually passing through our two streams. So I've gone and written Siamese underscore layer equals L1 dist, which is beginning to use our distance layer. And then I've just gone and named it again. I'm super pedantic. I like naming. So Siamese underscore layer dot underscore name equals distance. So this means that when we actually take a look at our model summary, you'll actually be able to see that name there. And then I've gone and created a new layer now. So I've written distances equals Siamese layer. And then to that, what we're actually doing is we're passing through this input image to our embedding model, which we had from up here. So again, I've wrapped this inside of a function, but it's kind of like redundant at the moment. Doesn't matter. We'll take a look at that later. Or oh, there's possible improvements there. So if somebody goes and cleans this up, do let me know. I'd love to see it. So we're taking our input image, which is effectively this and we're passing it through to our embedding. So if I go and run that and type in embedding and input image, that is effectively what we're doing. So we're taking this input image, which has a shape of 100 by 100 by three, and the output that we're gonna get out of that is our 4,096 units, which are out of this. Then what we actually go and do, so what we do is we actually do this on our validation image as well. All right? And if we go and type in, so let's do uh, input embed equals this. And val embed equals embedding and then validation image. Cool. So that is effectively our two sets of data now transformed into our feature vectors, which is a 4096 unit output so if we take a look our input embedding is going to we're passing through an image which is 100 by 100 by 3 and the output that we get is a unit or an output of 4096 values right and again same thing that we're going to get from our validation embedding 4096 units cool so then what we finally do is we go and take our siamese layer which is going to be called L1 dist. And because remember, this is going to take two inputs. So if we take a look at our call function, it takes our input embedding and our validation embedding, which is effectively what we've got there. So I'm just going to delete that because we don't need that and that. So what we're doing is we're taking our Siamese layer and passing through our input embedding, uh, input embedding and validation embedding. And that is going to output a 4,096 vector or a vector which has 4,096 units, which we're then going to finally pass through to a, another dense layer, which is going to pass through either a one or a zero. So we've still got to do that layer. But by passing through these two embeddings to our Siamese layer, we get a result of 4,096. So this represents the distances between our input embedding and our validation embedding. Now, all we need to do is pass this through to our final layer to tell us, hey, do these embeddings or are these embeddings similar enough to consider them the same person? So that's our final component that we need to do in here. So let's go on ahead and do that. And that's done guys. So that is our Siamese model now produced. So remember I said that the last thing that we needed to do was combine these distances into a final fully connected layer with a sigmoid, uh, with a sigmoid activation. That is what this line is doing. So I've written classifier equals dense. And then we were going and specifying that we want one unit, one unit. Specifying that we want an activation of sigmoid, sigmoid. And then to that, what we're doing is we're passing through these distances. 
which have a shape of 4096 units. So we're passing through 4096 units in and we're going to get one output value out, which will either be a one or a zero. So if we take a look, if I grab this line and bring it over here, uh, this should be distances. So let's define that distances equals Siamese layer. Boom, that is our classifier. You can see that we are going to have an output of shape one. Output of shape one by one. Now, the last line that I wrote is effectively combining all of this together. So I've written return model. Remember, this is our base level model class. And I've specified our inputs as being our input image and our validation image. So our input image and our validation image. And then our outputs are just going to be our classifier. So remember, we're going to have both of our streams running simultaneously. They're going to combine together on our L1 distance layer. And we're going to output our classification layer, which is this final little bit over here. Yeah, so what did we write there? So return model and then inputs equals and then inside of square brackets, we're passing through two inputs. So input underscore image comma validation image. So these are these two components over here. And then comma outputs equals classifier, which is outputting this classification layer there. And then we'll specify the name as Siamese network. So if we go and do this, let's actually just copy this over here. Siamese network equals that. Did I go and run that? Yep. Okay, cool. So if I run Siamese network, that's our Siamese network fully done now. So if I type in dot summary, take a look at that. So we've gone and passed through our input image. Pardon me. So our input image, a validation image, which then goes through our embedding layer. They then get combined through to our L1 distance layer, which you can see there. And we then combine that to a dense layer, which then outputs our single value. That is pretty cool, guys. So we've now gone and combined all of that together. So that is our Siamese neural network now done. Now, if we go and use our function, if I go and run this, so I'm going to call it Siamese network or model. And run make Siamese model. That is exactly the same thing. Let's write down the bottom dot summary. That is our Siamese neural network ready for one hot or well, one shot classification, not one hot, one shot. Cool. So we've now successfully gone and built this. Now in the next video, what we're going to start doing is start training this model. But for now, let's actually take a look at what we did. So I'm just going to minimize that and that so we can actually see. So in step one, what we went and did is we went and built our embedding layer. So we went and defined all of the different blocks that we saw over here. We then went and defined our distance layer, which represents our L1 distance. And remember, it's really just subtracting the two rivers from each other to determine similarity. And then last but not least, we combine them all together inside of our make underscore Siamese underscore model function, which then returns our Siamese model, which looks like this. And on that note, that does wrap it up. So thanks so much for tuning in guys. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, be sure to give it a big thumbs up, hit subscribe and tick that bell. See you in the next one. Thanks again for tuning in. Peace. What's happening guys? My name is Nicholas Renat and welcome to part five in the Siamese Neural Network series. In this series, what we're doing is we're going from a sophisticated research paper and building a full-blown Siamese Neural Network that allows us to perform facial recognition on our face. In this video, we're going to be focused on training our neural network. Let's take a deeper look as to what we'll be going through. Alrighty, so what we're going to be going through in this video is quite a fair bit. So we're actually going to be going through five key steps. And these steps are all to do with training a neural network. Now, step one is all going to be to do with defining our loss function. And this is going to be the loss function for our Siamese neural network. We're then going to define an optimizer. This is going to help us back propagate our updated weights throughout our neural network. We'll then build a custom training step. So this is a really useful skill when it comes to building sophisticated neural networks because it allows you to handle multiple different types of inputs. So something which is definitely required when it comes to building really advanced styles of neural networks. 
Once we've built our custom training step, step four is all going to be to do with defining our training loop. So we're going to blend our training step with our training loop to be able to get over to step five, which is training our model. On that note, ready to do it? Let's get to it. Alrighty guys, so in this video, as I was saying, there's going to be five specific steps that we need to go through. And this entire video is all to do with training our model. So we're actually getting into the nitty gritty now. So first up, what we need to do is set up our loss and our optimizer. Now remember the whole purpose of our neural network or what it's trying to do is minimize that loss because that means that it's performing better for this specific function that we're trying to minimize. Then we are also, and we're going to set up our optimizer as well there. So that's going to help us perform back propagation through our custom neural network. There's a whole helicopter flying past my desk right now. Kind of strange, but anyway. Um, okay, so then in 5.2, what we're going to do is we are going to establish some checkpoints. And this basically means that if we need to, or if something screws up in our neural network as we're training, we've got almost like a placeholder that we can go back to to reload our neural network from. We are then going to build our train step function. So this effectively defines what happens when we train on a single batch. Now, the, the basic process is that we use our model, we pass through some data, we get a prediction, we then calculate the loss. So whether or not it is determined with a specific image is being verified or not, and we compare that to the actual value. So we calculate the loss on that using binary cross entropy. Then what we do is we calculate the gradients for all of our weights across the network. We then use our optimizer to effectively back propagate throughout that network to minimize that loss. And this is where our learning rate comes in because we try to minimize that loss uh, effectively to get it as small as possible. So once we've gone and done that, we then define our training loop. So our training loop is effectively going through every single batch for every single epoch and applying our training step. So a training step gets applied per batch. Our training loop does it over our entire data set over the entire set of epochs. Then what we're going to do is train our model. So we'll actually train our model in this video. So you're going to be able to kick things off. Okay, without further ado, let's go on ahead and set up our loss function and optimizer. Okay, that is our loss function now defined. Again, it probably sounds more intimidating than it actually is, but we have gone and written a single line of code. So I've written binary underscore cross underscore loss equals tf dot losses dot binary cross entropy, and then open parentheses, close parentheses. Now, in certain circumstances, you might also pass through from logits equals true, but I've got to do a little bit more research as to whether or not we need to apply it here. But in this particular case, I've tested it without that parameter set. and looks to perform okay, but again, need to do a little bit more research. And if anyone has any ideas, hit me up in the comments below. But for now, that is our loss function. So we've written binary underscore cross underscore loss equals tf dot losses dot binary cross entropy and then open parentheses, close parentheses. The next thing that we need to do is define our optimizer. And for this particular model, we are going to be using the Atom optimizer. There's a bunch of them out there. There's um, Stochastic Gradient Descent. Uh, what is another one? That's the only one I can think of off the top of my head. But there's a whole bunch of others. You can search t uh, TensorFlow Optimizers or tensorflow.keras.optimizers and you can see a whole bunch of them. So let's go on ahead and define our Atom loss or Atom optimizer. Okay, that is our optimizer now defined. So I've gone and written opt equals tf dot keras dot optimizers dot atom. And then I've gone and passed through a learning rate of 1e negative 4, which effectively represents 0 0.001. Now, again, as I was saying, there's a ton of optimizers. So optimizers for keras. Let's go and take a look at what we've got over here. So again, you've got a bunch. Where are they? So these are some really popular ones over here. So you've got uh, Stochastic Gradient Descent, uh, RMS Prop, Atom, Ada Delta, Ada Grad, Ada Max, N Atom, and FTRL. I've never heard or used FTRL, but again, there's a whole bunch available here. If you want a video on optimizers, hit me up in the comments below. But for this particular case, we're going to stick with this bad boy over here, which is Atom. And we've gone and set our learning rate already. Cool. That is our loss and our optimizer now defined. So that is step 5.1 now done. Next thing that we're going to do is we are going to establish our checkpoint callbacks, which we'll use when we go and define our training loop down here. So let's go ahead and define these.
Okay, that is, let's make sure that works. Okay, that is our checkpoint components now set up. So what we've gone and done is we've written three lines there. So first up, we've gone and defined our checkpoint directory. We've then gone and defined our checkpoint prefix, which I'll explain in a sec. And then we've actually gone and defined our checkpoint class, which we're going to use to checkpoint our stuff out. So first things first. So the first thing is pretty self-explanatory. So we've defined a directory where we're going to save all our checkpoints. And this is going to be called training underscore checkpoint. So if we haven't defined that already, let's go and create that folder now. So if we go into the same folder that we're currently working in, you can see that we don't have a folder called training checkpoint. So let's just create one. I think it might actually create it for you, but uh, just to be on the safe side, so I'm going to create a folder. Let me zoom in on this so you can see what we're doing. I'm creating a folder. Let's drag this over here. Folder called training uh, checkpoints. Is that what we called it? Training checkpoints. Training underscore checkpoints. Yep, training checkpoints. All right, cool. So I've just gone and created a folder called training checkpoints inside of the same repository or same folder that I'm actually building our model in. Cool. So that is that now done. That's this first line here. So I've written checkpoint underscore dear equals dot forward slash training underscore checkpoint. So this basically represents us from the current folder. We're going to go into our training checkpoints folder and save our stuff down here. Then I've gone and created a checkpoint prefix. And in order to do that, I've written checkpoint underscore prefix equals os.path.join. And then we've defined it as being inside of our checkpoint directory. And we are going to prefix all of our checkpoints with CKPT. So this basically means that we're going to have all of our checkpoints in a consistent format. They'll start with CKPT and then normally they'll end with a set of unique numbers or effectively it goes in sequence. So 001, 002, so on and so forth. And then we've gone and defined what we actually want to save out. So I've written checkpoint equals tf.train.checkpoint. And then I've gone and saved our optimizer. So opt equals opt. And then our Siamese model. So Siamese underscore model equals Siamese underscore model. And so this effectively means we're going to be saving out these two components as our set of checkpoints. Now we could probably just save out our model. In this case, I've saved the optimizer as well. So the full thing is checkpoint equals tf.train.checkpoint and checkpoint is in caps and then open parentheses and then we'll pass two keyword parameters so opt equals opt so i'm saving this and then siamese underscore model equals siamese underscore model so we're saving this siamese model that we created in the last video okay that is step 5.2 now done now we're on to step 5.3 so this is the really good bit so this is one of the things which or one of the components of coding in neural networks that I thought was super fascinating. So defining the actual training step. So this is what is going to be used to train on one batch of data. So effectively what happens is one batch of data comes through to our training step. We go and make a prediction. We calculate our loss. We go and calculate our gradients. And then we apply back propagation through our neural network to ideally get the best possible model. Now, these steps are going to be pretty much the same whether or not you're building a Siamese neural network or a network for classification or a, um, what's another good example? So I'm building the super resolution model at the moment. So again, exact same train step style. Now, again, you can wrap this inside of a model and in some of my future tutorials, which are coming up, top secret, I actually do that um, because it just makes it a little bit cleaner. But in this case, I've gone and done it this way. So you'll see how to do it uh, using the tf.compile or tf.function decorator. All right, so let's go on ahead and start defining this. Okay, so those are the first, what is that? Three lines of code that we are defining for our train step function. So I've gone and, and again, this function is not actually gonna do anything as of yet. So first up, what we're doing is we are wrapping the function inside of this at tf function decorator. So the reason that we do this, I'm just going to show you, is it actually goes and compiles this specific training function. So you can see if I actually show you that there. So wrapping it inside of at tf.function compiles a function into a callable TensorFlow graph. A key component of how all TensorFlow works is using a concept of a graph. So it effectively compiles an entire neural network into a graph and allows us to actually go and train it in an efficient manner. So exactly what we're doing is by using this at tf.function decorator, we are compiling what is going to happen under this train step function. 
So again, some really nifty coding's gone behind this. So just know that when you're going and creating your train step function outside of a consolidated or compiled model, you need to have this decorator here. And again, I'm going to show how to do it the other method in some of the future tutorials that I've got coming up. All right, so what we've written is at tf.function. That's our decorator that I've described here. The next line is actually defining our function. So I've written def train underscore step. And then to that, I've gone and passed through or we're going to pass through a one batch of data. So this function or this, uh, what is this? This positional argument is actually going to be our batch of data. And then I've closed that with a colon and I've just written pass because we don't have what we're going to do yet. So again, this is sort of the beginnings of the function. Now let's go on ahead and write out what we're actually going to do. Okay, so there I've actually gone and written another three lines of code and I've started applying some comments. So first up, what I've written is with tf.gradienttape as tape. So this allows us to actually start capturing our gradients from our neural network model. So if I type in uh, tf.gradienttape, let me show you the docker for this. So this actually allows us to start performing or calculating or performing our differentiation. So this is what is going to allow us to actually get our gradients for our neural network. So what is actually happening here is it's recording every single thing that's happening inside of our neural network. And it's trying to look at this function that we're actually defining to go and perform differentiation. Differentiation is, uh, I guess, a component of calculus, and it's what allows us to go and perform our backprop across our neural network. So by defining with tf.gradienttape as tape, we're starting to capture all of the functions or all of the operations that are happening inside of our neural network so we can eventually go and calculate those gradients so you'll see this in action in a sec and then i've written a comment so we're grabbing our anchor and our positive slash negative image so remember when we defined our batch uh, so what do we call our data again i'm gonna have to scroll up because i cannot remember now we have called it train underscore data so if we go and take a look at our data again train uh, dot uh, let's call it test uh, batch equals train dot data dot take uh, one so if we take a look at test batch uh, we need to let's just convert it to a numpy iterator okay so that's one example of our batch now uh, let's store that uh, batch one I'm just going to store that so what I've done is, again, you would have seen me do this in the previous tutorials. I've written test underscore batch equals train underscore data dot as numpy iterator. And then in order to get one batch, we can use the dot next method. And I've stored that inside a variable called batch underscore one. And if we take a look at our batch, it is made up of, it should be made up of two components, two or three. Okay, three. Perfectly fine. So it's made up of three components. I thought the first two might be consolidated, but that's perfectly fine. The first component is going to be our anchor image. So if we take a look at uh, zero, this is the representation of our anchor images and it should be the same shape as how many images we've got in our batch, which in this case is 16. So we've got 16 anchor images in the first part of our batch. We then would have 16 images as part of our negative or positive image. Remember, which we're gonna use for validation. So if we take a look at the length there, 16 images, and then our last thing should be our actual labels. You can see we've got all of our labels there, and in this case, they're all zero. So that is perfectly fine. Okay, so in this particular case, we're looking good. So we've got some of our data. So what we're doing here is we're effectively extrapolating or extracting our batch. So we're setting X equal to batch one and then two also oh, we're slicing the first two values so remember if we take a look at our uh what is it len we've got two values there and if we take look can we run dot shape no nope, because it's not a numpy array uh an np dot array you can see we have two components so remember our anchor and either our positive or our negative images each batch is made up of 16 images and they are in the shape of 100 by 100 by three channels. So that is all of our data stored in our X. Think of these as our features. Then what we're doing is we're grabbing our Y value. We're setting that equal to batch two. And what have I done there? This should be batch underscore one. 
And if we take a look at Y, these are all of our labels in this particular case. I thought it would have been a little bit more shuffled. Kind of strange that we've got all zeros. That's fine. We'll leave it for now. Okay, so what we've got there is this is effectively what we're doing here. So we're grabbing our features and we are grabbing our labels. What we can then do now is actually pass this through to our Siamese neural network to actually start getting some predictions. So let's go on ahead and write out the rest of our train set function. Okay, so those are the next two components of our train step. So I've gone and completed our forward pass and we've gone and calculated our loss. So what I've gone and written there is y hat equals Siamese model. So this is actually making a prediction, right? So we're actually passing some data to our Siamese model. So y hat equals Siamese underscore model, which is coming from here. And really we should be passing this through to our train step function, but that's fine, whatever. We'll skip that for now. Um, so y hat equals Siamese underscore model. And then to that, we're passing through our X, which we're getting from here. So our features and we're setting training equals true. Super important that you set training equals to true because certain layers are only going to activate when this is actually set to true. So if you're using batch norm or dropout, you need to set training equals true, training equals to true in order to activate those layers. So we've set it equal to true there. Um, when you go and make actual predictions in the real world, you don't need to set training equal to true. Then we've calculated our loss. So our loss is equal to binary cross loss, which is what we defined over here. And we are passing, so let's actually take a look at the doco for that. Um, so if I type in uh, tf.losses.binary. So what we pass through to this is, uh, so if we take a look here, so you can see there that we first, uh, let me zoom in on that. So to our binary cross entropy loss, which you can see there, so tf.keras.losses.binary cross entropy, we first pass through our y true value and then our y predicted value in order to calculate our loss, which is effectively what we're doing over here. So we're passing through our y true value, which is our label set from over there. And we are then passing through our y hat value. And because these are floats, these are interpreted as a probability. So I think that's why we can get away with not setting from logic equals to true here. But again, if anybody knows any better, hit me up in the comments below. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Okay, so what have we gone and done? So we've gone and done our forward pass. So this makes our prediction. We then go and calculate our loss. And we've written loss equals binary underscore cross underscore loss. And then we pass through y true. So this y here is y true, right? Remember again, where's our docker? We pass through y true, then y pred. In our particular case, we're passing through y true and then y pred. So y hat is another name for y predicted or the predicted outcome in this particular case. Perfectly fine calling it y hat and call it y true if you want. Okay, we are almost there for our training step function. And this is super cool, guys. So this is the building or the true building blocks of actually building a neural network. You go and calculate or produce a forward pass. You calculate your loss. All that's left to do now is actually perform or calculate our gradients and then go and perform our back prop. So let's go ahead and do it. Okay, that is our train step function now done. Now, in this particular case, I don't think we're actually outputting our loss, but that's particular, perfectly fine. If we wanted to go and output some information, we could, definitely could. You could also wrap it up inside of a model. And best practice actually probably dictates that you probably should do that. I've sort of skipped through it, but that's perfectly fine. So the last two lines of code that we've gone and written is grad equals tape dot gradient and this is actually starting to use our tape that recorded all of our operations through our neural network to go and calculate our gradient so we're in grad equals tape dot gradient and then we're grabbing our loss and we are going and calculating all of the gradients for all of the different trainable variables inside of our neural network and specifically the siamese model which is our neural network so i've written grad equals tape dot gradient first positional argument is our loss which is this over here and then we're basically saying calculate all of our gradients with respect to this loss for all of our trainable variables so the second positional argument is siamese underscore model dot trainable underscore variables 
then in order to calculate our updated weights, I've written calculate, or I've actually written a comment, so called calculate updated weights and apply to Siamese model. Then in order to do that, I've written opt equals or opt dot apply gradients. And then what we're doing is we're zipping all of those gradients and we're actually going and applying them through all of the different trainable variables. So then we've written zip grad, which is this over here. And then we've passed through Siamese dot model dot trainable underscore variables. So in a nutshell, what these two lines are doing are first up calculating all the gradients for our different weights within our specific model with respect to our loss. Then our optimizer is actually applying our learning rate and slightly reducing the loss by changing our weights to be a little bit closer to the global optima. So effectively what we're doing is imagine we've got this big curve. If we know that uh, right now our gradient is down here, if we apply a learning rate, to that gradient, ideally what should happen is by applying them in a certain direction, we're effectively going to reduce our loss across the board as we go and train our neural network. So again, if you want a deeper understanding of this, uh, do hit me up. I'm more than happy to write a little bit more or give you a little bit more information. Okay, but for now, what we've actually got is we've actually got our train step function. What we might also do is we might also just write um, print loss here so we can see if that actually runs. Okay, not can't remember if we need to do something a little bit more sophisticated here to get our loss, but that's perfectly fine. We might also need to return it down here. Return loss. We'll see if that works. Okay, so that is our train step function done. So we went and wrote a ton of stuff in there, but in a nutshell, what we do is we record all of our operations here. We get all of our data, we go and perform a forward pass, we calculate our loss, we then go and calculate all of our gradients, and we update our weights across our neural network. And we are going to try to return our loss to see if we get that out. So return. The one disadvantage to actually training it using this method is that you have to go and define all of your progress bars and all of your loss metrics being output. When you actually wrap this up inside of a model, it does look a little bit cleaner. So that's something that I went and learned after I actually built up this tutorial, but that's perfectly fine. I'm going to show you how to do that later. Okay, so in this particular case though, we've got our train step function now defined. Now what we need to do is actually go on ahead and build our training loop. So let's go on ahead and kick that off. Okay, so our training loop is going to be called train. I know, super unique, but in this particular case, I've just written DF train, and then to that, we're going to pass through our data and the number of epochs that we want to train for. And what we're then going to do is we're effectively going to loop through the epochs. We're going to loop through uh, each batch, and then we're going to run our train step here. So run train step yeah okay let's go and fill this out now so let's do it Okay, let me just paste that there for now. We'll come back to that. Okay, so that's the first loop now done. So we've gone and we're effectively looping through each one of our epochs. So I've written four epoch in range one because we're going to start at one and then we're going to increment epochs by one. Otherwise, it's going to start from zero. So we've written four epochs in range one and then comma epochs in caps plus one colon. And then we're effectively just printing out what epoch we're up to. So it'll print epoch and then our current epoch, and then all of the epochs. So it'll be like one out of 50 or one out of 100 or two out of 100. And this will sort of give us a bit of a status update. Then we're defining our progress bar. And again, this is where I sort of said that if you wrap this up inside of a model class, you don't have to do this explicitly. The native API just does it for you. But again, this gives you a little bit more control. So I've written progbar equals tf.keras.utils.progbar and this is in capitals and then we're going and passing through the length of our training data because effectively we're going to increment every time we go through a specific batch so that is our first loop now done then what we need to do is actually loop through each batch so i've written four idx comma batch in enumerate train data so this is going to give us a counter and the actual batch itself Let's go on ahead and finish this up.
Okay, that is our train step now applied. So what we've gone and then applied is our train step function, which is this over here. And we're applying that to a single batch. And then we're updating a progress bar. So I've written prog bar dot update, and then we're passing through a specific index, which we had from up here. So effectively, every time we go through a batch, we're going to update our progress bar. And that gives you that cool little Keras progress bar that sort of goes across the screen. The last thing that we need to do, and again, this is optional, is to go and save our checkpoints. So let's go on ahead and do that. Okay, that is our checkpoint function now applied. So I've gone and written if epoch modulo 10 equals zero. So effectively, we're going to save it every 10 epochs. Again, you could change this if you wanted to. Then what we're going to go on ahead and do if this is satisfied is we're going to run checkpoint.save and we're going to set our file prefix equal to our checkpoint for prefix, which is what we defined over here. So it's going to start with CKPT. And I think that is our train function now done. So we've gone and looped through each one of our epochs and defined our progress bar. We're then looping through each batch and then applying our training step. And then we're going to save each checkpoint every 10 epochs, assuming we have that many epochs. All right, let's go on ahead and test this out now. So we're now, that's 5.4 now done. So we can actually go to step 5.5 and actually try to train our model. So we're going to define our epochs. Let's set it to, uh, we should set it to more than 10. So we actually see whether or not we're saving. So I'm going to set it equal to, let's say that's 50, for example. And then what we can go on ahead and do is in order to start training, we can run train, pass through our training data, and then pass through our epochs. Actually, I just realized we've got an error there. So we've defined data as data over here, but we've gone and defined this as training data. This should actually be data over there and data over there. Because what we're going to go on ahead and do is pass through train data to this function rather than the full data. So if I pass through data over here, then that's effectively going to be replicated over here and over here. So that's fine. So all I change there, so let me undo that, is we had train underscore data as the data that we're going to be looping through. But what we actually need to do is set that equal to data because we'll pass through training data as the parameter. Okay, that's fine. That is all good. So what we now need to do is actually go and train our model. So let's test this out. So I just went and applied these print loss functions and return loss functions over here. So we'll see if that works and then go from there. All right. So I'm going to write train and then we're going to pass through train data and then pass through our epochs and fingers crossed this will work. Uh, we're not actually returning our loss. We need early uh, eager execution in order to print that out. Okay, that's fine. You can see that we are actually training in this particular case. So the reason that you're getting these values rather than the actual loss value is because you need something called eager execution set in order to get that printed out, but that's perfectly fine. Don't worry about it. We'll be able to see our model trained relatively quickly because you can see it's training pretty fast. But in a nutshell, that is our model now training. So again, if you wanted a little bit more information as to how to print out the loss, hit me up in the comments below. I'm more than happy to help you out. I had a feeling this wasn't going to work because I remember I did it slightly bit differently in some of my other models, but that's perfectly fine. It's all good. Our model's training. How good is that? No errors. Looks like everything's happening pretty successfully. So on that note, that about does wrap it up. So let's let this finish and we should be good to go in the next tutorial. So on that note, that about does wrap it up. So what we've gone and done is a ton of stuff in this tutorial. It's still training at the moment, but we have gone and defined our loss and our optimizer. We've gone and established our training checkpoints. We went and built our train step function, which is a custom train step function. And again, I think the lesson learned that I took away from this series is that it's probably more efficient to actually wrap this up in the model class because you get all of the progress bar stuff able to print out your loss function a whole heap easier you don't need to work with eager execution that's perfectly fine it's still going to work we then went and built a training loop and we're also kicked off the training of our model so ideally in the next video we'll actually get to evaluate it save it and then perform a real-time test but on that note that about does wrap it up thanks so much for tuning in guys hopefully you enjoyed this video if you did be sure to give it a big thumbs up hit subscribe and tick that bell and if you've got any questions comments or queries by all means do hit me up in the comments section below 
I'll be happy to help you out. Thanks again for tuning in. Peace. What's happening guys? Welcome to part six in the series on facial recognition. In this series, what we're doing is we're going from a state-of-the-art research paper and building up a full-blown implementation with the final end product being an app which integrates that model and allows you to actually use it in real time. In this part of the series, we're going to be focused on evaluating and testing out our model, which we just finished training. Let's take a deep look as to what we're going through. So in this part of the series, what we're going to be focused on is testing out the model. So in the previous video or part of this series, what we did is we finished training our model using our TensorFlow implementation. Now we're going to test it out. So we'll actually be able to see how well it actually performs. So we'll test it out. What we'll then do is we'll evaluate our performance. So we're going to be using precision and recall to evaluate how well our model is actually performing. And then last but not least, we're going to save our model down so we can begin the processes of actually building this up for deployment. Ready to do it? Get to it. Alrighty, guys. So welcome to part six in the series on facial recognition using SIME's neural network. So in this part, what we're going to focus on is step six and step seven. So I'm just going to add in a couple of cells so we can see what the hell we're working on here. All right. So step six, we're going to focus on evaluating the model. And in order to do that, we're going to be using two key metrics. These are precision and recall. So ideally, these aim to measure that. Uh, so ideally, these aim to measure how accurate our model is and how well it's actually performing classification. Now, if you wanted a deeper explanation of these specific metrics, I'll link to some stuff below so you can see exactly that. So what we're going to do here is we're actually going to run those metrics and calculate them for our Siamese neural network on specific batches. And then we're actually going to make some predictions because up until now, we've really gone and done a whole bunch of training and a whole bunch of pre-processing to actually get to this step but we haven't actually gone and done our evaluation. So that's exactly what we're going to do here. And we're also going to save our model so we can actually go and use it when it comes to actually deploying some stuff out. So first things first, what we need to do is import some metrics in order to perform our evaluation. Now, remember, I said we're going to be using precision and recall. So let's go on ahead and import these. Okay, so I've gone and written one line of code there. So I've written from tensorflow.keras.metrics import precision, comma, recall. So these are two metrics that you're able to get from the Keras library. So if I type in uh, Keras metrics, there's a uh, metrica, whatever. <laughs> so there's a whole, let's actually bring up the TensorFlow version. TensorFlow. Oh, my typing is a shocker today. All right, so there's a whole bunch of different metrics that you can use here. So what we've chosen to use is precision, which you can see that there. So right over here and recall. So in order to use these, we are effectively going to do what you can see down here. So we're going to set up the metric. We're then going to update its state and then we're going to calculate the result. So we can do that pretty easily using our model. Now we can do something similar for recall. It's pretty much the same, really. We're just calculating a different metric but it is good practice to look at a number of different metrics whenever you're going and building out models uh, because this gives you a better estimation of what it's performing well versus what it's performing not so well at. Okay, so we've got our two different metrics that we're going to calculate and whenever you're using precision and recall, a higher number is a better number. So ideally, that's what you want to look for whenever you're evaluating any metrics or KPIs, whether or not a higher number is better or whether or not a lower number is better, whether or not a negative number is better, whether or not a, posit a positive number is better. Okay. So we've got our metrics. What we now need to do is actually go on ahead and make some predictions. Now, before we do that, we want to grab a batch of data. So let's grab a batch of data and we're going to do it from our, uh, where is it? Keep scrolling. Nope, maybe it's a little bit further down here. We're going to do it from our test data, which I believe we created. Yeah, so we created our testing partition. So we're going to be using this data to actually test out our model. So let's go on ahead and grab a part of our partition and then we'll actually be able to compute these metrics. Okay, so that is our test data now collected. So what I've gone and done is I've again written one line of code. And what I've written is, first up, let's focus on this. So what I've written there is test underscore data dot as numpy iterator, and then I've passed through a set of parentheses dot next. So this is going to convert our TensorFlow data set into a numpy equivalent. So if I run test underscore data dot as numpy iterator, 
what you're actually going to get back is this NumPy iterator. So basically it's looping through and dynamically producing one batch of data back. Now, if I type in dot next, it's going to get the next batch of data. So you can see how TensorFlow actually uses this and continuously goes to the next batch, next batch, next batch, next batch, so on. Now, what we can do is we can use this to grab a batch of data. So what we're actually going to get back is three things. So if I store this in a variable, so I'm just going to call it a uh, test var super descriptive variable name. So if I run test var and take a look at its shape, uh, let's put in a numpy array first. Uh, what have we done there? Test NP array could not broadcast shape into what have we done? Oh, because it's going to be three different. Uh, let's just have a look at the length. So what we've actually got is we've got three different variables inside of this test var variable here. Now, the first variable is going to be our test input. So think of this as eventually what's going to be coming directly through our webcam. So if I grab the first value, this should be 16 different components or 16 different samples. So you can see we've got 16 test inputs. Now, if we take a look at the second value, that's going to be our validation data. So remember, we're going to either be passing through a positive or a negative uh, sample to, to our Siamese neural network in real time. So ideally, the second one is going to be whether or not it's a negative example or of a positive example. So again, we've got 16 of those. And for our third value, and let's take a look at the shape of that or what it actually looks like. So again, we've got images here. And then the last thing that we're going to have is the labels. So this is whether or not the values match or not. So basically it's the classification label. Now we can delete this. So what we've actually gone and done as part of writing this line is we've actually gone and unpacked it in real time. So we're grabbing the test input, the test val and y true, which is effectively our labels. So the full line of code is test underscore input comma test underscore val comma y underscore true equals test underscore data dot as part numpy iterator and then parentheses dot next and then parentheses again and that's what we're getting back so we've actually got these values pre-unpacked so if i take a look at test input those are going to be our input images test val is going to be our validation data and y true is going to be our labels boom cool so now what we need to do in order to calculate our precision and recall is we're going to pass through our test input and well, let's unscrew that we're going to pass through our test input and our validation data we're going to make predictions and ideally what we'll get back from our model is whether or not it is a verified person or a non-verified person so let's go on ahead and make some predictions Okay, and there we go. So we've now got our predictions back. So we went and wrote, what is that? Two lines of code there. And one of them is just rendering the results. But what we've effectively gone and done is we've gone and used this Siamese model, which we went and ran our training loop on already, right up here in steps, really in step five. So we trained it all up. And now because we've gone and trained our model up, we can go and use the predict function to actually make a prediction. So what I've written is predictions. This could just as easily, actually, let's, be consistent so predict should be equal y hat y underscore hat all right so we've written y underscore hat equals siamese underscore model dot predict and then inside of parentheses we've passed through a set of square brackets and remember when we use our siamese neural network we're going to pass through our two streams we're going to pass through our input data and our validation data so either our positive or our negative samples in this case, what we're doing is we're passing through the values that we got back from our NumPy iterator. So I've written y hat equals Siamese underscore model dot predict. And then inside of square brackets to that function, we're going to be passing through test underscore input and test underscore val. Now remember, order is important here as well. So the input first and then the validation data. And then the next line is just rendering that result. So I've written y hat. And these are our predictions back. So you can see that we've got some positive examples. So this is going to be a very small number. So 1.0779765 to the power of a negative five, which means it's going to be a value closer to zero, which means it is a negative sample. This is one. So you can see 1.000 to the power of zero, which means it's going to be a positive example or effectively one. Um, let's see if we've got any other positive. So there's a positive uh, and there's a positive. All right, so what we can actually do now, and these look like they're pretty large numbers as well, so they're 0.99 effectively. 
what we can do is we can convert these into a classification output so either a zero or one so a binary outcome so in order to do that we basically just need to set some conditions so over a certain threshold we're going to say that that is a one or a positive example so let's go on ahead and do that so it's a little bit more interpretable um so what are we doing uh post-processing the results okay let's do it okay so what i'm doing there is a list comprehension so what we're effectively doing is we're going to be looping through each one of the values inside of our y hat example and we're going to be converting it so the threshold that i've set is 0 0.5 so let me break this down so i've written four prediction in y hat if y hat is greater than 0 0.5 then return one else return zero so this is just a list comprehension. It's a little bit of a, it's very Pythonic in the way that you interpret data, but basically it's just doing a loop and we've got an if statement here. So the full line is inside of square brackets, I've written one, if y hat is greater than 0 0.5, else zero for prediction in y hat. Now, the other way that you could write this is for prediction in y hat. So you'd uh, have a results array. So res equals that array for prediction in y hat if y underscore hat is oh wait no if for predict if prediction is greater than 0 0.5 then uh what are we doing so uh we are going to go res dot append one else res dot append zero so we're effectively converting this series of confidence metrics into a binary outcome so zero one we don't want to run it like this because it's not super Pythonic. So we're going to do it this way. And I've gone and done something wrong. So for all prediction in Y hat, if Y hat is great, uh, this should be prediction. There we go. Okay. So what we've actually got there is we've got the results of our Y hat output over here. So you can see that rather than having these values, which are a range or a continuous value, we've actually got a binary outcome now. So zero, one, zero, zero, one. Now, what we can do is we can actually compare that to our labels that we extracted from up here. So if we go and take a look at that, so what, what was it called? Y true. Let's take a look. So we've got zero, zero, one, one, zero, 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 zero. This is actually looking very good. So one, 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 one. So that's what, six ones? One, 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 one. I think we might have a pretty good model there. Yeah, that's looking pretty good. So you can see that that actually matches that exactly. Now, rather than doing this manually and visually inspecting it, we can actually go and use our metrics from up here to actually test this out. So let's actually do that. Okay. So that is our metric now calculated. So a couple of errors there. I was just typing stuff in or passing through the wrong, passing through the inputs in the wrong format. So I had this inside of square brackets, but that's perfectly fine. It's resolved now. So let's actually break this down. So first up, what we're doing is we're creating, so we've actually written three lines of code there. So we're creating a metric object. And this is a metric object for recall. So I've written M equals recall and then inside a parentheses or set of parentheses at the end. Then what we're doing is we're updating the state. So this is effectively like calculating the recall value. So I've written M dot update state, and we're actually passing through two positional arguments to this function. So we're passing through Y true comma Y hat. And this is what actually passes that through to our recall object. So then what we can do is access the result using M dot result, and then we're converting it to a NumPy array. So, or NumPy value. So return result or recall result. Cool. So three lines of code and you can see there that our recall is 100%. So in this particular case, we've got a really good output or a really good model that's accurately able to identify us versus other people. So again, pretty, pretty good in this case. Now, if we wanted to, we could actually calculate precision as well. Just a key note on that. So recall, a higher value is going to be better and precision, a higher value is also going to be better. So again, in this particular case, we've got a 100% for recall. And if we do precision as well, again, 100%. So in this particular case, this is pretty good. But just keep in mind, we've only done this on a single batch. So best practice would be to calculate it over the entire test sample rather than just doing it on one. 
Okay, now if we wanted to, we could actually grab another batch. So all we need to do is run this line here again. So if I run that, run that. And then again, so just to prove, you'll actually see that these values actually change, right? So we're going to get different predictions. Boom. And if we take a look at our Y true values, again, different values. If we go and now calculate precision, again, 100%, we can switch it back to recall. So again, we've got a pretty good performing model, given the fact that we only trained for what, like 50 epochs and we pass through, what was it, like 300 lines of data? when or 300 examples or samples uh what how much data do we actually pass through it was somewhere up here uh it should have been take 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 this is an anchor and a positive i'm trying to work out how much data we brought yes all right so we took 300 samples right so we 300 so on just 300 images of data, we've been accurately able to identify myself versus other people. So again, pretty good in terms of facial verification. Now, so that is done. Now, what we can also do is we can also visualize these results. So I'm telling you that they match, but you can't actually see anything at the moment. So let's actually go on ahead and plot some stuff out. Let's also break this out into some sections. So um, this first section here, we're going to call it... Uh, 6.1 so import metrics and then we are going to get a batch of data or we'll actually call it make predictions and then down here we're calculating metrics and we can also just copy this down so we've got recall separately and we can have precision separately cool and then the last thing that we want to do is actually visualize our results so let's actually create another section for that what are we up to? 6.4 uh, viz results. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we are actually going to compare the results for different samples in our batch. So let's go ahead and do this. Okay, and that is our data now visualized. So can we zoom out a little bit? This is a bit big on the screen. All right, so you can see there that what we've actually got is the positive example. So this is going to be our input. This is going to be our validation example. So by passing through our first instance, let's actually take a look at our outcome. So you can see that the result for that particular prediction is one, which means that this is effectively saying that the people in both of these images actually match, which is valid, right? That is me. That is also me. Hence, we've got a positive example. Now I'll explain this code in a second, but let's actually update this um, and see another example. So let's see a negative example. So the second prediction is going to be a zero. So let, ideally what you should see is this first photo is still me, but the second photo is going to be someone else or a different person. So one. And there you go. So we've got different people now. So that's me, but that's definitely not me. And the output that we've actually got from our model is the fact that these two people do not match. So the third sample should be a matching example. So let's go to third, which is going to be index two. So again, you can see me and me with my eyes closed. We go to our fourth example. That is going to be a non-matching example. So you can see it's got a zero value over here inside of Y true. So if we run this non-matching so that is me but that is definitely not me so again you can see that it is pretty accurately working now let's take a look at the code that we wrote there so we wrote uh six different lines of code so the first line of code is setting the size of our image or the size of our plot set plot size and for this we're using matplotlib so remember we import a matplotlib right at the top here so we wrote from matplotlib import pyplot as plt we scroll on back down uh where are we so I've written plot.figure and then to that I'll pass through one keyword argument which is fig size equals and then a tuple which has the values 18.8 this controls how big the plot is so if I wanted a smaller plot I could change this so say I said it's 10,8 it's going to make our plot a little bit smaller so we can see it a little bit more accurately so if I set it to 18 it's going to be huge actually 10 is probably a better example because you can see that a bit more a little bit clearer Okay, so that is the first line, which is setting our plot size. 
then because we're actually plotting two images side by side, what we're actually doing is we're using a subplot. So set first subplot. So what I've written there is plot dot subplot equals one comma two comma one. So what we're saying is we're going to have, I can't actually remember how this works. So plot dot subplot. Uh, do, do, do. All right, so we're specifying the number of rows, the number of columns, and the index. So the number of rows is going to be one row. So you can see that we've only got one row there, and we've got two columns. So one column, and then two columns, and then inside of those, we're specifying the index. So we've got one image, and then or the first image, and then the second image. So I think we could actually tweak this a bit and actually just have two columns. Let's try that. So if I set that equal to one, did that. Nope, got errors. Never mind. All right, so we've actually got, uh, we've gone and screwed that up. So one, this should be, there we go, cool. So we're going and setting our first subplot. So I've written plot.subplot, and then we're passing through the number of rows, the number of columns, and the index. So that's going to be referencing this image here. So if I change this value in our next line, which actually determines what to actually plot, it would change this value. So if I go and change this to two, you can see that I've gone, it's me just smiling out of, uh, out of sheer happiness for doing deep learning. So we've gone and changed that second index, which is changing this image. So that is controlling, all of this is controlling this image here. This second section is controlling our second subplot. Right, now the second line that we've actually gone and written to render this is plot.imshow, and then we're passing through what we actually want to render. So I've passed through test underscore input, and then we've passed through that we want index number two, which is what we originally got from over here. So this is the image that we got from our test data batch. So if we wanted to change our image, we could do that. And remember these two indexes should be the same to be to ideally show that you're looking at the same sample because they're going to be in ordered flow, right? So the second line is plot.imshow test underscore input. And then we're grabbing the third or fourth index, which is going to be index key three. And then we're effectively doing the same down here for our second plot. So I've written plot.subplot. In this time, I'm specifying I'm passing through the first row in the second column or in within the two columns. And then we're specifying what index number two is, which is going to be this image over here. So one row, two columns, and then this is going to be the value in the second column. Cool. Then the next line is identical to over this over here, but rather than passing through test underscore input, we're passing through test underscore val, which is because we're grabbing our validation data, which is coming from over here. And then I've written plot.show to actually show it nice and clearly. So if I delete this, so you can see that we get this little line over here, which is just a function from matplotlib. If I add plot.show, it renders cleanly. And there you go. Those are our images rendered. So again, if we wanted to go and run this on a different batch, what we can go on ahead and do is run this line over here because this is going to go and grab the next batch remember so if i go and do this again or run through the pipeline again bang 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 calculate our precision metrics which again still looks good but now our images are changing so what are we looking at we're looking at the fourth index which is going to be one two three four which is a non-matching sample which you can see there so these two people don't match if we go and grab the first value these people match, they're both me. Pretty good, right? So that ideally shows that our Siamese neural network is working in this particular case. Now, the last thing that we're going to do, and this is really step, what is it? Step six, evaluate our model, now done. So we've gone and done a ton of stuff there. So we imported our metrics, we made our predictions, and remember to make our predictions, all you need to do is use Siamese model.predict, that's gonna allow you to predict or make predictions. And then we also calculated some metrics and did some visualization. Now, the last thing that we need to do, as is always good practice when building deep learning models, is not to add just more rows, is to actually go on ahead and save our model. So this is what we're going to do now. Now, there's a couple of nuances here because we have gone and created a custom layer, which is our L1 distance layer from, I believe this was step four, step four, section four, whatever. Yeah, section four. So we went and created this uh, L1 distance layer, which we need to do a little bit of tweaking to our export to make sure that we save. So let's go on ahead and do this. All righty, so let's go on ahead and save it. Okay, so the first thing that we're going on ahead and doing is saving our model weights. So we're in Siamese underscore model dot save. 
and then to that we're specifying what we want our model weights to be called so in this case i've written siamese model dot h5 which if we go to where we're currently working from so youtube face id you can see it's now saved and so the date is the 14th of the 10th 2021 so you can see that that is our model now saved there let me zoom in on that so you can see that a little bit better so you can see that's our model there siamese model dot h5 Cool, that is the first bit now done. Now, what we actually need to do is do that slight customization to be able to reload this. So let's go on ahead and do that. Okay, that is our model now reloaded. So there was a little bit of customization that I had to do in the second part to be able to load up our custom models. But let's actually take a look at the full line of code that we've written. And again, it is just one line of code. I've just split it into separate lines. So I believe we can just uh, do that to go into separate lines. Nope, never mind. Cool, that's our model now loaded. I think we can delete that, can't we? Yep. Okay, so what we've gone and written is model equals tf dot keras dot models dot load underscore model so this line over here actually allows us to load a model up from our h5 weight so if i go and take a look at that uh, so the documentation says let me zoom in on this so you can see it so this function actually allows us to load a saved a model saved via model dot save so that's effectively what we're going and loading up now now what we can also do is i believe we can also load up our weights so save model dot load load weight so you've also got the ability to do that as well but in this case we're going to do it this way because that's the way i've developed the rest of the tutorial so just follow this way guys please okay so i've written model equals tf.keras.models.load underscore model then the first positional argument that we're passing through is the name of the file that we've gone and saved as which in this case is going to be siamese model.h5 which is what you can see there so that's pretty sort of straightforward. There's no real issues there. The second bit, which is very important, is actually going and loading our custom objects. Now, because we've got these inside of our notebook already, we don't need to do anything else aside from that. But when we go and actually build our Kivi app, this is going to be really, really important because we're going to need somewhere to reference to our custom layer. But I'm going to show you how to handle that later. Perfectly fine. So the second keyword argument is custom underscore objects equals, and then we're passing through this dictionary here. So it's squiggly brackets, and then we're specifying L1 dist, which is our L1 distance layer, colon L1 dist, which is effectively our L1 distance layer, which is what we created from, again, it was inside of step four. Again, we've done a ton of stuff here, which is this over here. So this is our custom Siamese distance layer. All we're doing is we're passing that through as a custom object down here. And we are also passing through binary cross entropy, which is going to be this key over here. So binary cross entropy, and then colon tf.losses.binary cross entropy over there. And I believe this is because we probably created a separate key for it. Now, if I remove this, this is actually going to cause a whole bunch of errors. So what you're going to see if you don't pass through the custom object is you're going to get this error here. So it's going to say value error, unknown layer, L1 dist. And this is because that is a custom layer. So if we go went and added that back in, let's just go and add our L1 distance layer for now. Okay, so it looks like we didn't need the binary cross entropy bit, but in this particular case, looks like it's worked. So again, by passing through that custom object, we're able to effectively load up our custom objects. Now I'm going to leave in that second line because I don't know what that's going to do if I remove it. But in this particular case, that's worked successfully. It looks like you might be able to drop this off as well, but who knows, might need to do some more digging into it. If anyone in the comments knows, let me know. All right, cool. That is our model now reloaded. So if we wanted to go and use this model now, we could type in model.predict and then pass through our, uh, what was it, test input test val you can see we are now getting predictions so that is effectively showing how we can go and evaluate our model make predictions save it down and then reload it so we can now get to actually deploying and building this up into an app let me just double check that we didn't have anything else there nope and again we can go and take a look at our model summary
So again, we've got the exact same architecture that we had for our model up there. So let me just add some comments. So make predictions with reloaded model and then view our model summary. Cool. So that is about it for this tutorial. So we have gone through a ton of stuff. So we've gone through inside of step six, we imported our metrics, we made predictions. And remember, we can make predictions by grabbing our batch. I'm going to show you in the next couple of episodes how you can make predictions with a non TensorFlow data set. So you can see how we'll actually productionize this as well. We made a bunch of predictions, calculated some metrics, visualized our results. We then went and saved down our model so we can begin using it elsewhere. But on that note, that about wraps it up. Thanks so much for tuning in, guys. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, be sure to give it a big thumbs up, hit subscribe and tick that bell and let me know how you went with this and if there's any changes or any help that you need. Thanks again for tuning in. Peace. What's happening, guys? Welcome to part seven in the series on building a Siamese neural network where we take a state-of-the-art research paper and go all the way to the end and build a fully fleshed out deep learning model, which allows us to perform facial recognition and verification. In this part of the series, we're going to be focused on our real-time tests. So we're actually going to be integrating with our webcam to be able to perform our real-time facial verification. Let's take a deeper look at what we'll be going through. So as I was saying in this video, what we're going to be focused on is our real-time test. Now there's going to be three key things that we need to do in order to get this up and running. So first up, what we're going to need to do is set up some images that we can use for our verification. So ideally, we're going to have two separate folders. One is going to be for our positive verification images. The second is going to be for our negative verification images. Then we're going to build a verify function, which basically loops through all their images and compares it to what we're getting in from our input from our webcam. So this is going to be akin to what you might have when you're using Face ID on your iPhone. And then we're going to loop it all together and we're actually going to use OpenCV to perform our real-time facial verification. Ready to do it? Let's get to it. Alrighty guys, so it's time to get started on our real-time test. So what we're going to be doing here is first up, what we're going to do is define a verification function. So we're going to call this step 8.1 verification function. And the second thing that we're going to do is we are actually going to connect or hook into our webcam using OpenCV. So open CV, real time verification. Coolio. All right, and let's add a couple of extra cells. So we know what we're doing here. Now, rather than just talking through it, let's actually jump over to whiteboard Nick and see how this verification function is actually going to run. Right. So the first thing that we need to do is go on ahead and perform or create our verification function. So the way that this is going to work is we're actually going to access our webcam using open CV first up. And what we're going to retrieve from our webcam is effectively our input image. So from here, what we're actually going to do is we're going to use this input image and verify against a number of positive samples. Now, these are really just images that we've already collected as part of our training. So we're going to have these inside of a folder. And let's say, for example, we get 50 different images. We're going to use each one of these samples and loop through them as we go to perform our verification. So our verification is actually performing 50 different predictions. So one verification cycle or one full cycle works out to be 50 predictions. And this increases our chance that we're going to accurately verify that the person that is in the input image is actually our positive class. So what's going to happen is this image from over here, this should be red, this image from over here, is going to be passed through to our neural network as are each one of the samples from our positive class. So we're going to have two images. And what we're going to do is, or what we should effectively get out of this is a one if the image is actually verified. Now it's obviously going to be a range from zero to one because this is the way that our neural network works. But what we're actually going to do from here is we're actually going to implement two specific formulas. We're going to leverage one function called our verification threshold. Let me double check what the name of it actually is. Sorry, our detection threshold. What color are we going to make this? So we're going to have a verification threshold. And what we're going to do here is we're going to set a threshold above which we count our person as being a positive class. Now, typically this would be 50%. So we'd basically say that from each one of our results from over here, if the threshold or if the probability that we get back is 50%, 
then we count that or so let's make that 50 percent then we count that as a positive sample now we're actually going to make this tunable so we could actually set a higher verification threshold or a lower detect or lower verification threshold now what we're also going to do is we're also going to implement our detection threshold and the way that we're going to calculate this is we're going to count the number of classes from over here that surpass our verification threshold so let's say for example that we get 30 images that pass 50 percent the way that we're going to calculate this detection threshold is we're effectively going to say we have 30 images which surpass our 50 image threshold from over here so we're going to have 30 divided by 50 and that is going to then become our detection metric and we're going to be able to also have a separate detection threshold as well to ba basically be able to say what proportion of positive samples are actually clearing this uh, verification threshold so this basically gives us a secondary detection metric which allows us to determine whether or not we actually have a positive sample on our hands so this gives us a whole bunch of additional levels of control all righty enough whiteboarding let's actually go and write some code Alrighty, and we're back. So what we're going to do now is we're actually going to start setting up our verification. Now, what we need to do is we first up need to set up that folder of positive samples. So we're going to go into the same folder that we're currently working in, and we're going to create a verification set. So I'm going to create a new folder in here and I'm going to call it um, application data. And inside of here, I'm going to create a new folder called verification images. And we're also going to create another folder called input image. So what we're actually going to do, let me make this bigger so you can see what I'm doing. Is it super small right now? So I've created two folders. So inside of application data, which we just created, I went and created a folder called input image, which is what we're going to do is we're going to take a capture from our webcam, save it into here, and then we're going to perform our verification against all of the images that we have inside of here. Now, what we need to do is actually get some images inside of this verification images folder. So what we can do is just go to our data folder, go to our positive samples, and we're just going to grab a bunch of images here. So what's that? That's already 35. Let's grab um, so that many. I'm going to copy that. And I'm going to go into our application data, verification images, paste those here. And then let's go back and we need more data. So if we go back and go to positive, let's grab some of these, and these. Cool. All right. So we'll grab a bunch of images. And what we're going to do is we are going to dump them into this verification images folder. How many do we? Oh, we've only got 43. Let's go grab another seven. So if we go back into data and positive. So what do we need? Another seven. So I'm going to grab that, 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 that. That's seven. Let's just make sure we don't have any overlapping ones. So if we go back into application data, verification images. All right, so we've got one overlapping. Perfect. So we've got 50 images. Now, what we're going to do, as I was saying, is we're going to loop through every one of these images and use them to be able to perform our predictions. So we're not going to be performing predictions over one sample. We're actually going to do it over 50 different examples. This is going to give us a better likelihood of actually getting an accurate classification. And it ideally bulletproofs your model a little bit more. Okay, so we've got all of those images there. So remember, we've got, we just went and created a folder called application data inside of our root folder. We then, inside of that, we would then went and created two new folders called input image and one called verification images. And then inside of verification images, we just pasted 50 different images from our positive samples that we used as part of our training. So we're going to dump those into that. Okay, now what we need to do is actually go on ahead and start building up our verification function. So let's go on ahead and start doing this. Now, as per usual, I'm going to take this step by step so you can actually see how it works. So let's begin. Okay, so that is the beginnings of our function. So I've gone and written df and then I've called our function verify. So this is defining a new function called verify. And to that, we are going to be passing through four different positional arguments. So the first argument is going to be the frame. And this is effectively our input image. So if you cast your mind back to our whiteboard session, remember how we had our webcam and we had our straight line going through with our input image. This is what our frame represents. Then we're going to have our model, and this is effectively our Siamese neural network that we just went and trained. And we're also going to have a detection threshold and a verification threshold. Now remember, our detection threshold is effectively going to be the metric above which a prediction 
is considered positive. So remember, in most classification models, what you're effectively going to set this to is 50%. So if the probability that you get back is greater than 50%, that is a positive class. Now, what we're going to do is we're actually going to allow ourselves to configure this. So if we want a more strict level of prediction, we can actually bump this up. So this is going to be our detection threshold. And our verification threshold is going to be the proportion proportion of uh, positive predictions over total positive samples. So remember, we've got 50 positive samples, right? In our verification, or what do we call it? I can't even remember now. We called it verification images. So remember, we've got 50 images here. So this number is going to be, so say for example, we get 30 positive matches. We're effectively going to be calculating 30 over 50, which means our verification threshold will be 30 over 50, which means it'll be 60%. So we could set this higher or lower depending on how many classes or how many positive predictions we actually want to have as part of our model. Cool. So what we actually need to go do now is actually make some predictions. So let's go on ahead and start building this up. Okay, before we go any further, let's take a look at what we wrote there. So we wrote four different lines of code. And the first part is we've actually gone and created a results array. So we're going to store all of our results inside of a results array to make it a little bit easier to go and perform our calculations later on. Then what we're doing is we're looping through every single image inside of our verification images folder. So let's actually break this down. So I'm going to zoom in on this. So remember, we've got our folders. So we've got application data. So we created inside of our root folder, we created a folder called application underscore data. And inside of that, we created two folders. So input image and verification images. Now, at the moment, we don't have anything inside of input image, but that's fine. I'm going to break that down in a second. So what we've gone and done from there is we're going to be looping through every folder inside or oh, every image inside of a verification images folder. So to do that, I've written for image in os.listdir and then we're specifically looping through or listing out all of the images inside of a directory and we've actually gone and passed through this file path so os.path.join application underscore data comma verification images so if I actually show you this this is effectively just returning the file path to our verification images folder if I write os.listdir now os.list or wrap this in os.listdir this is going to list out all of the files that we have inside of that folder, which are all of our verification images, which you can see there. Cool. And this is, remember, as part of our whiteboarding session, this is part of that full cycle loop. We're going to be looping through all of those verification images to make sure that we have a higher chance of getting a proper positive example or an accurate positive example. Then we're getting our input image. So I've written input underscore image equals pre-process. And remember this pre-process function comes from uh, way back, which we wrote, I'm trying to find it now. Uh, it should be around here somewhere, here. So this is going to be reading in our image from our file path. So we pass through our file path to that. It's going to load the image using tf.io.decode. It's going to resize it to be 100 by 100 because this is what our neural network needs. And it's going to scale it. So it's going to divide it by 255 as well. Cool. So we're going to use pre-process. And to that, we're going to pass through the file path for our input image. So if I show you that now, so this is again using os.path.join. So we're going to grab an input image from our webcam and we're going to store it inside of our input image folder. So inside of application underscore data, inside of input image or inside of the input image folder, and we're going to call it input underscore image dot JPG. So what we'll effectively do is we'll loop through from our webcam and we're going to set it up so that if we hit V on our keyboard, it's going to take a snapshot from our person at that point in time 
going to run the detection loop and then it's going to output whether or not we're verified or not. So when we hit the V, we're effectively going to be saving down this image first up as part of our open CV loop. And then we'll be able to pick it up using our verify function. So the full line there is input underscore image equals preprocess and then parentheses os.path.join and then we're passing through this file path over here. So os.path.join and then inside of parentheses application underscore data comma input underscore image comma input underscore image dot jpg and then we're doing something really similar for our validation image so i've just written validation underscore image equals pre-process and then rather than passing through the file path to our input image we're effectively passing through the file path to our verification image so if i separate um this loop so if i write for image in let's just grab this over here um let's grab this line And if we go and print, this is probably going to go crazy. Right, so we're effectively looping through every single one of our validation images and printing them out in this particular case. But let's just say we wanted the file path to each one of these. You can see that we're looping through every single one of these validation images. But by wrapping it inside of our pre-process function, we're actually going to be loading it in using TensorFlow. So that's exactly what we've done here. And right now, we've got our images properly set up to be able to go and perform a prediction. So remember, as part of our neural network, we need two images. We need our input image and either our positive or our negative samples. So in this case, we've got our positive sample. So all that's really left to do now is go and make a prediction and then calculate whether or not our detection threshold and verification threshold have been met. So let's go ahead and do this. Oops, sorry, deleted that. Let's go and do it. Okay, so I've gone and written two additional lines there. So first up, what I've written is result equals model.predict. So this is effectively using our uh, model.predict function, which we took a look at in step seven as part of our last video. So we're doing pretty much the exact same thing here. This time, however, we're wrapping our data inside of an additional set of parentheses because we've only got a single sample. That's exactly what we need to do when we've only got one example. Otherwise, if you had multiple examples, it's perfectly fine. You don't need to do the wrapping. So I've written list and then inside of parentheses np.expandim. So this just wraps a array inside of another set of arrays. And then to that, we've passed through an array, which the first sample is going to be our input image. The second example is going to be our validation image. So this, and then this, and then we've passed through comma axis equals one. So this is part of the np expandim. So that is our first set of parentheses. Then we've got everything wrapped inside of a list, which is there. And then that's passed through to our model.predict method. Then we've stored that inside of a variable called result. And we take that result value and we append it to our results array that we had from up here. So this effectively means that we're going to have all of our results inside of a big array that we can then use to calculate these metrics. So what's left to do is actually go on ahead and return those metrics. So let's do that. Okay, so before I go any further, that is, this is effectively our detection value. So let me copy this. It's actually separated out. So that is the number of detections that we've got. So we have the results that we had, so from over here. So we're basically grabbing all of our results and wrapping it inside of a NumPy array. So mp.array, and then we're passing through our results. And we're summing up all of the examples that are surpassing through our detection threshold. So if I copy this... That is that there. So this basically determines how many of our positive predictions are actually surpassing this detection threshold. Then in order to calculate our verification threshold, we basically just need to divide it by the number of positive samples. So let's wrap this up. Okay, and that is our verification now done. So I've gone and written three additional lines of code there. So first up, I've written verification equals detection. So it's this metric over here, divided by the number of images that we've got inside of our verification images folder. So it's effectively detection divided by 50. 
Now, if you wanted to, you could just replace this with 50, but by doing it this way, if you wanted to add more verification images later on, it's still going to work and it's still going to calculate correctly. And then we've basically gone and checked whether or not we're verified. So I've written verified equals verification is greater than verification threshold. So this is going to effectively return a true or false. So if this proportion is greater than our verification threshold that we pass through to our function, we're basically going to say, hey, the person that's in our webcam right now is verified and is the correct person. So I'm going to grab this as well. Just throw this over here. Cool. And that is our verify function now effectively done. So I think we're actually pretty good there. So what we might try to do now is actually run a test. So that looks okay. So we just went and ran that cell. What we can now go on ahead and do is actually try to grab an image from our webcam and actually pass it through this and all fingers crossed, this should effectively work. There'll probably be bugs as per usual, but that's fine. We'll work through them. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to delete this cell. So we've gone and done a ton of stuff there. So let's actually just quickly take a step back. So remember what we're doing is we're looping through all of the images within our verification images folder, which we just set up. So it's going to be this folder here. So we're going to be looping through all of those. We've grabbed our images using the pre-process function that we defined way back. We then make a bunch of predictions and then we calculate all of our different thresholds. So we first up calculate the number of detections that pass our detection threshold. So normally that's 50%, but we could change it. And then we calculate our verification threshold. So this is the number of positive or positive classes divided by the total number of positive samples that we've got within our verification images folder from down here. Cool. All right, let's go and do it. So the next thing that we need to do is actually make some real-time detection. So this is going to be a pretty standard open CV loop. If you've seen some of my computer vision stuff before, this is going to be pretty familiar to you. So let's go on ahead and do this. Okay, so that is our pretty stand. I'm just going to drop this down so you can see a little bit better. So that is our standard OpenCV loop now done. Now we're going to need to tweak this a bunch, but that's perfectly fine. So let's go on ahead and run this first up and see if this works. And then I'll walk you through the code. So ideally, if you run this and all things holding equal, you should get a little pop up down the bottom. Okay, so that's not good. So that means that we need to tweak this number. So I can't remember which number it is. So is it zero? I don't believe so doesn't look that way nope so let's try a uh, video capture device too so normally when you're accessing your webcam using OpenCV you might need to play around with the video capture device number which is this number here in this case I tried zero just then that didn't work I tried three that didn't work that gave me an error so let's try uh, one I don't believe it's going to be one either nope that's the wrong one and so that, that is actually a very good example. So this is one of my other video capture devices that I've actually got installed on my computer. So it's for the Sony uh, camera that I've actually got integrated. So you can see that that's definitely not the right one. So we can quit out of that. Um, two, I believe, is going to be the webcam that I'm probably currently using. So it's probably going to be inaccessible. So you can see that one's throwing an error. So it's not two. Is it three? Probably not. I think we tried three already, didn't we? Nope, so it's not three, so what about four? Okay, so it looks like it's four. So I can see that my secondary webcam is just activated over here. So in this particular case, sometimes you need to play around with your webcam number to see which one is the most appropriate device number that you actually wanna use. Okay, but what we actually need to do now is cut down this frame. So remember when we actually captured our images, we only captured, uh, I can't even remember what it was. I think it was 250 pixels by 250 pixels. Let's actually just double check that. So if I go to properties uh, and then details. Yep, so it's 250 by 250. So what we want to do is we want to mimic this. So if, rather than taking in the full 480 by 640 pixels, we want to get 250 by 250. This is pretty easy because we've actually written this code way back when we actually captured our images. So let's actually close this down. And I'm going to show you where to get this code. So it's right over here. 
So this is what we did under step 2.2, collect positive and anchor classes. So we effectively wrote this code, which was going to allow us to cut our frame down to 250 by 250 pixels. So we're going to copy that and we're going to paste it just under here. So let's actually take a look at our full code before we go and run that again. So first up, what we're doing is we're grabbing our video capture device. So written cap equals cv2 dot video capture. And then we're passing through video capture device four. Again, you might need to play around with this. Might change depending on which machine you're using and how many webcams you've got installed. Then I've written while cap dot is open. So this effectively double checks that our webcam is currently opened and active. Then we're reading our frame. So I've written ret comma frame equals cap dot read. So this effectively captures the frame from our webcam at that particular point in time and gives us this frame value that we can actually work with. We don't typically use the ret uh, variable back. And then uh, let's pause on this for a second. We won't take a look at that just yet. And then I've written cv2.im show and then we're naming what we want our frame to be named. So when we actually run this cell, you'll see that it says verification in the uh, top bar. And then the second positional argument that we're passing through is our frame. Now, also, as per usual, guys, all of this code is going to be available on GitHub. Throughout this series, I've actually been committing them per video. So you've actually got one per series or episode in the series. Okay, so on that note, then everything else from down here is all to do with quitting gracefully. So I've written if cv2.wait key 10 and 0xff equals equals odd q so this basically checks whether or not you're hitting q on your keyboard as OpenCV takes a break then it's going to break out of the loop and it's going to release our capture so I've written cap dot release and then cv2 dot destroy or window so this just basically shuts everything down this line over here actually allows us to capture only 250 pixels from our frame so it's effectively just performing some index slicing so i've written 120 pixels or start from 120 pixels and then go to 120 pixels plus 250 pixels, start from 200 pixels, and then go from 200 to 250, and then grab all of our channels. So this effectively just cuts down the frame that we get down to 250 pixels. So if I run this now, we should only get a smaller sample or a smaller frame, which is only going to capture our head. Cool. So you can see my head in there. So that's looking a lot better for when we actually go and perform a verification. Okay. So what's next? So we actually need to go and apply a verification now. <laughs> All right, so, but you can see that's looking good. We'll actually be able to perform our verification there. Okay, let's do this. So, what we now want to do is we now need to implement some sort of verification loop or verification trigger. Verification trigger. So, we've written this huge verify function here, but we haven't actually used it yet. Now, what we're going to do is when, or what we want to do is when our user hits V on their keyboard, we want to trigger that verification function from over here. So this is akin to like when you double tap um, the right hand side button on your iPhone, it actually goes into or it actually starts performing um, face ID to actually go and maybe verify your credit card or something. This is what we're going to do here. So we can actually use this same line over here to actually trigger a verification. So rather than using uh, the odd Q, we're going to change this to odd V. So basically when we hit V on our keyboard, then we're actually going to verify or kick off our verification loop. The first part of our verification loop that we need to, or verification step that we need here is to save our input image. So save input image to input image folder. And remember it's inside of application data. Yeah. Forward slash input image folder. Okay. So let's go on ahead and do this first. Okay, so that's going to go on ahead and write out our image to our input image folder. So I've written cv2.imwrite. So this is just some standard uh, open CV functionality to write out images. So cv2.imwrite, and then we've written os.path.join. And then to that, we're basically passing through where we want to save our input image. So this is the full path, the so folders and file name. So here we've written application underscore data, comma, input underscore image, comma, input underscore image dot JPG. And then the second argument that we pass through to the cv 2im write function from over here is the frame, which is going to be this over here, which you can see there. Cool. So now that that's done, I think the next thing that we need to do is actually go and perform our verification. So we can actually trigger 
a verification function here. So verification function. Actually, let's go and test this out first. See if we can actually save through our image. So if I run this now, it should be okay. So if I run that, let's take a look inside of our input image folder. All right, so that's our face popping up. So if we go and hit V on our keyboard, we should see an image pop up there. Okay, cool. So that's saved. So you can see we've got our input image. That's my face there. Try another one. That's my face. Uh, let's just change it. So we got large icon. So. Yep. Cool. So you can see that if I keep hitting V, that we are effectively changing the image that we're capturing. Pretty cool, right? Now, now that that's actually saved there, what we need to do bump the seat up uh, and if we hit Q a couple of times that should close that down what we need to do now is actually trigger our verification so we're going to use this big bad boy over here so let's do that so we are going to get results and verified back I just realized that we don't actually use our frame here because we go and pick it up from down here I think I might have tweaked this when I was, uh, that's fine. We can remove that later, um, but that's fine. So we're going to save our, pass through our model and then we're going to set our detection threshold and our verification threshold. I'm going to set these both to, uh, I don't know, 50% and let's see how that performs. Okay. And then let's print out our result. Okay, so what I've gone and written there is results, comma, verified. So this is just unpacking our results that we get from here. Equals verify, which is this function. And then to that, we're passing through our frame, which I think we can actually drop, to be honest, because we don't actually use it in this frame. Nope, that's not going to work. Uh, let's just take a look. Yeah, we don't actually need frame here. It's my bad. We can actually remove that. So our full function now is just verify and then we're passing through our model, which is going to be our Siamese model. So if we take a look, model, model.summary, that's our Siamese network. And then we're passing through our detection threshold and our verification threshold. So those are our two last components. And then we're effectively going to print whether or not we're verified or not. So remember, we're going to get true or false from down here. So we might need to interpret our results a little bit, but that's fine. Let's go and run this and see if it actually works. Fingers crossed, guys. It's been a long time coming getting to this point. Okay, so that's ourselves over there. Now, I'm not super confident that that's going to be verified because we've got a microphone in the way and we've got the green screen on the background. So let's try this anyway. So that's actually verified ourselves. So if I move this, that looks like it's verified again. Verified again. What about if we get an image of somebody else on our phone? Um, who's a good example? LeBron. All right, let's see if that works. This would be great. This is a great test of our model here. Come on, focus. Doesn't seem to want to focus. All right, let's just try that anyway. Okay, so that has not verified. So you can see that we've actually got a false there. So if we go, uh, let's try somebody else. Um, Eddie Murphy. I don't know if I look like Eddie Murphy, but it's worth a test. I want to get my fingers out of the way. That's verified as true. Okay, so that is a bad example. Try it again. True. All right, so this is where we might need to do a little tweaking. So I wanted to get that. Cool. All right, so we're going to quit out of that and let's actually take a look at our results. So remember, we're going to get our results from down here. So you can see that we are getting a lot of one. So if we go and calculate, uh, my mic is just dropping. 
Um, so if we take a look at our results, greater than 0 0.5, What is this, a NumPy array? You don't squeeze. Okay, so uh, we've basically got all of our samples there. So if I type in mp.sum, So it looks like we've got 38 samples that are passing in this particular case. So if I type in 38 divided by 50, that would mean that we need to bump up our, either our detection threshold or our verification threshold. So say we made this a lot stricter. So it looks like at 80%, we're still getting Eddie passing through. So if we had 34 here, that looks like it's a 60% threshold. So what if we did this to 90? Still passing. Okay, so if we, that would be 32. Okay, so what we could try doing is let's set this to, I don't know, 90%. And then we're going to move this to 70%. So this is effectively changing our detection threshold to be 90% and our verification threshold to be 70%. So if we go and run this again, let's see if we can block Eddie this time. Hopefully not block ourselves as well. All right, there we go. So I've gone and blocked Eddie. Now, if we go and try myself, fingers <laughs> crossed, you know, and verify myself. Okay, so you can see that in this particular case, we've blocked Eddie and we've managed to verify against myself. Woo, guys, we've got it working. I'm so happy. All right, this is awesome. Again, you can do a lot more tuning. So if you wanted to boost... Um, accuracy, you can play around with your different thresholds. You could even um, add more verification images. So this will give you a greater scope to fine tune how accurate or not accurate your model is. Let's try taking the green screen down as well. Let's see what that does. I'm just going to put myself there. That's still verified as true. That's verified as false. So again, so false, what is that? False negative. True, okay. So we might have had one little bug. How good is that guys? So that is our facial verification now working. Oh my God. I'm so happy. It's taken a while to get to this point, but we have effectively done it. And we've gone and tested it out on a bunch of other examples as well. So again, we can smash Q to close that down. That is our facial verification and facial recognition now done. My mic keeps falling down. <laughs> that's fine. Alrighty, guys. So we've gone and done a ton of stuff in this series. But that sort of shows you what's possible, right? So we've gone and trained a, and fine-tuned a neural network completely from scratch. We've built a really sophisticated architecture. And we've actually gone and tested it out to get some accurate predictions. Now, we went and did a ton of stuff in this video but specifically what we went and did is we went and built this huge verification function over here which does our full cycle loop through our verification images folder and then we went and fine-tuned and built up our real-time verification loop there is one more video in this series and we're going to take all of what we've learned and what we've built and we're going to integrate it into a kivi app where we've effectively got a button where we can hit verify and it's going to perform face id on ourselves inside of a kivi app but on that note that about does wrap it up. Thanks so much for tuning in, guys. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, be sure to give it a big thumbs up, hit subscribe and tick that bell. And let me know how you went with this. I am trying to accelerate this series a little bit faster so we can ideally get it all out. And in the next video, what we're going to be focused on is building our Kivi app. I'll see you then. Until next time, peace. Now, let's do the almighty Robin Williams test. So this was the one that I was uh, a little bit worried about. So if we go and test him, Drop the screen down so we don't have so much glare. So you can see he is unverified. The model is working. Let's try me again. Verified. 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 
Alrighty guys, welcome to part eight in the facial recognition and facial verification series where we try to take a state-of-the-art research paper and go all the way to the end and finally integrate it into an app. And it just so happens that this is the final episode in the series and we're gonna be doing exactly that. So we're gonna be taking our train model and integrating it into a Kiwi app so that we can actually use it practically in real time. Let's take a deeper look as to what we'll be going through. So as I was saying, we are in the final episode in the series, and this is all gonna to be to do with actually building up our Kiwi app. So you actually get some practical use out of the hardcore deep learning model that we've actually gone and trained. Now we're gonna be focused on three things as per usual, following the rule of threes. So what we're first up gonna do is we're gonna set up Kiwi. So Kiwi is an open source framework that allows you to build applications with Python. What we'll then do is we'll build a lightweight facial verification app. So think of like face ID for your phone, but we're going to be building it using Kiwi. And then we're going to integrate our TensorFlow model. So we'll actually build up our verification process to be able to leverage this model inside of Kiwi. Ready to do it? Let's get to it. Alrighty guys, so we finally got to the good bit. And this is where all our hard work finally comes together and where we're really going to be focused on integrating our TensorFlow deep learning model in to our Kiwi app. Now, if you haven't heard of Kiwi before, basically it's an open source framework that allows you to build applications. And I believe you can even build some native stuff all using Python, which works to our advantage because pretty much everything we've done so far has been in Python. So in keeping with that theme, we're gonna be using Kiwi. Now, specifically in order to go through this, we've actually got a, a number of tasks that we need to go through. But before we do that, let's actually jump over into our whiteboard session and actually take a look at what we'll be building. All right, so in this part of the series, we are going to be focused on building our verification app. So in order to do this, we're going to be focused on building our app with Kivi. Now, we're really going to have three main components that we need to handle. So say, for example, we've got our app. The first thing that we need to be able to do is grab our webcam feed. So over here, we're going to have our webcam feed. And in here, we're going to have the person that we're trying to verify. From that, we're going to have a button which basically says verify. And then down the bottom, what we're also going to have is we're going to have a label which says verified or unverified. So let's say um, this person is not me then right down here, we're going to say unverified. Now, in order to do this, we are actually going to be building up this app with a library called Kivi. And the cool thing about Kivi is like, it's an open source library for Python that allows you to build a whole bunch of different types of apps. So if you want to build uh, like stuff that integrates with your machine learning models, this is actually great. Now we've actually gone and done a ton of additional work specifically so that we can hook in this bit over here to a webcam. So we're actually going to have a webcam that integrates into our Kiwi app to actually give us this video feed. And that is the core premise of this app. So when we actually go and hit that verify button, we're actually going to trigger our TensorFlow model. So this is going to grab the webcam feed and it's going to go and verify against our Siamese neural network. So imagine, I don't know how you draw it, but uh, let's we draw a little basic neural network. And from that, we're going to get either a one or a zero, a verified or unverified, and that is going to drive this outcome over here. And that in a nutshell is what we're going to be building, but we're going to be taking this step by step. So don't fret, we're going to be building it up together. All right, back to the code and we're back. So in order to actually go and do all of that, what we're gonna to need to do is go through all of these 14 different steps. Now, fret not, a lot of the stuff that we've already done already is gonna be readily transferable to when we actually build this stuff up. So even though we've got 14 steps, some of them are gonna be a lot easier than others. Now, first things first, what we need to do is go on ahead and set up our app folder. Then we're gonna install Kivi and then bring over some existing assets. We're then going to focus on building our layout and our actual app. So it's going to be pretty simple, but again, you could extend this out if you really wanted to. And then we're actually going to bring over our verification components and tweak them a little bit so that we can get it to work with our app. But first things first, let's actually go on ahead and set up our app folder so that we can actually get stuff a little bit more structured. So I'm going to go into the same root directory that we've been pretty much doing all of our stuff in. And from within there, I'm actually going to create a new folder 
and I'm going to call it app. And to begin with, let's actually just grab our to-do list and let's actually dump it in there. So we've got all of our stuff in the same place and we can see it all together. And I'm going to open this folder inside of VS Code. Cool. So really, it's all we've got is our to-do list inside of there at the moment. Really nothing too crazy over here. Now what we actually need to do is we actually need to, so we can actually mark this bit off. So that's done. The next thing that we need to do is actually go on ahead and install Kivi. Now this is pretty straightforward. It's just a pip install. So what we need to do is open up our terminal. And before I'm actually going to activate a virtual environment because I'm using one here. But if you're not, don't fret, just install it into your base Python environment. So let me activate this environment and then we should be good to go. All right, so you can see my virtual environment is called Face ID, but that's perfectly fine. If you don't have a virtual environment, don't fret. You don't need to go and do that. Now what we can do is I'm just going to jump back into our app folder. And let's go on ahead and install Kiwi. Okay, so before I run that, let's actually take a look at what we've written. So I've written pip install Kiwi and then inside of square brackets full. So this is going to install all of Kiwi, including its dependencies. And then we've also installed or we've passed through the second argument, which is Kiwi underscore example. So this is going to install the Kiwi examples components, not mandatory for this tutorial, but I think it's, uh, I actually had it as part of testing. So I've just kept it in there to make sure that we don't break anything. But I believe you could actually drop this and it should still run fine. Okay, so once you've written that, go on ahead and run it. And this should go on ahead and install Kiwi. And you can see that it has, in fact, gone and done all of that. So it looks like we don't have any errors there. I've got this warning saying I should upgrade PIP, but that's fine. We don't need to go on ahead and do that. Uh, let's go on ahead and clear this. And uh, so to clear in a terminal, it's just CLS. Um, I can't remember what it is on Mac. Uh, maybe it's clear. I can't remember. I don't do it too much anymore. But what we now want to do is just double check that we've got Kiwi there. So if I run pip list, and if we go and take a look, you can see that we have, in fact, got Kiwi there. So we've got all of our Kiwi dependencies. That means we are kind of good to go. And we can actually mark step two off as done. All right, that is that done. Now, our next step is to create our validation folder. Now, what I mean by this is, remember in the previous video, what we did is we set up some validation images. And we, when we actually went to perform our verification, we didn't just do one prediction. We actually looped through all of the images inside of our verification images folder to actually go and get an accurate prediction, right? That is exactly what we're going to do here. So what we need to do is grab those images and bring it into our app folder. And that's exactly what we're going to go on ahead and do. So if we go back into our root folder, so remember face ID is my root folder. So I'm just going to grab this application data folder and I'm actually going to copy it and I'm going to paste it into our app folder. And inside of that, we've actually got two things. So we've got one folder called input images. So this is the image that our webcam captures to verify against our two channels. And we've also got a bunch of other images, which are our verification images. So these are the ones that it goes and compares against. So that's pretty much that step done. So that one was pretty easy. So we just went and grabbed this application folder here. Let me zoom in so you can see it. So we grab that and we pasted it into there. So application data is now going into our app folder. Cool. Okay, so that is step three now done. So we've just brought that over. And this is really all just a bunch of setup. So nothing too crazy here. Now, the next thing that we need to do is create a custom layer module. So this is actually relatively straightforward, but let's actually take it step by step. So I'm just going to close this terminal now. And what we're going to do is we're going to create a new file. And this is going to be called layers.py. And for this, what we're actually going to need to do is we're actually going to need to bring in our custom L1 distance layer. So this is actually going to hold custom L1 distance layer module. Right, so what we actually need to do here is we need to bring in our dependencies and then we're actually going to jump back into our Jupyter Notebook and bring through our custom distance layer. And as per usual, guys, all of the code that I write in this is going to be available in the description below. So if you get stuck or you're not sure where to put stuff, it's all going to be available there so you can actually pick it up. So first up, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to set my Python interpreter. Um, so if you've got a base interpreter, that's perfectly fine. Again, as I'm using a virtual environment, I can actually go into the virtual environment. So if you haven't seen how to build a virtual environment before, I've actually got an example inside of the five hour TensorFlow object detection tutorial. So I've just created a virtual environment called Face ID in that tutorial. I think I called it TFOD. 
uh, when you're inside a VS code, you can go and set that kernel inside of scripts. And then I'm just going to choose Python. Cool. So that basically means that when I'm coding inside a VS code, I'm using the same kernel that I'm using to run stuff that I've actually used to develop pretty much the whole app. Cool. So what we now need to do inside of our layers file is we actually need to first up bring in some dependencies and then we're going to go on ahead and copy over our custom L1 distance layer. So let's go on ahead and do that. Okay, those are our two main dependencies now imported. So I've written two lines of code there. So first up, import TensorFlow as TF. So this is going to bring in our base TensorFlow library so we can use it across the board. And then I've also imported the layer class. And this is really important when it comes to actually using or building up a custom layer. So for that, I've written from tensorflow.keras.layers, import layer, and layer is in caps. Just pay attention to that. Now, the next thing that we need to do is bring in the custom uh, L1 distance layer from Jupyter. So let's go and do that. So I'm just going to jump in. So I've already got the notebook already set up and it looks like I've gone and killed it off. And that's perfectly fine as long as we got it open. So I just need to copy over this L1 distance class. I'm going to copy that. And this was done in, I think, episode four. And it looks like under step 4.2. So we're just going to copy this over. And the reason, let me actually explain the reasoning. So the reasoning that we need this or the reason that we need this is because when we actually go and load our custom model from a H5 file, you can see that we need to pass through our custom objects and we need to pass through our L1 distance layer, which is our custom object. So that's why we're going to need it inside of our Kiwi app. So we're going to go on ahead under step 4.2. We're going to copy everything to do with our L1 distance layer, and we're going to paste it in to our layers.py file. That is that done. So let's just explain why. So we need this. Why do we need this? It's needed for to load the custom model. And this is going to apply wherever you use custom objects with TensorFlow. So whether it be a custom layer, custom activation function, um, custom optimizer, custom loss function, you're going to need to do this, right? So just a key thing to know. All right, so that is our L1 distance layer now brought in. So we've gone and effectively brought that. Cool. So we can actually mark step four now as done. So, so far, what we've done is we've set up our app folder installed Kivi, we've created our validation folder. So we brought that in. It's called application underscore data. And we have also created our custom layer module. Now, again, we've got another easy task here. We just need to copy over our H5 model from our root folder into our app folder. So I'm going to go and grab that. So remember when we went and finished training our model out of it, we got this model called Siamese model dot H5. So all we need to do is grab that and paste it into our app folder. That's that now done. Cool. So we can minimize that. And that is step five now done. So this is going to, or this is needed so that we can actually reload our model from disk. So basically when we actually go and use our model, we're going to be able to reload those weights up. Now we're onto the good bit. So this is where we're probably going to write a little bit more code. So we actually first up need to build our template Kibi app. So we're going to bring in some dependencies. We're going to build our layout. We're going to write our update function. And again, I'm going to go through this in detail, but our update function is going to be used to refresh from our webcam. So uh, think of your Kiwi app as standalone. We need it to be continuously updating so we can see our head moving inside of our app. Uh, and then we're going to bring over our pre-processing function from Jupyter again. Cool. But first up, what we need to do is import some dependencies. And you're probably thinking, Nick, where the hell am I importing these dependencies? Well, we actually need to create a app file. So we're going to call it face ID because that's really what this is all being to do with. We're performing our verification. So I'm going to create a new file and I'm going to call it face ID.py. And then from here, what we're going to start to do is import our Kiwi dependency. So we're going to import Kiwi dependencies first. And we're going to need some other dependencies as well. So import other dependencies. Uh, and dependencies and these are really going to be like tensorflow open cv pretty much the stuff that we've used to actually build up our app but first up what we're going to do is we are going to import our kiwi dependency so let's go on ahead and do that now there's going to be quite a few but don't fret we're going to take a step back and actually take a look at what we've imported so let's do it
Okay, that is all of our QV dependencies now imported. So we've gone and written, what is that? Uh, six lines, wait, eight lines of code there. Now let's actually take a step back and take a look at all the stuff that we've wrote. So these first two up here are all to do with our app layout. So for that, I've written from kivi.app import app. So this is going to be our base app class. Then I've gone and imported our box layout. So this is just the layout that our actual Kibi app is going to take. So if we actually go into our documentation and type in box layout. So basically this is sort of what we're going to be getting. We're getting it a vertical or horizontal box. In our case, we're going to be using a, what is it? I think a vertical box because we're going to have our camera at the top, then a button, and then whether or not we're verified or not inside of our application. So we're going to be using this type of layout. Uh, where are we again? So we're up to here. Okay, so that is our app class imported and our box layout. So from box layout import box layout. And this is in camel case. Cool. Then the next couple that we've imported, I really just think of these um, as asset classes. So import kivi, I'm going to call them asset or actually the UX components, right? Really. So I've written from kivi.uix.image, import image. So this is going to be used for our real-time webcam feed. But you'll see that later because there's some magic trickery that we need to get in order to work. And then I've gone and imported the button component. So from kivi.uix.button, import button. Then I've imported a label. So this is going to allow us to work with text. So from kivi.uix.label import label so really three ux components so image button and label then we've gone and brought in some other stuff import other kivi stuff and so the first thing that we've brought in there is from kivi.clock import clock so this is going to allow us to make continuous updates to our app and this is what's going to allow us to get a real-time feed from our kivi app because natively we're not actually running a loop so we need something to pre-process those updates to keep getting a real-time feed from our webcam and this is what we're going to be using the clock for. Then I've imported texture. So from kivi.graphics.texture, import texture. And this is something that I had to play around with a ton when I was actually setting this up. So we actually need to convert our image from our OpenCV webcam to a texture. And then we set our image equal to that texture. So it's a bunch of messing around in order to get this to work, but it does work. I've tested it. So we've imported that so from kivi.graphics.texture import texture and then i've imported the logger so this is going to be towards the end that we actually use this but it's going to make your life a bunch easier so you can actually see some metrics so from kivi.logger import logger and this is particularly nice if you don't want to show this information to your users but you still want to see how your app is performing and what's actually happening behind the scenes so that is uh, pretty much all of our Kivi stuff now imported. So all up, we've written one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different lines of code to import our Kivi dependencies. So let's save that. So that is our dependencies for Kivi now imported. Now, I didn't include it as a separate set, but we actually need to import some other dependencies as well. So while we're here, let's just go on ahead and import those. Okay, so those are our last couple of dependencies now imported. So we've gone and written one, two, three, four, five different lines of code. So first up, what we're doing is we're importing OpenCV because we know undoubtedly we're going to need this when it comes to accessing our webcam. We've then gone and imported TensorFlow. So import TensorFlow as tuf. We've then gone and imported our custom distance layer. So this is coming from our layers.py file. So we're importing that. So to do that, I've written from layers import L1 dist, which is bringing in this class over here. Then we're importing OS. So this is just going to make it easier to work with our file paths. And then last but not least, we're importing NumPy. So import NumPy as NP. So that is it when it comes to importing dependencies. And yes, we've brought in a ton. So there's a ton of dependencies. So the next thing that we actually need to do is... Uh, we can actually mark that as done. That's done. The next thing that we want to do is actually start building our layout. So let's go on ahead and do this. And then we're actually going to start our app and see if we can get it running. So let's start building our layout. So I'm just going to say uh, build app and layout. Let's do it.
Okay, so that is the shell of our app started. So I didn't, I'm going to take this step by step as per usual, rather than, than going balls to the wall and actually building this all up. But so what we first up need to do is define our app. So in order to do that, I've written class cam app inside of caps, and then we're passing through our app. So this is going to ideally perform a little bit of inheritance so we can use our app. And then the first method that we've actually defined is the build method. So def build, and then to that we're passing through self. Build is a inherent uh, function that you actually need to define when working with Kiwi. So if you actually take a look, uh, can we see it here? Let's go into our basics. So you can see in pretty much this one here is a good example. So this is an example uh, Kiwi app. So you can see that we've gone and written or they've gone and written class test app and then they're passing through app and then they're using the build function. So again, we're doing, we're pretty much following that structure as well. Cool, but that is the beginnings of our app now done. So written class cam app in caps and then we're passing through the app class that we imported from right up here with a colon and then we've written def build and then we're passing through this ourselves. So the self object colon and then pass at the moment we're not actually doing anything here but we are in a second and then we're just setting up our run so this is just going to make it cleaner and ensure that we run successfully so if underscore underscore name underscore underscore equals equals underscore underscore main underscore underscore quote colon then we're going to run our cam app so we're going to run cam or so capital c a m capital a p p dot run so if we actually go and test this out now the way that you actually run this app is just make sure you're in the same folder. So what we need to do is run uh, Python base ID .py. Now we we don't actually have our app actually doing anything at the moment, but this is effectively what's going to run once we've got that running all successfully. So again, nothing's going to open up because we don't actually have anything running, but it doesn't look like we've got any errors just yet. So it looks like we're all good. Well, okay, so we do have a bit of an error, but that's perfectly fine. We're going to get to that in a second. So what we now need to do is finish building up our build function. So let's go on ahead and do a little bit more there. Okay, so those are the beginnings of our layout components now written. So we've gone and written three additional lines of code there plus one comment. So really, this is going to form the base structure of our app. We're going to have an image at the top, which is really going to be our real-time webcam feed. We're then going to have a button, which we click to go and verify. And then we're going to have a label at the bottom, which basically tells us either the verification hasn't started, it's completed and you're unverified or it's completed and you are verified so let's actually take a look at these so we've got three different objects so we've written self.image1 so this is going to be our main image and we could actually make this image but i'm just mindful that we might have certain classes that uh, use image and then we've actually gone and used our image class from up here and we've passed through one keyword argument which is size hint and we've set that equal to the full width but 0.8 worth of the horizontal height so basically, this is sort of saying setting the dynamic layouts of each one of these components. So our image is going to take the majority or 80% of our vertical height. Then we've set our button. So self.button equals button. And remember, this is going to be importing from the button class up here. And we've gone and passed through two keyword arguments. So we've gone and set our text equal to verify. And what we're going to need to do eventually is set the on press function to be able to run a certain function. But because we haven't defined that function yet, we're not going to do that. We'll come back to that. So we've written text and then we've set that equal to verify. So our button is actually going to say verify. And then we've set our size hint equal to one. So the full width, but only 10% of the height. So we've got one and then comma dot or point one. And so remember with our image, we set our size hint to one comma point eight inside of a set of braces, which means it's a tuple we're passing through. Our size hint for our button is going to be one comma point one. Cool. So really just think of this as text and then how big or dynamically how big you want that button to be. And then we've set our verification. So this is going to be our text, which actually tells us whether or not we're verified or not. So I've set that equal to a variable called verification. So we've set self.verification equal to a label, which is from right up here. So we set, remember, our three 
core UX components, so image, button, and label. We're using them right here, image, button, and label. So again, we've gone and set two keyword arguments for our label class. We've set text equal to verification uninitiated. This is going to be what it starts off as, right? So eventually, once we go and trigger our verification, you'll actually see that it goes verified or unverified. But for now, we are going to set it to verification uninitiated and we've set our size hint to one and then comma 0.1. So there's just a couple of additional lines that we need to write before we can actually kick this off and see some stuff. So let's go on ahead and write that up. But first up, just I guess to recap there, we've gone and created three new components. So an image, a button and a label. And these are going to show up in our app in concert uh, in sequential order. So we'll see our image first, which will eventually be our webcam feed, then a button, then a label. All right, let's go and finish this up and at least test this layout out. Okay, so that is our layout now pretty much done. So I think this is the shell of our app now effectively set up. So I wrote an additional five different lines of code there. So first up, I've written layout. I've created a new variable called layout, and I've set that equal to box layout. So remember how I was describing right at the start that we had this box layout uh, class, which basically either gave us a horizontal layout or a vertical layout. So we've gone and set that to vertical. So our objects are going to appear in sequential order from the top down. So we've gone and written layout equals box layout and we've set orientation equal to vertical. And then we've just gone and added our three widgets. So keep in mind right now we've created these uh, UX components, so image button and label, but we haven't actually added them to our layout. So this is akin to um, creating a module in Python, but not actually importing it into your notebook. So we've created these UX objects, but we haven't actually added them to our Kivi layout. And that is exactly what we do here using the add widget method. So I've written layout dot add widget and then we're passing through self dot image one. So it's coming from up there. So it's going to be our image and then layout dot add widget. And then we're passing through self dot button. So we're adding our button to our layout and then layout dot add widget. And then we're passing through self dot verification, which is going to be our verification text. So I think based on this, we could probably actually try starting this up and see what we actually get. So let's try running Python. Now let's clear this. So it's a little bit clearer. So we're going to run Python and then Base ID dot pi. Let's see if that opens up successfully. And we've got, um, so run is missing one positional argument self. Oh, we've actually gone and defined this. This should actually be the actual class. So I've gone and uh, missed out a set of parentheses there. So let's actually try that again. So before we had no parentheses there, and I was wondering why it wasn't actually working, but we actually need a set of parentheses down here because otherwise we're just referring to the class. We're not referring to our particular instance. Cool. Or we're not creating a new instance. So let's actually go and try that. That's looking positive. And there you go. So that is our base layout. So it looks kind of shitty right now, but that's perfectly fine. We're going to add our webcam in a second, but you can see that we've got our button. Let me zoom in on this so you can see it a bit better. So this is eventually going to be where our image or our webcam feed is going to be. We've got our verify button and we've got our label down the bottom, which says verification uninitiated. So we can click our button, but right now it's not doing anything because we haven't actually hooked anything up to it. But that is our base layout now done. So we've got our verify button and we've got verification uninitiated. So if we actually close this, it's going to stop everything down. Now, just to prove to you how this sort of widget layout works. So if we actually went and sub these around, so say we put the button below verification. Let's actually see what that does to our layout. All right, so let's try running that again. All right, so you can see that our text is now above our button, right? That actually kind of looks better than what I had, but that, that sort of gives you an idea as to how this actually works. So the layout is in a sequential order. So the way that you add the widgets are going to determine how our layout actually forms. Let's actually add it back. I wonder if hot reload will actually pick this up. No, it's not going to pick it up. That's perfectly fine. So we're going to shut it down. And if we rerun it again, you can see that our order will be back to normal. So it'll be image button and then label. So image button and then label. Cool. That is the beginnings of our layout now successfully done. So what is that? So we've actually gone and done step seven. Now done. 
Pretty cool, right? So that is our, the beginnings of our layout. Now, the next thing that we actually need to do is actually set up a feed from our webcam. So at the moment, you saw that we had that sort of blank area at the top for our webcam, but it's not actually doing anything as of yet. Well, what we need to do is we need to set up OpenCV to be able to grab our webcam and then we need to refresh that image so that we're not, well, we're effectively looping through and continuously reading the feed from our webcam. And that is effectively what we are now going to go on ahead and do. Okay, so first up, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a capture inside of our build function. So this is going to be from OpenCV. So let's go on ahead and do that. And then we need to go and create an update function that basically we use to update our feed. So let's first up go and set up our capture. And this is really no different to how you'd go and set up a video capture device when you're working with OpenCV. So let's do it. Okay, so that is our video capture device now at least initiated. So I've written self.capture and I've set that equal to cv2.video capture and I've set video device for. Now you might need to play around with this depending on which device your webcam is. I say it all the time um, and I'm currently working on an OpenCV series to show you guys how to actually determine what that number is. But on my machine, it's going to be four. Um, if you have no other webcam devices apart from your main webcam on your machine, then it's probably going to be the video de capture device zero. But you might need to play around with this in order to get your webcam feed up. So I'm going to set it to four, but I might also, if I didn't have any other devices on my machine, I'd probably set it to zero um, to make sure that I actually get a feed. If you get something returned back, which sort of says like CVT is empty or uh, CV2.empty or CV2 issue, having issues with I am right, it's probably because either your webcam is unavailable or you've got your video capture device number set incorrectly. Okay, so now that that is done, we actually need to do something to actually update and read our feed from our webcam. So if we're actually going to need to use our clock function or our clock class to go and set a schedule to continuously run this function. But first up, let's actually go and define it. Okay, so I've gone and set up a new function called update. So this is going to run continuously, run continuously to get webcam feed. So there I've written def update, and then I'm passing through two positional arguments. I've written self, and then we're going to unpack all of the other arguments that are passed to it. So really it's just def update, and then we're passing through self, and then asterisk args. Then I'm closing out the function and I've passed through a colon and at the moment I've just set that equal to pass. So if I actually went and ran this right now, you wouldn't actually see anything different. So again, to run it, we just run Python and then face id.py from that folder. So if we're going to take a look at this, it's really going to be no different. Right? So right now that we haven't actually done anything. So we're not actually one rendering our image to our layout. And two, we're not actually running this update function as of yet. So we need to go and first up write this update function and what it's going to do. And then we actually need to trigger it from up here. So let's go on and start writing up this update function. Okay, so the next two lines that I've written are basically going to read our frame from OpenCV. So I've written ret, comma, frame, and these, these are really just sort of standard OpenCV lines. And if you actually take a look inside of our Jupyter Notebook, we would have written this inside of our real-time test. So exactly the same as what we've got up here. Nothing crazy. Uh, we actually don't have the last channel, so if I do that, pretty much identical then. Okay, so that is basically reading in our frame from OpenCV. So I've written ret, comma, frame equals self dot capture dot read. So this is grabbing our capture device from up here and it's reading the frame. And this is going to return two things, a return value and the actual frame as a NumPy array. Then we're setting, we're cutting down our frame. So rather than having the full, what is it? Uh, 480 by 640 pixels, we're actually going to cut it down and be 250 by 250 which is effectively what this slicing is doing here. So I've written 120 colon 120 plus 250. So we're effectively going to start, never remember whether or not it's height or width first. So I think um, 120 is going to be the shorter. So that's going to be height. So we're effectively going to be grabbing 250 pixels from our height. And then we're going to grab 250 pixels from our width. So we're cutting down the image. So we've only got a little square box. So 120 colon 120 plus 250 comma 200 colon 200 plus 250 comma and then colon to grab all of our channels. 
Cool, that is our frame now captured. Now again, we could run this, but we're not gonna see anything to the screen. So what we need to do is actually go and update this image from over here so we can actually see it. So that's effectively what we're gonna do now. So let's wrap this up and then we're actually gonna set up and trigger this update function. Okay, so that is effectively going to go and apply our image texture to our image from up here. Now, I'm really not happy with calling this image um, image one, so I'm actually going to call it self.webcam. So we're going to change that up there. And what we also need to do if we're doing that is we need to change that down here. So let's actually, so what I actually went and did is I went and re rewrote to self instead of self.image one, I've written self.webcam. So let's actually change that web. Yeah, that makes more sense. Cool. All right. So rather than that being image one, that's now going to be webcam. All right. Then let's actually take a look at the four lines of code that we wrote down here. So I've written buff equals cv2.flip. And then we're passing through our frame and specifying zero. So this is going to flip our image horizontally and we're going to convert it to a string. Then what we're doing is we're actually commencing the conversion of our image to an image texture. So this is basically just a format that I realized I had to go and convert it into so that we can get our frame to show up. So uh, basically there's a bunch of arguments, but it effectively allows you to convert this image into a texture. So let's actually take a look at that. So I'm going to open up the doco texture. And it is this. So, uh, so the texture is a class that handles open, open GL textures, depending on the hardware some Opal, uh, OpenGL texture, <laughs> depending on the hardware, uh, some OpenGL capabilities might not be available, blah, blah, blah. So basically what we're doing is we're actually converting our image to this texture and it's pretty much what you can see down here. So this allows us to actually see um, this image on our screen and we do use this blit buffer function. So this actually converts our or can we first up convert our image into a buffer and then we effectively render it as a texture the full line of code or next couple of lines of code that we've written is image underscore texture equals texture dot create and then we're setting that or we're passing through a two keyword arguments so we specified size and then to that we're passing through our frame height and width so frame dot shape one comma frame dot shape zero and we're setting that inside of a tuple and then we're passing through a keyword argument called color format and we're setting that to BGR because that is the way that OpenCV actually brings in an image. And we've got a error there. I don't think that's wrong. Expected expression. I think this is actually should be fine. I remove that. What are we getting? Okay. Yeah, sorry. No, we actually did have a second one because I added it in there. Okay, that's fine. And then the, so then what we're doing is we're converting this OpenCV buffer, which we had over here. So remember we set that equal to buff and we're actually applying our OpenCV image and converting it into a texture. So that is effectively what we're doing. We're taking our image, we're converting it into a texture so that we can render it inside of our app. So then we're using image underscore texture and then we're using the blit buffer method, which I just showed. And we're passing through this OpenCV uh, string function or string value that we had from over here to this blit buffer method. So we're grabbing this, we're passing it through to blit buffer. Then we're setting color format equal to BGR again and buffer format equal to U byte. Then what we're doing is we're actually grabbing our webcam object, which was all the way up here and we're converting or we're setting the texture for that equal to image texture so again it's a long-winded base process really but what we're doing is we're getting our image we're flipping it horizontally we're converting it into a texture and then we're setting our webcam image object from up here equal to that texture so basically it's a long-winded way to be able to effectively render our image in real time okay now that that's done what we can go on ahead and do is i'm a little bit concerned that we've got an error there expected square bracket why i don't know we'll leave it we'll come back to that if we get any errors so now that that's done 
we still need to actually go and run this update function. And this is where our clock class is going to come in. So let's go on ahead and do this. Okay, I think that is pretty much it done for our real time feed. So I've gone and written one line there. So I've written clock dot schedule interval. So think of this as um, triggering off a loop, but basically it's going to tell our app to go and run a certain thing every X number of periods. So I've written clock dot schedule underscore interval, and then we've set that equal to self dot update. So we're actually running this function on this interval. So clock dot schedule underscore interval. And then inside of that, the first argument is self dot update. So what is it that we actually want to run? So it's going to be our update method. And then we're specifying how frequently we actually want to run that. So if we actually go and take a look at our schedule interval function, so schedule interval. You can see that this is going to be so schedule an event to be called every x seconds so it says timeout seconds but it's basically how frequently we actually want to go on ahead and run this so we are going to be running it once or 33 times every second so that's 1.0 and then backwards slash 33 divided by zero so basically it's going to keep running and ideally mimic what you'd expect to see with the human eye okay that's a lot of work to be able to get a real-time webcam feed so it is a little bit tricky with kivi but Basically, we've gone and defined this huge update function and we've gone and defined our video capture devices. So all things holding equal, still a little bit concerned about this while we're getting an error there. Pretty sure it should be fine, but that's fine. Let's go and test it out. So I'm just going to clear this. That's so a little bit cleaner. So we are going to run Python face ID dot pi. We're still getting that error. Why? Oh, because we're not actually grabbing an object. This should be frame. There we go. All right. All right. So if we go and so basically I was, <laughs> I was slicing nothing, which is why it's throwing, it's saying, Hey, we expected a square brackets, but right now we don't actually have anything in there. Cause it's actually telling us convert that into an array, but we don't want to convert that into an array. We want to slice our array. So if I type in frame, that is going to fix that up. All right, let's go and run this now. All right. Fingers crossed. Let's see if that works. Oh my God, it's working. So you can see that we now have our webcam feed. So that's my little head in there. And you can see that we actually have our real web time or real webcam feed or real time webcam feed now appearing inside of our Kivi app. So that, I know it was a lot of work to be able to get that, but you can see that the speed is pretty quick. We've got our face there. And this is akin to what you might have when you're using like face ID on your iPhone. So that is very good so we've now got that successfully running so i know we can bask in the glory we've got this up and running we it's pretty much it like honestly guys that was successful <laughs> no we're not going to stop there so let's go on ahead and close this let's go back to it do all right so we have now successfully gone and done that so we've gone and built up our update function and we've gone and let's actually say uh and render webcam so a lot of effort to go on ahead and do that but basically what we did in that section is we went and first up set up our capture device to be able to go and get our webcam we then went and wrote this huge update function which is basically oh, it's not huge uh, which is basically reading our webcam feed it's slicing down our image so that we've only got 250 by 250 pixels we're then converting our OpenCV array which is an image into a buffer and then we're apply and then we're converting it to a texture and then we're actually rendering that to this webcam object from over here and then we're triggering it we're using the schedule interval function to be able to go and trigger our update function so it's in real time okay that's a lot now the next thing that we need to do is what so we now need to bring over our pre-processing function so remember we need to pre-process our image before we pass it to our tensorflow model so that is what we're going to go on ahead and do and it just so happens that we can just grab this out of our Jupyter Notebook. So the pre-process function is towards the beginning, I think. Where do we do this? This was probably during the data engineering bit. Mm, pre-process twin should be close. Pre-process, we need this. So we're just going to copy this and we are going to paste it into our app. And we're going to tab that in. Cool. That is our pre-process function now brought in. So uh, we could clean this up a little bit, but I'm not going to bother. But basically we've written, we've copied in 
the function that we defined in step 3.2 so that meant it would have been in episode 3 where we basically go and pre-process our image from a file path now the reason that we're going to use this is when we go and perform our loop we're going to pick up our images from a file path we're going to pre-process it then pass it to our model but that is that step now done so again pretty straightforward so we grabbed our pre-process function and dumped it inside so if i just zoom out a bit because we've got a lot in here so by now inside of our cam app class we should have three different methods so we've got the build method which is our base method we've then got our update method which is running every uh, one over 33 seconds to be able to update our webcam and then we've got the pre-process method which is what we're going to use in a second so we can save that let's go back to our to-do so we've now gone and done step nine zoom back in okay then the next thing that we need to do is bring over our verification function so let's go on ahead and grab that as well i'm just going to say uh let's actually add a comment here so this is going to be used so our pre-process function is going to be used to load image from file and convert to 100 by 100 pixels okay now the next thing that we're going to do is bring over our verification function so bring over verification function we're almost there guys we're, we're getting close now so let's go on ahead and grab that so that is towards the bottom so after that it's after step six wow we wrote a lot of code for this didn't we uh okay so it's over here so we need this verify function over here so i'm going to copy that and i'm going to paste that in here let's tab this in okay so that is let's that's a terrible comment so verification function to verify person okay so what we now need to do is let's save that looks like we've got a few errors so these are easily solved we'll come back to that in a second so that is our verification function now done so we can set that to done now let's quickly take a look at that verification function because we've already got a few errors and this is because it is asking to pre-process our or use that pre-process function but we don't actually have that defined because we need to type in self dot self dot pre-process and self dot pre-process and we are still having errors and that is because we need to pass through self over here oh and we also need to pass through self over here that's why okay cool sorry that's my bad so the reason that we're getting errors is we're not actually passing through our current class to our verify function so as soon as we add self there we should be good to go okay so there's not much left to do now so what we want to do is we are going to we effectively need to just ensure that we save down an image from our webcam because remember when we had our loop previously we effectively took a snapshot from our webcam we then saved it into this path over here so application data and then input image and then input image.jpg so we need to ensure that we save our current image into that folder as well so what we're going to do is do exactly that and then we should effectively be able to go on ahead and build this we also need to load our current model so we've got this we can actually probably remove these yeah let's just make sure we can handle any args and then what we're going to do is we're actually going to set our detection threshold uh, let's set that to like 0 0.5 as per usual uh, what was the other one verification threshold so these are going to be the metrics that we use to determine how tight we want our detections to be so we're going to set those first um, specify specify thresholds and then what we need to do is capture input image from our webcam and we're going to specify our save path i'm going to set that equal to this so effectively what we're going to do is we're going to capture a real-time feed from our webcam we're going to save it into this folder which is going to be application underscore data input underscore image and then input underscore image dot jpg so if we actually go in uh, actually we don't even need to do that we can go from here so if we go an application data input image and we're going to effectively replace this image so that's what we copied over from our existing what was it from our existing code inside of our Jupyter notebook so we're effectively going to be replacing that so 
let's finish writing out the code to actually go on ahead and save our image from our real-time webcam into that file path. Okay, I think that is looking good. So we've just gone and written uh, pretty much replicated what we had from up here in our update function to be able to save out our image. So I've written ret comma frame equals self dot capture dot read. And then we're effectively reshaping our image to be in the shape of 250 by 250. And then we're going to be writing that out to our save path. Now keep in mind that we've still got a couple of things that we need to handle, right? So right down here, so we took out the existing arguments from our verify function, and now we're getting this error over here, which is saying model.predict is having errors. And this is because we haven't actually gone and reloaded our model now that we've taken it out of our function. So what we actually need to do to solve that is we're actually going to load our model inside of our build function. So I'm just going to set this to, let's actually go to our build function and load that in first. So under our layout, I'm going to say load Keras model, the TensorFlow Keras model. And we're effectively just going to load our model. So we're going to create a new variable called self.model and we're going to set that equal to how we actually load up our Keras model. So let's go on ahead and do that. Okay, so that is our model now loaded. So I've written one line there. So I've written self.model equals tf.keras.models dot load underscore model so that's actually going to load up our model from our h5 file so we've written load underscore model and then siamese model dot h5 and then we're passing through our custom objects so custom underscore objects and then inside of squiggly brackets or inside of a dictionary we're specifying l1 dist or the l1 dist key oh don't screw that we're setting that equal to l1 dist or the l1 distance layer that we had from up here so that is our model now loaded. Now, if we go back down to our function over here, inside of this line here, which it says result, we can change that to self.model.predict. Cool. I think that is looking good. So wait, hold on. We've got one more thing to do. So we haven't actually gone and updated our verification label, right? So if we take a look, remember we had this verification label here. We actually want to output whether or not we've successfully verified or not. Let's actually quickly take a look at our to-do list. So um, update verification function to handle new paths and save current frame. So we've done that. We just did that there. So that is effectively what we did here. So when somebody goes and clicks verify, this is going to trigger. So we're going to go on ahead and save our image from our current frame. So we're going to run self.capture.read get the current frame from our webcam. We're then going to cut it down and we're going to save it inside of this safe file path. So we should effectively see our input image change every time we hit verify. But what we actually also want to do is we want to update this verification text. So it goes from verification uninitiated to something else, right? And that is effectively what we're going to do down here. And then we should be kind of done. What else do we have to do? Oh, we are up to, we're actually up to that step. So update verification function to set verified text. And then we need to specify, link the verification function to the button. Yeah, we've got to do that as well. Okay, cool. So let's do the text bit first. So let's go on ahead and do it. Okay, that is our verification text now done. So we are going and effectively updating our verification object. Hold on, wait. We are overriding this object over here. So this is no good. We got to change that. So this over here, we're going to change this. So if I leave it as it is, but, uh, we're actually updating... This might work. Let's actually just be play it on the safe side. So I'm just going to convert this object here to be verification text. And I'm going to set this. Actually, let's say verification label. And verification label over here. So I don't know if you saw what my error was there. But basically, we've got from our existing verification function, we've already got a variable called verification. So rather than have overlap, even though we're getting this one from our object, I'd rather keep it nice and clean. So I'm just going to change this to verification label. 
And remember our verification function is going to return back this verification value here. And this is whether or not um, our detection is actually passing our certain threshold. So what we actually wanna do is we don't wanna go and overwrite this verification object. We wanna set our verification label equal to verified if that verification comes back as true. Otherwise we wanna set that label to unverified if it's false, right? So I don't want to go and overwrite that label. Hence, what we did is right up back in here inside of our build function, we've gone and converted that verification object for, to be called verification. And we've converted that over to verification underscore label. So that should be okay. And then down here, what we're doing is we're setting self dot verification underscore label dot text equal to verified. If verification comes back as true, add a space there, else we're going to set it to unverified. So... We go and save that now. I think there's only one last thing to do. So that is done. Two more things. And so the last thing that we actually need to do to test it out is to link this verification function to the button. So what we need to do is go right back up to our build function and inside of this self.button class here, what or variable or object in this case, what we're gonna do is we're gonna set on press equal to uh what is it so self.verify then yep so we're going to be setting it running that so it's going to be uh self where are we typing this delete that so right up here inside of our build function we're going to set self.button equal to self.verify we need to run that class oh that's fine cool all righty i think that is good to go all right we wrote a lot of code there without running, so it'd be interesting to see if this works. So let's run it. Looks like it's successfully loading our model down here. Okay, so no errors yet. Let's see if this runs. I've clicked our button, looks like stuff's happening down the bottom. Okay, and that said unverified. Okay, that is perfectly fine. But that is good. So what we're actually getting now is it looks like our verification function is actually running. So if I go back into the screen a little bit more, what about if I did it from here? Make sure that our new image is being writing or being written out. We're going to D drive and then uh, where are we? So YouTube, face ID, app. And then application data. And if we take a look at our input image, okay, so that is good. So our input image is being written out. Unfortunately, it looks like we're unverified. But if we take the green screen down. So if I go and run that. Okay, so we've got a new input image. We can see that that's saving. Still coming back unverified. New image. Okay, so that one said verified. Take a look. Verified again. Put my hand up. Unverified. Unverified. Verified. Oh man. It's working. How good is that? So if we try it again. Oh, it's a bit blurry. We'll see if that works. Unverified. Verified. Of our face. Unverified. Verified. Success, guys. That is your very own face ID app that is now successfully running. Now, I wanted to show you guys a little bit. Let's actually test it out a little bit more. So what happens if we put another person's face up against... Well, if Mike was away. What happens if we actually put somebody else's face up against this? So if I went and got... Jim Carrey, my guy. Let's try this. So if I go and put the glare's a little bit much. We verify against, all right, Jim's unverified. Um, let's try someone else. Robin Williams. Try that. Come on, focus. Oh gosh.
Oh, it's verified Robin Williams. That's terrible. Okay. Okay, so now it said Robin Williams is unverified. Weird. That's me verified against the green screen. Huh, I wonder why it wasn't working before. Still verified. Hand up. Verified again. Interesting. I wonder if this is going a little screwy. All right, so see here, now we're sort of getting un slightly less reliable results. Let's try dropping the green screen. The hand up. Unverified. Hand away. Verified. Hand up. Unverified. Hand away. Now we're unverified. Come on, verify. Okay, that's verified. All right, so we need to play around with this a little bit more. But you can see here that sometimes we're getting good results. Other times we're maybe not getting such great results. And this is ideally where you want to have some logging set up so that you can actually see how well or not well your model is actually performing because you might need to tweak those detection metrics, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to close this down. I'm going to show you how to log out some data. So let's actually go into our verify function and we're actually going to use our logger method which is well this is step 13 now done we've successfully verified guys i know it's taken a long time but we got there first thing to do is set up our logger so we can actually see what proportion of detections are over a certain threshold so let's actually go and do this so inside of our verify function we're going to use our logger to log out some metrics Okay, so those are two lines that I've written for our log. So I've written logger.info, and to that we're going to be passing through our results, which we get from over here. And this is from our existing verification function. And then I've also started to calculate a couple of metrics. So basically this line here is determining how many of our results are actually surpassing the 50% threshold. So I've written logger underscore, actually this is not written right. Yeah, this should be like this. Like that my bad so this is actually going and calculating what proportion of results are actually surpassing our 50 percent confidence threshold so i've written logger.info and then inside of that we've got our results which is inside of a numpy array and we're specifying what proportion of those results are greater than 0 0.5 which is 50 percent and then we're summing those all together so we'll have the number of results that surpass that threshold so what we can also do is just throw out a couple extra of these and let's uh, let's actually make a couple more thresholds. So let's say 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, and 0.8. Now, if we go and run this again, we can actually get some additional info as to how well our face ID model is actually working. So when you actually run the logger, you're actually going to see the output inside of the console. So this is much nicer if you're a developer actually building this up rather than having um, this actually showing to your user, you can actually just have it sort of inside of your log. Or if you wanted to actually go and log it out, it's going to look a whole lot nicer than actually showing it back to your user. Um, so also with the Kiwi app, it's resizable, right? So if we wanted to make it a little bit tighter, we definitely could. So that looks a little bit better right there. Okay, so let's go ahead and test it out. So if I go and drop it down here, drop a low girl. Right, so we can see what proportion of our detections are showing up there. So 50, how many images do we have in our, inside of our verification folder? Oh, so this is saying 50 over 50, 50 over 50. Pretty much all of them are actually being matched. Kind of crazy given we've got a green background. Let's see about Robin. All right, so we're here, we're getting 42, 38, 37, which is what, wait, hold on, this is coming back unverified now. Input image, so we're getting Robin. What was our detection threshold? So we had 50%, 50%, so 37 would surpass 50. That should come back 
I would have thought that should come back with verified. But it's good. I mean, it's coming back with unverified. Let's see it again. Focus. All right, let's see that. Okay, unverified. So this is basically saying that 32 out of the 31, it's getting 32 out of 31 matches. So if we go and bump this up higher, that seems a little bit weird. So let's say the 80, the verification threshold, rather than being 50%, let's set it to, um, I don't know, 80%. Let's try Robin again. Let's restart our app. And this is some of the tuning that you'd ultimately have to do, guys, as you're building one of these models. So keep in mind that once you train your model, it doesn't end there. You got to have to re. Normally, you want to have to be retraining this. All right, so that is centered ish. Uh, all right, let's see now. Okay, so now we're getting less. So again, he's unverified. What about ourselves? Okay, so we are way more accurate over here, right? This is not making sense. So we're getting 47. So what proportion are surpassing 80%? So we are getting unverified back. So these are our results. So we can actually see these down here. So we are getting pretty good detection metrics. But our text down here is still saying unverified. So we are getting some ones that are super low. So take a look at that, 0.09. But the majority is still pretty good. So I wonder if we've got some issues with our detection threshold. So let's try that again. I wonder if it's delayed a little bit. Still unverified, still unverified. What if we drop the green screen? So unverified. And this is because we've gone and bumped up what? Our detection threshold. Hmm. But down here, we're saying that we're still getting 44% surpassing the 80% threshold, which would indicate. So, what is this actually doing? So, it's going verification equals detection divided by how many images we've got inside of here. I would have thought that this would have come back as true. So if we actually go and drop this back down. So this is some of the stuff that you might need to play with. I mean, ultimately it works. It's just uh, fine tuning how accurate our model actually is. Verify now. So now we're getting un. Uh, do we change this back? So we are at what is what's our detection threshold? Our detection threshold right now is at fifty percent, and our verification threshold is also at fifty percent. But we are saying down here that our the proportion of results that are above zero point two, and we're summing them. So this, I've got a feeling we've got something incorrect over here. So this is saying np.sum. Let's log out our detection. So logger.info and detection. So our detection is going to return back the number of results that surpass our detection threshold from up here. So let's go and check this out. I mean, it works. I'm just, uh, I want to make sure that we get this right. Right, so if we hit verify, ideally we should get the number that is being used to calculate the metric. So that is saying 47, right? So this is 47. Does that say verified? Unverified. Verified if verif so verification equals detection divided by the length of the number of images. So 47 divided by 50. So print out verification. And 
let's delete this. We don't need that. And let's print out verified logo.info. Print out verified. And so this is the advantage of having your logo, right? You can actually output and tune these models. So rather than just leaving it there, you can actually go and fine tune and actually see where stuff is going right and maybe where it's not going so right. So here, what I'm actually doing is I'm actually logging out the detection value, the verification value, and then whether or not we're getting verified back. So let's see. So if we go and run this now, we should get back those three metrics. Okay, so we had 43 detections, which surpassed our verification threshold. And we are getting 86% and we're getting back the value true. And it's saying I'm verified. All right, so we do have a bug there. So verification. Guys, here it is. So this should actually be verified. So rather than this value here being verification, this should actually be verified. So if self.verification underscore label dot text equals verify, or basically we're specifying if verified equals true, then return verified, else return unverified. So this was verification first, which would actually return a detection value divided by that. So it's not actually returning kind of weird that it will getting verification then. Hmm. I don't know. Let's go run this. And that is the advantage of using the logger. You can actually find out where stuff is going right or wrong. If we go and verify with a blurry image. All right. So now we're verified. Cool. And we're saying that we had 50% surpassing the threshold. We had a hundred percent verified so we now are true so if we go and put my hand in front of it let's see All right so that's still uh surpassing i think we need to bump this up significantly so our detection threshold let's set that to i don't know 80 percent let's try that again Okay, so we're getting verified. What happens? Put my hand up. We're still getting verified there, all right? So we might need a little bit of fine tuning. That's perfectly fine. Go and put our face. All right, so that's going up. Kind of weird that when you put your hand up, it's still saying you're verified. All right, let's try somebody else. Try old Robin, old mate Robin. It's verifying against Robin Williams. No, that is not acceptable. So we got to bump this up. So let's say a threshold could actually be 90. So what are we getting back? We're getting back very accurate results down here. So if we actually set this to 0.99, let's see how that works. Kind of weird that it's verifying against him appropriately. All right, so that's us verified and we are getting back all of our positive results that are surpassing it. Let's try Jim. I don't know, maybe Robin <laughs> Williams is able to bypass that threshold. And it's saying that Jim Carrey is verified. getting 0.99 there is something not going quite right here so that input image is saying that we are verified wait hold on where are we running this from hmm. let's bump up our thresholds again All right, so that's me verified. What about Jim? Okay, so Jim is unverified. So I've gone and set the thresholds really, really high now. 
So our detection threshold is 0.99 and our verification threshold is 0.8. So if I go and do myself, we are verified. If I go and do Jim, uh, Jim is unverified. Okay, so in this particular case, we had to set our detection threshold super high to ensure we didn't let Jim in. But in a nutshell, that is our Kivi Face ID app now done, guys. So again, you might need to do some tuning with your detection thresholds and verification thresholds. So I've gone and set it super, super high. So basically our detection threshold is 0.99 and our verification threshold is 0.8. Now keep in mind what you could also do to hedge against any of these types of issues is you could have way more images inside of that verification folder so that you get a better chance of busting out anybody that's trying to break in versus letting people who aren't necessarily verified through to your app. But in a nutshell, that is our app now done. You could also go and train your model a ton more as well. So we can say that our logger is now done. So we've gone and done a ton of stuff, guys. So we went and imported all of our Kiwi stuff. We built our camera app. We went and wrote our update function, wrote in our pre-process function and update our verified function. And I sort of showed you how to tune um, this detection threshold as well. So remember the logger is super important and it allows you to see what your detection results actually are like. And in this case, you don't want to let Jim Carrey or Robin Williams through. So you want to ensure that you set these appropriately. So the metrics that I ended up with were a detection threshold of 0.99 and a verification threshold of 0.8. So again, we could set this even higher if we wanted to. We could even add more images into our verification folder. But on that note, that about does wrap it up. Hold it right there. So while this model and this application worked, it was far from perfect. You saw that Robin Williams was able to bypass our verification. So after two and a bit hours of recording this tutorial, I went off to Korean barbecue and really thought about what we could do to improve this model. Now I'm gonna walk you through exactly what I did to achieve significantly superior performance. Alrighty guys, so you saw in V1 of the model, we had a little bit of an error, right? So this image was being verified as being positive. This image was also being verified. Now, as a business user, you'd probably take a look at this and go, hey, the value of this particular model isn't that high because it's letting someone that shouldn't be verified actually through to our model. Now, what I ended up doing is taking a look at how we could actually improve this model. So I sort of went through my standard process. Normally, I try to add more data, apply data augmentation, train for longer and see if that improves it. If not, then we could also do a little bit extra in terms of changing our model architecture, maybe doing some additional pre-processing and going from there. But in this case, I wanna take you through what I did to significantly improve the performance of this model. So if we jump back into our code, and again, this is the standard code that we actually wrote as part of our Siamese neural network series. Now I did a couple of key things, but namely they revolved around data augmentation. So what I actually went and did is I went and augmented our existing positive and anchor data to be able to produce significantly more data. So this meant that rather than training on 300 images, we trained on 3000. I also went and improved our performance and logging metrics. So you could actually see what our precision recall and act, no, just our precision and recall would actually look like. So let's actually take a step by step and see what changed in this code. So I'm going to zoom in a little so you can see that a bit better. So if I scroll on down, the first change comes uh, right about here in section, what is that? Section two. So what I went and did is for every single image inside of the positive and anchor class, I went and applied data augmentation. So I defined this new function here called data org. And for every single image inside of our anchor class, I went and looped nine times. So this would mean that for every anchor and positive image, we would now have 10 times as many images, including the, the one that we already had there. So we had nine additional images for every single image we had in there originally. And I went and applied, what is that? Five different random data augmentations. So I went and applied random brightness, random contrast, random flip left and right. So this would flip the image left or right. So the brightness is obviously going to improve or increase the brightness or decrease the brightness. The random contrast would increase the contrast or decrease the contrast. This would flip it left or right. Um, random JPEG quality would improve or degrade the quality of the JPEG image that we actually had. And random saturation would actually change the saturation. So went and did all of those different data augmentations. So five lines of code, There's this one was commented out. I think I actually got rid of the crop because it was a bit too much. 
So that gave us nine different images. And down here, this is actually redundant code. This is just part of my testing, but you can see this is what I actually would go and do for a real model. So I went and tested on a single image to see what the impact of this data augmentation would actually be. Let's actually test that, see if it works. Uh, we need to import OS. Uh, and we need to define ANC path, which was right up here. I didn't prep to run this for you guys, but uh, I sort of wanted to show you. We haven't imported anything. Let's test this and data org is not defined. So if we run that, All right? So this would actually go through and we need to import UUID. Right, so this would actually go through and create another nine images. So if I actually go into my anchor path now, I just created new images. If I go into YouTube and uh, where are we? Face ID, uh, applicate, you nope, know, in data, anchor. So if I take a look at data that we just created. So today is the 24th of the 10th. So you can see, I just went and created all of these images here. So by running through our data, through our data augmentation, so you can see that that one, I don't know what's happened there. So you can see they've got varying levels of quality, right? This, like you can see the striations. I don't know if you can see it through YouTube's video, but you can see that that's getting significantly worse. That one's got a flip applied. That one's got a flip applied. That one's got a flip applied again. And you can see significantly degraded performance in that image. And again, so that's even worse, right? So this is reducing the quality of our image so that our model at least has a better chance of generalizing and performing well. So that was all of the data that I went and ended up producing. And you can actually see right down here, let me zoom in. There's 4,899 different images. So before we started off with 300, now we had 4,800 in our anchor folder and in our no, negative, we didn't do anything positive. We now had 3,320. So a ton of different images. So if you actually scroll, you can see that we had this is probably our original quality image or not even. That's probably our original quality image. And you can see that we've gone and applied flips. We've gone and applied additional data augmentation to actually produce more data to actually go and train on. So that was the key change, right? And this significantly improved model performance. So if you actually go through, what I went and did is loop through every single image inside of our anchor path. And then I switched this over to our positive path, buzz path, and swap that out there, that out there, and that out there. So that basically gave us significantly more data to actually go and train on. Then I went and brought that data into our data set. So before this would have previously been 300 over here. So we only had 300 images per data set. I boosted that up significantly to 3000 images. So we now had significantly more data to actually go on, on ahead and train. And then I went and trained. So if we scroll on down, I didn't change any of this. Oh, actually, no, I changed this. So I changed the shuffle buffer size because what I actually noticed is that when we had a significantly larger buffer, we needed to up this buffer size so that we appropriately buffered our, appropriately shuffled our data set. So I bumped that up as well to buffer size 10,000. And then the final change was really the training loop. So again, no changes there, no changes there. And right down here, I actually updated this training loop. So first up, I imported our precision and recall a little bit earlier on, and I actually set it up. So remember when we were training, we didn't actually have loss or performance metrics, which is kind of a no-no because you don't really know how well your model is performing and whether or not it's gone completely off the deep end. So this significantly improves the ability to log out our precision and our recall. So first up, I created a recall and a precision object. I then updated it for every single batch. So r.update state would update recall and p.update state would update our precision. And then I logged out those metrics. So first up, I logged out our loss. So I managed to get that working as well. I logged out our recall. So r.result.numpy would give us our recall and p.result.numpy would give us our precision. And right down here, you can see the actual performance metric. So on epoch one, we had a loss of 0.857. 28246, we would have a recall of 0.944 and a precision of 0.995. Loss dropped to 0.16 on Epoch 2, got our precision, our recall of 0.979, our precision of 0.99. And then I trained for five epochs and I think I actually stopped under Epoch 6 because we were pretty good, right? Um, so our loss was 5.01 to the power of negative 0.5. And then we had uh, a recall of 0.996 and a precision of 0.996. So again, still a very high performing model, but we're not getting those ridiculous precision and recall metrics of 100%. Then I also updated the evaluation to actually calculate it on the entire test data set. 
So this gave us a recall of 100%, which again, still a little bit sketchy. I'm always suspicious of that. And a precision of 0.998. So again, way better. The last and final thing that I did is I saved this out as Siamese model V2. So again, this is part of the process, guys. When you're actually going and building a machine learning model, remember you need to iterate. It doesn't just stop after you've trained it once. You need to go through, ensure that this model is performing well. So under V2, I ended up saving that. So you can see that right inside of our root folder, I then had a Siamese model.h5 and a Siamese model v2.h5. And what I did is I took that model and I dumped it into our app folder. So we then had a Siamese model v2.h5 inside of there. And to actually bring this into our application, I changed the model that we loaded inside of this line here. So rather than loading tf.keras.models.load model, Siamese model, so previously it would have been this, I just changed it to v2. That allowed us to bring in our second version of our model. Now this is model ops in a little bit of a sketchy way, but you can see that really quickly you can go and change, update your model. So if you wanted to train this on yourself, really easy, right? You can just go through that same workflow, retrain your model to be able to go and train a verification model on yourself. But now the part, that you've all been waiting for to actually see what the model performance is like. So inside of our app, I actually dropped the detection threshold and the verification threshold, but you can choose to leave it high if you want. Um, I found that a detection threshold of 50% was a little bit more appropriate and I left the verification threshold at 80%. But let's actually go and test this out. So again, we can start it up using Python face ID dot pi. Copy break. Right, so that's me. So if I take this out, so on the green screen, let's try it. So in this particular case, I'm getting unverified. So let's drop the green screen. We're now verified. So you can see there, with a green screen, it looks like it's saying, hey, that, that looks a little bit sketchy, but we've still got a reasonable number of verifications. We had 29 and 0.58. Dropping the green screen, we're now absolutely 100% verified. So down here, you can see that it's saying all 50 images surpassed and matched. We had a 100% verification threshold. But you can see that the model is now a lot more sensitive, right? So before it was passing if I put my hand up in the screen. So let's try that. But you can see that that is now zero verified images, right? So by throwing up my hand, it's now saying no, that there's no way that that is actually appropriately verified. Um, now let's do the almighty robin williams test so this was the one that i was uh, a little bit worried about because i was like robin williams no way he, should he be passing through and getting through our threshold so if we go and test him drop the screen down so we don't have so much glare so you can see he is unverified the model is working right let's test that again just to prove that i didn't mess around and let me show you in the image folder as well so if we go into App data, input images, so it definitely is picking up old mate Robin. So let's try it again. Come on, focus. Right, again, unverified. Unverified, unverified. You can see significantly better performance after going and applying that additional data and retraining. Um, let's try another example. So I was testing this out on Chris Rock. Again, he's unverified. And let's test out Jim, old Jim Carrey. Can he get through our verification process? Nope, so absolutely zero images verified in that particular case. Let's try me again. Verified. 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 And there you go. That is our app now updated and performing significantly better than what we had before. So this really at least gave you the chance to see what it's like to build a real life data science model. It's not going to end after you train just once. You need to go through and performance tune to ideally ensure that you get the best possible model 
that you can definitely get. So remember what I ended up doing is I added way more images after performing that data augmentation and improved our logging metrics so we could actually see our performance as we're training. And what I'll end up doing is if you want, let me know, I can try to share the actual trained model might not necessarily work for you, but this will at least give you a chance to see how big that model is. I think it's about 150 megs. I'll have to work out how to get it to, uh, but that actually allows us to go in ahead and perform our facial verification. So in a nutshell, we are now finally done. And that definitely concludes the Siamese neural network series where we attempt to produce a state-of-the-art model from paper all the way through to code. And we finally got it working reasonably well. But on that note, thanks again for sticking around. That about does wrap it up. Thanks so much for tuning in, guys. Hopefully you enjoyed this video and thanks for sticking along for the entire series. I know it's been a little bit of a long journey, but we finally got there and we finally tested it out. If you do have any questions, comments, or queries, hit me up in the comments below. I'm more than happy to help you out. But thanks again for tuning in, guys. Peace.